you're now live, Chair. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to South Cambridgeshire District Council um, Planning Committee. Uh, I'm John Batchelor, I'm Chair of the Committee, and my Vice Chair is uh, Councillor Halings. Councillor Halings, would you confirm you're with us, please? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Pepper. Good morning. Good. Um, members, could you all um, mute for the time being, please? There's quite a bit of background noise. Thank you very much. Uh, we're supported on the top table uh, by the following officers. Um, Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Sites. Uh, Chris, would you? Yes, good uh, morning, good Chairman. Good morning, members. Thank you. Um, Stephen Reid, Senior Planning Lawyer. Uh, good morning, Chair and members. Thank you. Um, and uh, Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who will be taking the minutes today. Yes, You're with us, Ian. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll introduce the individual case officers when I invite them to speak. First, just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, please make sure that your device is fully charged and switched and switch your cameras and microphones off if you're not members of the committee. If you are members of the committee, please keep your cameras on, microphones off unless you're going to speak. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly, clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they don't interrupt uh, proceedings. The normal procedure at planning committee is to take recorded votes and we will continue with this tradition unless there is a clear affirmation. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. I will then ask committee members to speak so that their vote is clear both to the committee and those watching the webcast members should respond for, against or abstain when their name is called. Committee members present, uh, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please um, turn on your microphone, wait two seconds and say your name and the ward you represent so that your presence may be noted. Please remember to turn off your microphone after your introduction. Uh, my name is uh, John Batchelor, committee chair, and I represent Lindsay. Um, Councillor Bradman, please, would you introduce yourself? Good morning, Chair. Uh, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm a ward member for Milton and Water Beach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Khan can't be with us today. And so he has been substituted by Councillor Daunton. Would you um, introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Claire Daunton. I'm a ward member for the Fenditon and Fulbourne ward. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Peter Fain. Is Peter with us this morning? Good morning. Peter Fain representing Shelford Ward. All right, could you put your camera on, please, Peter? OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Halings, please. Morning, everybody. I'm Pippa Halings, and I represent Liston, Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Milnes. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, Councillor Brian Milnes from the Sawston Ward. Thank you. Councillor Ripeth. Good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Judith Ripeth and I represent Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, Foxton Ward. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Hi, Councillor Heather Williams, and I represent the Maldens Ward. Thank you. Um, and we have a new member of the committee this morning, uh, Councillor Richard Williams. I'd like to um, welcome him to the committee. If you'd like to introduce yourself, please, Richard. Good morning. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm Richard Williams and I represent the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you very much. And I would say that uh, Richard is replacing Sue Ellington uh, and I'd like to, I'm sure we'd all wish to thank her for the contribution that she's made over the years to this committee. Uh, Councillor Wright, please. Nick, Nick Wright, Caxton and Patworth. Good, thank you very much. So I can confirm that the meeting is correct. And we're all present. Right, so we're going to go on to say that uh, at any time, if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me um, if they can. I appreciate that we have had some technical difficulties in the last couple of meetings where people have dropped out. Um, so if I see that, I, I will um, suspend the meeting for a few minutes to see if we can actually get the person back on. But obviously we, we do have to continue the meeting. The point here for the benefit of the public is that if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation or of the debate um, about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. Now we have several public speakers today and I would just like to explain how public speaking will work. Um, this meeting is being broadcast live via the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that by participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of the images and sound recordings for webcast and training purposes. You will each have three minutes to address the committee. When you start speaking, we will start um, the timer. Um, and when it's you are near, you are, your three minutes are up, I will advise you to wind up your presentation. Uh, if you continue to speak, you may be muted, um, uh, you're unable to continue. Once you have finished speaking, you may wish to ask, we may wish to ask you questions. So be, please be concise in your response. If there are no more questions, you may leave the meeting and continue to watch via the webcast. Committee members are reminded that at any that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only. And the process for this shall be uh, as follows. I shall ask if there are any questions. If you do have a question, please uh, add speak to the chat function. So when you want to speak, simply type in that you wish to do so um, and the vice chair will control the list of speakers for me. The committee can only consider reasons for or against the application. The committee cannot consider general observations about the development site. The committee cannot consider comments from public speakers made outside of their allotted speaking time. Therefore, request that those registered do not interrupt outside their time. I, as chair, have the ability to mute or remove participants as necessary. Once the committee has heard from all speakers and planning officers, we will form views on the application. The planning committee will then vote. The outcome is decided by a majority vote, and in the event of a tie, I, as chair, have a casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure that they identify themselves and speak into the microphone so that uh, the vote is understood by committee and those watching on the webcast. Members are reminded that they should indicate whether they are for, against, abstain. 
Right, I'm sorry it's a bit of a long-winded introduction, but it's apparently necessary. So we're about to get on with the business of the day. Uh, Peter Fame, would you put your camera on, please? Uh, we're having all members. Councillor Fame's uh, visible to us, John. Is he? Well, yes. Yeah. He only appears to be a circle on my one. We can see him in his oh, big okay. We can see his handsome profile. Right, fine. We're moving on then to the uh, business of the day. Uh, we start with item two, which is apologies. Um, Mr. Senior, do we have any apologies? Please? Yeah, we, yes, Chair, we have one apology from Councillor Martin Khan and Councillor Claire Daunton is here as substitute. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, declarations of interest, item three. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, <coughs> please would you raise it at that point? Yes, um, sir, we, have, we have three people who'd like to make declarations, starting with right. Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this declaration relates to item eight, the hotel at the Imperial War Museum, Duxford. Um, in my capacity as South Cam's District Council's representative on the Board of Trustees to Denny Abbey and the Farmland Museum, I know another trustee on that board who is the retail and admissions manager for the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. Whilst we have discussed the generalities of museum finances and strategies for the future, I can confirm that I have not discussed this application for a hotel at Imperial War Museum Duxford with him at any time. Um, that is a non-pecuniary interest, obviously, and I come to this matter afresh. Thank you very much for that. The vice Chair, who else have we got? Yes, Chair, so we've got Councillor Wright. Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Non-pecuniary interest on items six and eight. Uh, both sites were discussed when I was planning portfolio holder, uh, but I'm coming to this meeting completely afresh. Thank you very much. Councillor Daunton. Councillor Daunton. Thank you. Um, I, yes, thank you. I am the ward member for Tevisham and Fenditon, which are items 10 and 11. And Councillor Milnes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, I'm declaring interest in uh, item six, the uh, former Spicer site as the local member for Salson. And clearly, this has been a matter of, of significant discussion locally, but I confirm that I come to this meeting afresh. Okay, thank you very much for that. And Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you. I'd like to declare non-pecuniary interest in items six um, and eight as well. As a member of the Whittlesford Parish Council, um, I've um, discussed both of these applications. Um, obviously, the Sawston site is um, partly on my ward as well, so that's been a topic of, of discussion. Um, but I can confirm that I come to both matters afresh. Thank you very much. And Councillor Fain. Councillor Fain, please. Chairman, as uh, Ward member for the neighbouring ward, I declare a non-pecuniary interest in item six. I've been involved in discussions and attended exhibitions, but I come to the matter afresh. Thank you very much. And Councillor Bradnam again, Chair. Councillor Bradnam again, please. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I need to point out um, a non-pecuniary pecuniary interest in item 11. I am the county councillor for Fen Ditton Ward, uh, uh, but I come to this matter afresh. Okay. Thank you. Is that all the uh, declarations? Yeah. yeah. Right. I also need to make a declaration on item seven, Linton. Uh, I'm the local member for Linton, have been present at parish council key meetings where this has been discussed, but I, um, I approach this afresh. So I think we've done the um, declarations of interest. No more. No. Thank you very much. Right, we now move on to item four, which is the minutes of the meeting of the 26th of May 2020. 
Are there any issues of accuracy on the minutes? Uh, no. No, no chair. No, OK. Uh, can I sign these minutes as a true record of the meeting held on Tuesday the 26th of May? Agreed. Agreed. Anyone Agreed. against that? No, good. OK, so the minutes are accepted. We now move on to um, the business of the day and we are on agenda item five. This is planning application S2423 stroke 19 um, DC. Uh, this is at Long Stanton and Oakington and the proposal is for the discharge of condition 14 of planning application S2011 stroke 14 OL outline plan for the town centre strategy. So this is a North Stow phase two um, town centre strategy. The applicant is Homes England. The recommendation is to do discharge condition 14 subject to implementation of the strategy. Uh, the key material considerations that we have to take into account are the condition and the outline planning permission the submitted strategy, the phasing of the town centre, assessment against the requirement of the condition. Uh, the committee hasn't made a recent site visit here. It is not a departure. And the application is before us as the applica application in the view of the joint director requires the resolution by the planning committee. The presenting officer is Andrew Thompson, uh, strategic sites team. Uh, Andrew Thompson, could you give your presentation, please? Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, trust you all can hear me. Um, could you turn your your um, camera on as well, please? Uh, yeah, I have done. Yeah. Have you? All right. Yeah, fine. There Thank we you. go. So. Can you see the presentation, councillors? Uh, not yet. Yes, it's with us now. OK. So. To go back, this is the uh, just to clarify, this is the town centre. This is phase two of North Stowe. Uh, members may recall in February they considered the application for phase two A, uh, which is the in purple. We're now talking about the area to just to the south of that, which is outlined in red on this plan. This is a plan from the uh, from the approved design code of uh, Norster. Um, as part of the outline plan application, there was a, a town centre strategy that was submitted, um, and it was around te uh, ten principles. Um, so, in effect, it, there was uh, some elements that we uh, wanted to see. Obviously, that it was uh, attractive, connected to nature, offering something different, attractive. Uh, active and clear in terms of how it would come forward and marketing. Uh, the town centre strategy uh, also included uh, a town square, uh, some flexibility, uh, refining the ability to refine itself with when engaging with uh, people uh, who come in to live and to work and uh, relax in the area, uh, integrating clean technology, promoting sustainable travel and being flexible for the new ways of working. That said, we needed or we felt that it was appropriate uh, as part of that outline plan permission to provide more detail uh, in terms of how it's going to be delivered, in particular in terms of the early stages. Uh, and that's the, fir the first part of the condition, uh, councillors, that is important um, to, to this uh, consideration. Um, and the next phases then obviously are about how the that the uh, the town centre strategy would be implemented uh, throughout the uh, process. Um, 
this the strategy uh, as now brought forward uh, includes three basic principles um, to ensure flexibility so that we are moving forward in a modern environment and that there's uh, opportunity to address matters that were unforeseen at the time of the outline play application. Um, a destination uh, in effect attracting, making sure it's a landmark and, a, and a, an important place for both the residents of Norstead, but also providing uh, facilities as a sub-regional centre uh, for the surrounding villages and indeed promoting enterprise, supporting local businesses um, and providing opportunities for uh, the growth of business uh, and towns, the town centre. This is what uh, the, complete, the completed uh, town centre would look like um, in accordance with the strategy. You can see a commercial core around the, around the centre um, with residential uh, town centre um, around the outside. Uh, the, the bits just to the outside is worth highlighting. This is the education campus councillors and this is phase 2A uh, just to the, to the, to the north. Um, and this is Rampton Drift and this is Rampton Drift play area. Uh, again, just to the north. Um, a wide range of uses uh, and an opportunity to really build um, a strong commercial and uh, residential environment. Um, but obviously it doesn't happen all at once. Um, and one of the key things is of this strategy and important things of this strategy is that it needs to be delivered uh, we need some things to be built early on and importantly um, the start of the town park is one that is the first bit uh, and this is the town gardens as we're calling them um, is, is going to be the first bit the market hall which will have commercial elements uh, and the civic hub which will provide uh, library uh, community facilities and uh, health facilities within the actual um, building itself that is being built by ourselves uh, under the terms of the section 106 agreement um, and uh, again early and early um, work has begun on building uh, that process um, as it goes forward then the the town center in in terms of stage b again further leisure and uh, commercial activity comes in uh, the first residential buildings start to be appear. The dates uh, under, underneath, so 2023 to 2026, they're approximate dates. Uh, obviously, if things are going well, then then obviously they make things may come quicker. Uh, and also, uh, what we're, uh, if the strategy is approved, then obviously commercial uh, marketing will start uh, in earnest, uh, and interest will be sought in terms of a wide range of of facilities, including a development partner. Um, so we then move on to uh, 2026. Uh, uh, again, elements of this may come earlier, um, but it's thought that we'll move then to the north of the town centre to complete the links to for A, phase 2A. Phase 2B is also anticipated to be complete around about that time. And the education campus, of course, will also be complete, uh, by, hopefully by then. Um, but again, it shows two surface level car parks um, to, uh, to provide uh, facilities for uh, the, uh, the people visiting the, the town centre. But primarily it's focused on delivering uh, or people coming from Norstow, Longstanton, Oakington, Cottenham by walking and, and cycling. Uh, but also by the guided busway and it's this stage that uh, with the guided busway is anticipated to be complete as it goes to phase uh, phase three uh, and the formal bus stops uh, will be uh, potentially opened up uh, for use. That's not saying that the guided busway that runs around the outside of Norstow that will also continue and other bus services um, are likely to come in at this stage, uh, if not earlier. Um, and fi the final stage will be replacing um, uh, the surface level car parks with multi-storey car parks, um, but obviously we will at that point 
uh, consider whether or not those in, uh, those are needed. Um, the new technology may come along that uh, multi-storey car parks are, are not needed, uh, and that will provide obviously an opportunity to provide further commercial use or further uh, other alternative uses. Um, in terms of uh, this again, it's, it's looking at completing in circa 2031. Um, but obviously, it, again, these dates are approximate. They can move, elements can come earlier or, or later, uh, depending on um, how things are coming along. Some visual images of what we're anticipating uh, the market hall in particular to look like. This image on the left uh, is well known. Uh, this is one of the images that has been produced as, uh, showing uh, the retail and cafes on, on the ground floor, uh, workspace above, and, and again, those, that's uh, a market hall that's based on uh, promoting small independent users and getting Norsto as a different feel uh, and predominantly based on enterprise and uh, new types of uh, business. Um, the, the Civic Hub, we were still at design stage, but I thought we'd take three images from the from the strategy that are being used. To the top is Brent Council's uh, Civic Hub, uh, just by Wembley Stadium. If you turn around 180 degrees, you'll see Wembley Stadium behind you. Uh, Deptford and also Lambeth uh, Civic Hubs. And what these basically show, Council, is that, councils, is that these are large, uh, large buildings they can be of a different design and very often they are landmark and are surrounded by um, civic space and, and public realm. And, and those are kind of some of the principles that we're starting to build into, uh, into uh, North Stowe's uh, vision. In terms of movement and access, it's important that obviously that people can get in uh, to the town centre. Um, you have the guided busway uh, running all the way through the centre of the Town centre, and then there's several informal kind of accesses uh, for vehicles, so you can service the unit, the commercial units. Oops, sorry, let's go back. Sorry, uh, but also pedestrian uh, act permeability is also uh, sought uh, in terms of getting uh, people again promoting walking, cycling, uh, and the full range of activity. Uh, and of course, Norsto sits on the uh, the guided busway. Um, and and this the additional of the guided busway running through the town centre um, is, is part of that plan. In terms of story heights, um, we're looking at a range of three to six stories, but obviously when we go above that six stories, uh, that will be obviously design led. The tallest buildings being the Civic Hub um, and uh, the hotel building, which is frame the each end of the town centre uh, or the high street. Um, obviously, that's not been named yet, but uh, if we call that the high street, um, then around that, they, these are five storey buildings uh, in the light blue colour. Um, three storey buildings are primarily the, the school, but again, we're looking at uh, other three storey buildings here uh, in relation to this and the grey buildings are four storeys uh, or anticipated to be four storeys. Again, it's a dense and and, uh, a and compact area, but also it's worth noting there is some uh, a large area of green space uh, and public realm that's being proposed. Um, and obviously the guided busway and, and there's areas around the guided busway in the, in the centre of the site um, centre of the town centre that will provide uh, further public realm. Uh, in terms of floor space, um, at the time of the outline plan permission, we didn't anticipate home working as part of the um, uh, as part of the solution to providing jobs, and the focus is on providing jobs um, rather than uh, floor space. Um, but of course, one of the things we want to see is how that floor space will evolve and come forward. Um, so one of the things we want to um, see is, is obviously a, a level of commercial activity and level commercial floor space. Uh, and you'll see that we are trying to uh, keep that 
um, high in terms of the opportunity for employment. Um, in terms of retail, obviously members will be aware of the wider uh, macro um, impacts that's happening in retail with the uh, with the growth of online shopping, um, resulting in, in massive levels of uh, of closures on the high street. So what has happened since the outline planning commission is we've reviewed the or the review view of the retail um, has been reconsidered. Um, but obviously the market hall will also provide an element of uh, of retail and leisure uh, cafes and, and, and the like. Um, so in total, we still think there's still going to be uh, well over or around 2500 jobs and that is depend within the town centre. But that is similarly the the level of home working is, is an estimate at the moment. So certainly uh, if there's one lesson out of this pandemic that home working is becoming more and more will become more prevalent. Um, but obviously the ability to meet uh, and provide meeting spaces is also going to be important. Um, so the next steps we will be if the strategy is approved, we'll obviously set up a town centre delivery group with ourselves, Homes England uh, and other interested parties such as the NHS and County Council and also include uh, in that uh, as much as we can the local residents in terms of getting sure that those are uh, delivered. Um, the early delivery of the community facilities uh, and employment uh, and, the and the public realm of the town park are absolutely uh, essential and that is what we have secured. And then there's the flexibility to take account in the changes of working practices. But two elements of that are that the design uh, is at the core of this and there's strong links to the education campuses. And so that is me done. Um, I'll leave that to you now in terms of uh, any questions or points of clarification. Right, fine. OK, thank you very much. OK, members, any points of clarification you like to make here, bearing in mind that this is a discharge of condition. And so the main um, issue is, does this meet the requirements of the outline planning permission? So uh, anyone wish to speak to this? Yes. Or ask uh, a question of clarification. Yep. Yep. So, Councillor Heather Williams. Right. Councillor Williams, please. Heather Williams. Thank you. Sorry. Could I just go um, ask to see the slide again around the employment because it looks like the maximum figures were lower than the outline. So I'm just wondering if I could see that again, please, and some clarification around those total figures whether we're expecting it to be less employment than outline. Thank you. Yeah. Can you point that out, please, Andrew? Thank you, Councillor. Well, the main reduction in employment uh, will be around the retail uh, changes. Um, but um, again, the actual uh, anticipated numbers of jobs. So if you take 892 off the, the outline planning permission, uh, because we weren't anticipating that, it was around about 2000 uh, jobs, but with the, the changes in working practices, we're still anticipating within the B use classes, the same level uh, or approximate same level of uh, of use class of, of jobs and job creation. Of course, these are in, in indicative figures, councillor, um, and we think obviously that we've we have upped that level from the original um, submission. That's why it's been uh, uh, through three or four iterations. Um, but we will continue to try and keep that level as high as possible uh, and create as many jobs as possible. All right, thank you. Do you want to come back on that, Council Williams? Um, no, I think it's something obviously I'll touch on in the debate, Chairman, but thank you for the clarification. Okay. Uh just as we're looking at that then, um, you were saying that there, there's an emphasis going towards more home working. That's not actually reflected in the figures here, is it? You're using the same home working numbers. Is uh, there some strategy in that? Yeah, we, we again, we didn't want to overestimate and we didn't want to underestimate. The, as I say, the home working was not anticipated um, as part of the outline plan permission, but we have inserted it within the table with it. This is a table from the actual strategy right. itself. 
so we have anticipated it now um and and what's with the three figures there what we're saying is that um is that that, that level of home working is what we're anticipating but that can go up okay thank you councillor fain chair all right councillor fain please thank you chair um mr thompson you referred to uh the effects of the taking account of the effects of the pandemic in relation to home working just in relation to the uh market hall and community the civic hub um looking at the the first of the photographs on the left i appreciate that was just indicative to what extent do you think that needs to take more account of the need for public open space directly outside buildings particularly restaurants and so on so that uh, there can be service outside not just in relation to this pandemic but planning for future pandemics too um that seems to me rather a restricted um, pedestrian space in that particular example it wasn't clear to me from the plans whether that has been taken into account thank you councillor yes um again these are indicative designs i'll scroll up uh, through the um so these these uh, this image is a, is an indicative design uh, obviously we we haven't had the actual detail and that's something we're going to have to work on we're in the middle of the pandemic and obviously we're all aware of of how things in, are going to need to change and designs are going to need to alter but there is a, a, a high level of public realm in and around buildings um so if you're looking at uh, and the opportunity within the spaces so it may be that the buildings become more compact and actually the space around it becomes more bigger um but that is something as i say we we will start to look at in terms of detailed design uh, of the buildings these are indicative uh, footprints at the, at the end of the day um and that is something as i say we want to um certainly we are aware of and certainly that's something that commercially uh we have discussed with homes england um, and there's lots of practice from RTPI, C, uh, Town and Country Planning Association, Civic Voice. All these people now are looking, all researchers are looking at how this is going to impact the high street. So we will obviously take account of best practice uh, and with ourselves, obviously with delivering the Civic Hub, we'll obviously take account of, of that uh, in the design of the Civic Hub, making sure that the shared space and the outdoor space is, is equally well designed. Thank you. Councillor Milnes. Uh, Councillor Milnes, please. Thank you. I'd like to actually follow follow on from that. Um, so we've got a very um, changing face in retail, uh, obviously. Um, and we've got a lot of talk about uh, town centres as destinations or as venues. So if we pick up on uh, what Councillor Fain was just asking about, um, is, the, is there going to be space for congregations? So I'm just thinking about, for example, British uh, Library, uh, which has um, quite a big open plaza. It's got, uh, um, you know, Starbucks or, or similar around, and it's a it's a location where people like to congregate. And and I just wonder whether you can say something about your consideration and and how right now. I know you've talked about being flexible. Uh, but how are you looking at accommodating emerging best practice, not just uh, previous best practice, if, I'm, if I can put it that way? Thank you. Yes, Councillor, we're, we're well aware, obviously, as I say, of the situation. Um, we are um, working on detailed designs for the Civic Club, uh, or we started those designs. Um, <clears throat> that's been done with the with new build team. Um, and also again the market hall we haven't really had a lot of discussions about this but we have had uh, some discussions and, and uh, yes the market hall or sorry the civic hub will be based on having that uh, ground floor certainly uh, maybe further floors of meeting space shared space but uh, in uh, with the capability of adapting uh to that and that's important thing is we're not designing the buildings now but we're keeping that um as flexible as we can i um, think i was sorry to interrupt but i was thinking yeah. more about 
creation of open space, which I think was yeah. uh, Councillor Fain's question, that um, there seems to be, you know, thoroughfares, high streets and so on. And I, I see you pointing towards the, uh, um, the green area. Uh, but for example, in front of the market hall and or in front of the, the civic hub, is there going to be a place uh, for people to congregate? Uh, short answer is yes, Councillor. So these, these, this is a quite a, a large scale plan. So uh, when we're looking at uh, the scale of the, the space in, in front of you, you're looking at 20, maybe 30 metres of space uh, in front of those buildings. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Yeah, Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, mine, my question was well, two parts to it. Um, I certainly agree on the importance of the open space. And, you know, the strategy talks a lot about events and also an outdoor marketplace. So we really do need that space to hold those events and the outdoor marketplace. But one thing um, that is glaringly missing from this town centre, uh, and if you look at any town centre over the country, is faith buildings. It, you cannot, um, you know, it's a job to imagine a town centre anywhere without a major faith building of whatever sort in it. Um, and what is the thoughts around that? Thank you. Yes, Councillor, there is actually a faith building within this, and that is this building here. Um, that again is the detail that is secured through the, uh, the section 106. Uh, there is a faith strategy group who meet uh, and are discussing the requirements of, of North Stow, not just across phase two, but also across phase one and phase three uh, and what is needed in terms of space. Uh, there is another, uh, obviously there is a space and, and available on phase one that is probably going to be delivered first. But obviously we are including faith buildings within this uh, proposal and that is secured also by the section one. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Yep, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want I had two points that I wanted to ask. Um, clarification on the table that Mr Thompson put up. Uh, referring to the 892 square metres uh, of space for home working. Can I clarify, was that for people as it were who might share that space when they're working from home so that they could have a shared hub to work from? That's the first question. Thank you, Councillor. It's not 892 uh, square metres, it's 892 jobs anticipated. Uh, the the home working capability will be within the actual uh, beat, uh, within the, the um, within people's homes. There will also then be the opportunity within the civic hub, the market hall, and other use, other community uses, as well as obviously uh, potentially also cafes, restaurants, uh, and those uh, and meeting spaces to Sorry. create additional floor space that where people can meet. The reason I was asking that was because, um, well, bring, I'll bring in the second point. I was hoping that we might have some allocation of space within the workspace for people to meet in when they're working from home. So they might just hot desk for a while and catch up with some other people um, or they might use it as a, a meeting point or a, a, a meeting to have a, a place to have a a meeting, you know, so it's for home workers, but it's a shared office space. So that's the first thing. And the second question, because I think that's really important because everybody working from home becomes isolated. So I wanted to check whether we had any provision for shared space for home for people who are working at home. And the second thing was, is there any I know you've said in um, paragraph 72, that there's been a significant reduction in floor space um, uh, and that Savills had agreed with that. But that big drop in retail from 35,000 to 12,000, I, I just wondered if any of that space could be used for such a purpose um, to give home workers somewhere to congregate and meet. 
Uh, yes, yes, Councillor. The, the the short answer is uh, those use cases, the the shared business space and the shared workspace um, will be within um, either the, uh, a, a range of kind of activities. So yes, we are looking at that and we're looking at planning for that. Um, and certainly that has been part of the discussion as to what the the office space and workspace uh, includes. But also, obviously, we are also looking at the the leisure uh, and uh, cafes, retail, uh, and those kind of things as also opportunities for people to to meet, have business meetings, and all those kind of things, um, as is frequent at the moment. So the short answer is yes, we are looking at that shared uh, meeting space uh, and the all sorts of uh, opportunities, and it's across all use classes, councillors, not just obviously within the workspace, it's also across other workspace. So the Civic Hub will certainly, if you look at Clay Farm, has a function uh, to provide working workspace for people uh, to come and, come and have quick uh, meetings. Um, I think that's one of the lessons that we are uh, learning and adapting from is, is, as I say, that people will still need that opportunity to meet uh, and discuss matters uh, face to face or on as we are doing now on, online uh, and, and in an environment where um, that is comfortable. Um, I, sorry, the second the, the, the second question, Councillor, can you repeat that, please? Well, it was um, it was just whether any of that retail that was outlined at 35,000 square metres and is now dropped to 12. That's a big drop, uh, 25,000 square metres of retail. I just wondered if any of that space could be used to provide dedicated space in just the way you're describing for people to have meters, meetings who are otherwise home working, like a hot desk area. Yeah, I, again, I, I, I think that that will be more within uh, the, the, re the retail provision, obviously, that has dropped uh, quite a, a large level, uh, but the retail um, provision is about uh, actually the sale of goods and, and obviously we we are seeking to secure obviously uh, a level of retail where people can meet their data if they need. I think as I say it will be across the use classes rather than a specific, uh, uh, a so, specific so, use Sorry class. what I'm getting out of that is that it doesn't sound to me as if there is any allocation for this shared workspace. That's all I'm saying. I just wanted to check whether there was any, but it doesn't sound as though there is any. It's being right. relied upon within cafes and. No, I think it's it's yes. There is there is awareness that we need to provide it, and but it is it's not in a single use class. As. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got as far as we can on that one. And it's myself, Councillor yep. Haley. Councillor Haylings, please. Thank you, um, and thank you, Andrew. I have two, and I was just looking at the, the the mention of third place working, which is on page twelve in paragraph ten, and I think in some ways that addresses slightly what uh, Councillor Bradnam was okay. was saying, which is where those who are working from home can go in and SMEs can go in. So I have two questions, Andrew. One is around um, just what looks like might be a bit of tension within the report, and it's. It's about this flexibility and the possibility in this new world um, that that a lot of people will be looking at doing startups, working from home and perhaps trying to offer new types of things. And this town centre in on page 11 and paragraph seven is really talking about how to capitalise on this flexibility to enable people to do kind of pop up things, test things out, try things out. And I think that's very, very important right now in this um, particular stage. But I note then that um, on page 17, the, the design quality panel had said that it would be better to have a small number of occupied commercial units than a greater number of half occupied. So I just wanted to know, was there a, is there a tension there between enabling this sort of incubator type for people to work out they may have lost their jobs or they're trying to work out a different type of retail or um, offer to um, entertainment by using these spaces and trying things out compared to that comment from the design quality panels my first question and then the second question is around cycling and in the sustainable um, transport section 
Um, you do mention the busway and the, the parking and the design is that therefore the, the busway goes through the centre of the town. It's moving away from private car transport, but there's no mention of cycleways and segregated cycleways and cycle storage, um, which will be some of the, the key things that we're needing right now as a kind of lockdown and will be the preference going forward. If you could just clarify where, where the cycling provision has been um, provided. Um, so first, first and foremost, the um, the the quality, the quality panel comments were making sure that that obviously you had um, whilst they can wanted to see those uh, uses. There's nothing um, a dead town centre can build up a negative. Uh, no matter how well you design it, can build up a negative opinion. Um, so what uh, we were the town centre centre want to or the design quality panel wanted to see was maybe it'd be better to have a, f a few um, uh, early kind of landmark uh, occupiers um, and be that cafes um, and, and that's where the civic hub comes in in, in many ways is that there's a function to the town centre there's a reason why people go there uh, rather than just a oh it's it, there's nothing there at the moment uh, and there's a reason for people to to locate there. So that's what the design quality panel. I understand that it might read as a uh, as a tension, but I think that's something that's resolved largely by putting in place the Civic Hub uh, early on um, will allow us to uh, have a function to that town centre uh, that other things can then feed off um, in itself and a reason for people to to go there. And that will certainly attract a lot of uh, other uses. For example, with the health centre, that will attract a pharmacy. The obviously with the civic function, there will maybe also be a cafe function, a crash function, and all those kind of things. Uh, turning to um, cycling facilities, yes, we have factored that in. I'm just trying to remember. So we have started to to look at those kind of functions, and you can see the there's, there's a cycleway that runs alongside the busway. That's already uh, part of the existing design and that's a strategic function but also getting these routes capable of uh, putting uh, of being cycle uh, and um, cycle friendly um, and cycle storage again in, these are indicative locations of where cycle storage will be um, but that's more detail that we're going to have to go into in the next stages uh, to ensure that we do actually provide all the space that we want uh, for that storage uh, and that will come into the design of the buildings, the design of the parks uh, and the open space and making sure that that is well catered for. And, and obviously one of the other things we're looking for, looking at as well is uh, the electric cycle um, provision as well so that people can, those cycles can be charged up without, um, without problem within the town centre function itself as well. Right. Thank you. Councillor Daunton. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see um, on the plan here the uh, marked out a museum and gallery building. I, I think it's one building for the two, but I'm not sure. Um, so that's a question. Um, but then that leads me to ask about provision for music making. Um, are you expecting that to take place in either the museum and gallery or in the civic hub? Um, and also, I just hope that some thought has been given to um, dual use spaces when music is being made. I know from Clay Farm um, on a Saturday for a meeting when a choir was rehearsing next door and there was no sound insulation made both very difficult. So I just wonder what provision um, there is for music making. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, the museum gallery is is more about the the archaeology, uh, the archaeology finds and the heritage centre that we are uh, that is currently being uh, built uh, by Homes England's office. That may relocate uh, to this uh, this place alongside Homes England's uh, office as well. Um, but these buildings um, at the moment we haven't discuss the final use and, and how we integrate that, but that's something we can take away uh, into the design team and the delivery group. Uh, certainly the provision of music will be something that we will obviously uh, 
look at uh, both in the Civic Hub uh, and in other kind of buildings as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I think that's all our speakers. But um, Mr Carter, I'd just like to ask you a, a question, please, just on a technical point. Um, given that this is a discharge of condition, uh, uh, it's clear that in order for, to uh, allow the flexibility that's already being explained as required, um, it's fairly clear that this doesn't actually meet the outline planning permission conditions. Um, could you give us some clarification on whether or not that's an acceptable thing? Well, the the outline uh, planning permission obviously dates from 2011, which is some time ago, and it, it's mm. perfectly appropriate for uh, the committee to take into account changes in the retailing and uh, employment environment that have taken place since that time. Uh, so um, the committee uh, can consider in my opinion, can consider the strategy that's been put forward. Um, Andrew Thompson's obviously explained how that position has evolved, particularly in terms of uh, retail floor space, but the overall picture in terms of, of jobs as well, looking to maintain those at, at levels similar to those that were uh, envisaged uh, nearly 10 years ago. So um, I, I don't think there's any issue for the committee in determining uh, what's in front of them, Councillor. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, does anybody wish to comment on this? Bearing in mind discharge of condition, are we happy that uh, this meets at least the principles of the outline planning permission? Um, uh, yeah. Williams, yes. Chair. Yeah. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I'm assuming we've got no speakers and therefore you're, you're asking us to talk about in the debate sense. Yeah. Sorry, can I just clarify that then? Yes, in, in, indeed, there are, are no public speakers. As I'm, thank you for that. I should have mentioned that. So I just wanted to clarify. So I'm, I'm going to speak as, as part of the debate. Yep. Um, I, I do understand that a significant time has, has passed between outline and this, um, but I'm, I'm looking at the figures and I, with home working being brought in, I can, I can understand how that wouldn't have been a factor and is more now. But we've got five, a best 5,000 less square metres. Now, if the home working meant that the job level was the same, then then I wouldn't wouldn't take issue with the square meterage. It's the quantity of jobs I think that we have to have our, our forefront of mind, as opposed to the amount of geographical space required for those jobs. Um, but home working in itself, uh, the whole main purpose of it is it it can happen anywhere. It doesn't. People aren't going to to move to Northstow to home work. Um, I do it myself, and I could do my job wherever I was in the country. Um, so, and in, in given the climate, obviously, as as a planning authority, it's, it's going to be really important that we help facilitate as many jobs as possible. Um, so, looking at the overall figures, at best, it's going to be 500 less than outline um, and I am interested to listen to the rest of the debate. I'm, I'm not wholly set up but I, I have to say that reduction is of concern and does you know this is meant to be delivering employment this this section in particular um, you know the floor space might provide more residential property it, it's, it's not about about that the employment figures concern me especially in the current climate um, and so at the moment, I don't feel possibly that that meets the aspirations of the outline uh, permissions. I think we we need to, on today's terms, be trying to facilitate more jobs than we foresaw in 2011, um, not less. And, and the 500 is on best case scenarios that have been put to us. So, but like I say, interested to hear that what others think and Still on the fence. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Ripith. All right, Councillor Ripith, please. Um, I think one of the key points from what Andrew was saying, the officer, um, that flexibility is so important, especially with what's happened last six months, and we don't know how things are going to progress, which I think is something that Councillor Williams has just touched on. Um, my main issue with 
the whole design, I mean, I, I think it looks quite favourable, but that we do not build a sort of white elephant building and that everything is kind of kept a little bit open to change in its use. And I just really want to put that across and also the, the need for maybe added green space. Um, as some of the issues that Peter Fain um, mentioned about um, needing that extra space be there any subsequent pandemics. All right, thank you very much for that. Councillor Fain. Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, to, to my mind, in some ways, the key paragraph is on page 13. Uh, the town centre will be the main defining feature of North Stow by which it will be judged. Crucial to create a town centre where people want to be, even when the shops are shut, uh, because it has the best environment. Now, I think looking to the future, we know we have to not only cater for pandemics that's taken, but also for climate change, expect people to want to spend more time outside in front of buildings, in squares, not just in green spaces. And I think we need to not only ensure that we have the space for that, and Mr Thompson has answered my question on that, but also that we make it attractive space. And one of the features that we have to take into account that I think there is plenty of flexibility to cater for here is the roofscape. Uh, we have to make an interesting roofscape as well as an interesting frontage to the buildings if those open spaces are to be attractive from the outside uh, rather than just from enjoying the facilities inside the buildings. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Yeah, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm just a little concerned, well, more than a little concerned, at the emphasis that we seem to be placing on the situation as it is today. Um, I think we're giving far much too much attention to what is a temporary problem. Um, and this is a long, uh, we're building something here for decades and decades and decades, hopefully to come. And I would, I'm not happy to think that we're losing floor space for commerce, that we're losing, um, uh, apparently losing uh, employment. I don't think people are going to work at home. Some people will, but I think most people just want to get back to their normal work position, uh, going in, meeting people, what have you. So I'm a little more than a little wary now um, at the backing off and and not being realistic here. This is a temporary situation and all this business about everybody in the world is going to get on a bike. No, they're not. Um, all the cycling stuff is, is quite ridiculous. Um, older people won't do that. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah, lovely to get on a bike in this weather, but not in the middle of winter, for God's sake. So. So I'm not happy about how it's going. Thank you, Chairman. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't, Councillor Haylings, is it? I don't think we want to get into any <laughs> issues on cycling, do we? No, what I'd just like to say, Chair, is... Um, yeah, Chairman, not me. <laughs> To, to, to looking at this, I think, and in, in it's, it's responding to Councillor Heather Williams, I really do think this is well thought out and, and as she said the emphasis is on job creation and the flexibility that this allows i think the whole focus has been on job creation and this is a place that people want to be it's a place where it's linked in as a travel hub to other places if they need to go as well for work it enables them to work locally it has all of the sustainable transport options with the busway and the roads it has both car provision and car parking provision if that's needed as well as the cycling but more it's a place to be to enjoy being and it draws and as I like to say as well it's about bringing people from outside North Stowe and not just the local people it's drawing people in as well because of the provision of leisure and, and um, entertainment as well as retail and finally I think um, the 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 it's it's calculated to have both Homes England as a curator as well as the town centre delivery group and this is what gives me the confidence that we're not just a li li leaving a town centre to try and um, deliver itself 
and be hostage to to fortune. It's actually being curated, and that is in, incredibly important, I think, within the um, within the proposal being put forward here. And and I feel confident that this is enabling us to provide the job employment that is critically needed going forward, um, and that North Stowe will therefore be um, the landmark feature that we need it to be with this town centre. So I would be supportive, so I'm minded to support this proposal. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I can't see any more speakers there, so are we ready to actually move to a vote on this then? Yeah. So what is before us, the recommendation is the discharge of condition 14 of uh, planning application S2011-14 OL subject to the implement implementation of the strategy. Uh, are we all in favour of that? Agree. 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 Is there anyone against? Uh, Councillor Roberts, did you want to uh, yeah. vote against? I, I'm going to abstain, Chairman. You're abstaining, all right. I think that means I have to do a roll call then to make sure that we've got everybody. So we um, have a roll call for the votes. So you know what the recommendation before you is. I, I will call each member by name and you just tell me if you're for, against, or you wish to abstain. So it's Councillor Bradnam. For, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Daunton. Four. Thank you. Councillor Fain. Four. Oh, Councillor Halings. Four. Thank you. Councillor Milnes. Four. Councillor Ripith. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Um, I'm staying. Staying, All right. Councillor Heather Williams. Um, against, it's not enough for employment, sorry. Against, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen Williams. Richard, four. Oh, sorry, Richard, yes. Four. Okay. There's no <laughs> Excellent. Councillor Wright, please. Four. Four. And uh, Councillor Bachelor, my vote is four. So the outcome of the vote is two, four, six, eight, nine, four, one against and one abstention. Uh, that condition is therefore discharged. Thank you very much for that. Can uh, we have a five minute break? break? Sorry? Can we have a five minute break? Like that's what I was just about to. Bless your heart. Thank you, Chairman. Well done. So, so we have a, a 12 minute break. Please be back for 11.20, 11.20, thank you.
Okay, Chair, you are now live again. All right, thank you. Welcome back. Um, we're now on agenda item six uh, on your agendas. This is page 25. Um, can I just check with members of the committee that they have had the supplementary uh, element for the agenda? And they have that with their papers. Yes, I can see all nodding. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is application S0158 stroke 20 FL is in the parish of Sawston and the proposal is for the demolition of 528 square meters of storage building and the erection of 50,445 square meters of research and development accommodation. Um, your agenda does break that down into the various units um, that that uh, overall amount represents, but uh, I won't read through the lot. I'm sure you got it. So the site address is the former Spicer's site at Sawston Bypass, Sawston. The applicant is Arwe Research and Development Limited. Uh, the recommendation of the case officer is for approval of the full application subject to completion of the S106 agreement and conditions. The case officer will take us through the key material considerations. Uh, we haven't been able to have a site visit. This isn't a departure. The application is before us as uh, it is significant and or of strategic importance to an area beyond both specific site and parish. Also, Linton Parish Council requested the application be considered by planning committee. The presenting officer is Yole Medirios. Um, so if you'd like to do your pre presentation, Yole, over to you. Sorry, Chair, Chris Carter here. Just before oh, Yole yes. gives her presentation, um, I'm just going to make a brief comment for the committee's benefit. OK, fine. That's OK, thank you. Um, members of the committee will be aware that there has been considerable local, national and international interest in this proposal over the last week or so. Much of this attention has been focused on matters of security and international relations. I would like to remind members that in considering this application, the Council can only consider the planning merits of the proposals and not the proposed occupier and user. Members should consider the proposed use and whether that is acceptable and any material considerations which flow from that use and the proposed buildings. This may include but not be limited to issues such as landscape impact, heritage, ecology, sustainability, transport and others. The proposed user of the development is not a material planning consideration for us here today. The decision that the committee takes today should, as always, be taken in accordance with the development plan unless there are material considerations which indicate otherwise. In particular, members should focus on the requirements of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan and the National Planning Policy Framework. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carter. Uh, okay, uh, case officer, would you like to take make your presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, if you bear with me, yes, one second, I'm going to share my presentation from my screen. Can you just confirm you can see the presentation on the screen, yes, please? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a site location plan on the slide uh, where you can see in red, uh, outlined in red, the application site itself and outlining, outlining blue, the wider Huawei state, um, Sawston villages to the, uh, uh, apologies, let me just, um, Turn on the pointer. Sawston Village would be to the east of the wider state through um, via Mill Lane, uh, with links to, to Cambridge into Cambridge via Cambridge Road outside the slide. Apologies for that, and also via A1301 uh, to the north towards Cambridge and to the south towards A505. The Cambridge to Liverpool railway line runs across the wider state um, as well. And the nearest station is south of the site, Whittlesford Parkway. 
Wittlesford Road runs west of the Wyde estate towards Wittlesford Village in the south and Stapleford to the north. And the access to the site is um, via an existing vehicular access at the priority junction at the A1301, followed by a railway level crossing. And from here, via two routes to the internal part of the, the application site. The two routes are also part of the red boundary, therefore the application site. This encompasses as well the area to be demolished with this, this one that I'm pointing at the moment. The immediate context of, of the application site is formed by existing warehouses to the east, woodland to the north and west of the site, um, agricultural field to the south, and I just point your attention to the scheduled ancient monument, the Boral Hill, that's bounded with this uh, thinner grain line here. And also the dirt for fen I'm going to be referring to during my presentation, which is northeast of the site, approximately 400 meters. Uh, this is the River Cam, um, a non-designated uh, county wildlife site. And apologies there for fen is a, a site of special scientific interest, a triple, triple SI, as we call it. This is the site plan, including the total of uh, 50,445 square meters of B1B, as pointed by the chair, uh, many of the um, commercial research and development floor space, which is distributed into this larger building, which is the fab, we call it the fabrication laboratory, uh, which also encompasses office space. This is the central utilities building, the cab, as we call it, and some storage northwest of the application site. This is a service yard and this is the northern access road. Uh, this is the courtyard fronting the southern uh, facade of the building um, uh, where the entrance uh, for employees and, and staff in general will be located uh, and where you also have um, a landscape at the entrance to the site. Uh, this uh, separation of circulation helps with security and considering also health and safety principles. So logistics will be in this north part of the site, uh, of the site. Uh, and uh, with access also to a loading deck, uh, which will be in the basement through this ramp, a fire lane circulating the whole of the building. And said before, sorry, in the south of the site, there is just um, entrance to the car parking visitors, the courtyard for pedestrians and cyclists, and a ramp to access the basement car parking. Access uh, for cyclists and pedestrians are going to go uh, to take place along this uh, route, the southern access route. Uh, all the plans I'm going to show uh, from now on will be will have no, the north direction to your right hand side, but for the, the woodland that I um, that bounds the site to the north will be located in this area and also to the west in this area. This is the ramp to access the uh, uh, loading dock, uh, as mentioned previously. And here is the access ramp to the car parking. In total, there will be provided 300 uh, car parking spaces, 284 of them at the basement level with further 16 at ground floor. Um, which is much below policy indicative maximum number of car parking spaces. And uh, I consider this is in line with sustainability measures to reduce private car dependency. In total, the scheme includes 16 disabled spaces, which represents just about 5% of the total space. Part of the space disabled spaces will be located in the basement plan. Part of them will be in the ground floor plan uh, in the car parking visitor area. Sorry. This is the ground floor plan um, where the subfabrication area is located, uh, which is a mainly a central open area with surrounding circulation and, and uh, laboratories and plant rooms and further employee facilities, including the cycle storage with 80 cycling spaces for staff with direct external um, uh, access as well and adjacent um, shower rooms uh, for employment use. This is the part, the office part of the fab building with a reception entrance via the courtyard, as I mentioned before. 
and a colonnade le leading to the cafe, the, uh, which has also an external terrace fronting the woodland belt to the west of the site. Um, at the first floor, the offices are uh, uh, more open plan like and aligned with the clean room level. This is the clean room, sorry. These are aligned in this level so uh, people can actually see uh, from the office building what um, the research that's taking place within the clean room area. At the second floor, you will see that above the clean room there'll be a void uh, uh, used to allow for the air circulation that is necessary for the operation of the room in more open, open plan um, offices. This is the atrium uh, that goes above the, uh, the link between the two parts of the fab building. In the east-west section, you have a clear representation of the fab spaces I referred to with a sub fab at the ground floor, the clean room with 3.5 meters high and the void above it uh, um, used for air circulation, uh, which is in a bit more detail in this insert in the slide. Uh, you can see that air hand handling units will be also located in the space created by the vaulted roof, which has determined the arches design and ultimately the, the final height of the building at 21.5 meters at roof peak with flues above rising a further 4.5 meters. These are the east and south elevations where you can see uh, uh, the illustrated finishing materials. On the east and west facades, the finishing uh, materials will be bronze and metal louvers, bronze metal panels and limestone uh, in the bottom with window strips allowing for some um, natural light entrance and for a minimal uh, light in this part of the building where openings do not favour the clean process. This is a vertical glazed uh, curtain wall that generates a rhythm with the articulation of the roof uh, in dividing the, the, the more rigid mass of the building, if you like, and giving it a bit more rhythm, which has been uh, welcomed by the council's uh, urban design officer, I have to mention. Um, the southern facade, which will be um, the office element, sorry, this is the southern facade, um, is perhaps where the sustainable design features of the proposal is a bit more visible as balance has been achieved with the glass curtain walls and features to mitigate solar gain um, as well as even in light spillage such as external louvers and some mechanized uh, shading system and openable windows on this, on this uh, facade. Other features were included on the design um, you won't see in any slides of the presentation here, but it's important to mention that the design of the building um, aims to reduce energy, energy demand, such as heat recover, uh, with heat recover from the operational process to provide all heating and hot water demand for the building with an overall 25% reduction on building emissions, which is equivalent to a BREAM excellent accreditation in all topics of energy use and carbon reduction. There is a bespoke sustainability uh, assessment matrix ha that has been proposed with this um, uh, proposal uh, with the application and that has been accepted by the Council Sustainability Officer uh, and this will be recommended to be secured by condition. It's just relevant to say that in these uh, um, they've run a BREAM um, assessment um, in spite of having also the bespoke uh, matrix presented. These are some of the details of the facade treatment that I mentioned. So there's some features to control the entrance of the solar gain, especially on this side uh, towards north. This is uh, the main laboratory facade treatment. The roof will also have a matte colored me metallic finishing um, as shown uh, in the bottom right hand side, following the approach to the other materials used in fab, in the fab, uh, and um, as this is a key element, we're helping reduce the landscape and visual impact. Uh, using the sustainable design approach, photovoltaic will be uh, located, or PV panels, uh, not, not panels, sorry, PV uh, will be proposed in the roof 
there are high uh, efficiency panels um, with some of them with a gray film applied. They will be located also in the uh, central utility buildings and, and the external um, storage as well. The PVs help generate 11 and, and other features of the building, but mainly the PVs will help generate 11% of the energy consumption of the building. And the reminder will be used, uh, will be energy from the grid uh, and with the UKPN confi confirming that there is, um, it is possible to meet that demand. Um, so uh, the design of the PVs have been um, carefully proposed, uh, chosen uh, to help minimize the landscape and the visual impacts from, from the building. However, further details, not only for the PVs, but also further materials will be uh, secured, it's proposed to be secured by condition. The approach to the colouring in the PV was accepted by the Council Design Officer and Landscape Advisor, and a condition, as I said, will be, uh, is recommended. This is an image from the proposed fab, looking from the southeastern corner of the site with the CUB, the CUB building, um, using the same approach to the design, but of a lower height, conceived as an agricultural outbuilding in a farmyard-like setting. Overall, the Council's urban design offices of the view that the proposal creates a distinctive building that responds to both its set and setting and constraints of the site. Following me, my presentation, um, this slide is just to show that in terms of the wider context, it is relevant to highlight the position of the application uh, within an established employment area that is surrounded by Greenbelt, um, uh, which is mostly formed by farmland between the villages of Sawston and Whittlesford, and within the wider landscape of East England Chalk National Character Area. I make reference also to the SAM uh, mentioned before, the Borough Hill Schedule Lantern Monument and Dunford Fan as well as the River Cam um, CWS. The context of this location of, uh, is within the River Cam Valley. Um, it makes it uh, more visible from the wider area, mostly in the northern arc. You can see by the blue uh, areas, these are where um, the, building, the buildings are likely to be more visible, and uh, which is from the northern arc as from the south, it is generally filtered by existing trees. Not only it will be visible from the near um, um, viewpoints, this is within two kilometres radius, but also from more distant places such as Margaret's Mount and Magog Hills. A, a landscape and visual impact assessment therefore supports the application including photo montages of the years 1 and 15 of the de development and the proposed mitigation, uh, mitigations when being the case. This, this is a photo montage um, showing um, one of the conclusions that although there'll be a moderate impact, the buildings are going to be visible. This is from um, a1301 and this is from the views from uh, the National Cycling Route and, and Cambridge Road. Although there is a moderate impact in the immediate context, the proposals positively con consolidate this employment area and will be vis as visible um, or, um, as the existing warehouses, those ones more visible from um, A1301, but also still visible from Cambridge Road in these viewpoints. And um, understanding that this is going to be with high quality and sustainable design and being responsible, responsive still to the rural context where it's um, located. From the distance, distant views um, from Magog Hills and St. Magra's Mount, it's, um, the proposals will be located here. You can barely see, uh, and that's exactly one of the conclusions that indeed will, will cause less impact if compared to the existing warehouses, which are the, the white um, um, parts of this um, uh, the photomontage. From the St. Margaret's Mount, uh, from the obelisk, it wouldn't be visible. Therefore, the, the photomontage was not, um, the building would not model uh, to this photomontage. 
from Whittlesfold Road at Lee Grove um, Cottages and Bride away further northwest, the conclusion is that the building would have a moderate visual if effect. Again, this is visible here and it will be visible here from the bride away. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, it's our view that the undulated root silhouette is sympathetic to the countryside built and natural context. And again, the development uh, is considered to positively consolidate the established employment area. All the front of montages that are shown are representative of year, of year one, where mitigation measures are not fully established to help filter and reduce the visual impact from the development. Therefore, this, these will be the worst case scenario if, if um, um, look in this way. Overall, the, the council's landscape advisor is satisfied that the mitigation measures will, in a considerable extent, mitigate the visual impact from the proposed development. And as such, it is recommended that the final draft version of a landscape and ecological management plan, we're going to call it LAMP from now on, is secured by Section 106 agreement with the management, management um, for a period of 30 years. The landscape and ecological mitigation plan, or LAMP, has been developed to integrate the landscape and ecological measures including those to offset the loss within the red boundary, um, the loss in biodiversity within the red boundary, with achievement of significant off-site biodiversity gain of over 20% through, through the creation of important habitats, clearly listed here. So you, you see that there are proposals, um, off-site proposals all within um, Huawei's um, estate land holding. Sorry, Chair, could I just interrupt for a second? Um, Councillor Rippeth has uh, just had a, an issue and has had to drop out slightly. Can we just pause for a minute so that we can uh, get her back in and then maybe she could uh, catch the rest of this item? Absolutely. We'll hang on for a couple of minutes then. Thank you very much, Chair. Everybody's heard that, have they? Yes. Agreed. So can I ask if you can hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. If that helps. Yeah, sorry, I was just muted. Yeah, we can hear you. So that mean does that mean you haven't got a camera now then? Um I've got a camera on. Can you see me? We can me? see you too. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Am I allowed to still participate? So I think yeah, I've yeah. missed the very end. No, that's fine. We, we stopped the proceedings uh, to Thank get you. Back. OK, all right. Uh, we can go back to the case officer then. You know, Lee, you. Have you got more to tell us? Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll continue to share the, the presentation and perhaps pick up from the lamp. Um, um, okay. Yeah, go on, carry on. So um, as I was saying, this this is an image showing the uh, the mitigations that are included uh, within the landscape and ecological mitigation plan. I'm going to call it the LAMP for, um, for ease. Um, inside the site, you'd have a biodiversity uh, net loss with with the proposals. Therefore, if you're cons considering 
uh, all um, actions to mitigate not only the landscape and visual impact, but also um, uh, biodiversity, you'll achieve effectively a gain of over 20 percent, um, um, which has been noted by Right Left Trust when Malcolm um, supporting the, uh, the proposal, as well as the Council's Ecology Officer um, and Natural England, who in particular supports the uh, management uh, measures for the Denfort Fan and Triple SI, uh, all included, uh, uh, including, uh, sorry, also the Woodland Management Plan, uh, which now is has been included uh, within the LAMP. The LAMP is proposed to be secured by Section 106, um, with the details to be submitted and approved um, by the local authority before commencement of the development. Um, in terms of the water environment, we had a few comments on that. Uh, therefore, I thought it would be relevant to uh, point out to councillors that um, there's a number of conditions to ensure pollution control measures, given the existence of uh, a source um, protection zone that underlaying the site. Um, Anglin Water has confirmed that no risk to portable water uh, will take place uh, uh, as a result from the development, the proposed development. Cambridge Water has confirmed that there is existing capacity to meet the water demand for the development. Uh, also, Cambridge Water has pointed that there is a cumulative impact from wider, the wider area, uh, considering including um, development within the Oxford to Cambridge Arc. And that's uh, to be picked up from the company's business plan um, to from 20 year 20 to 25 onwards. Um, as proposed, uh, the, the level of the groundwater will be monitored through a generic quantitative risk assessment uh, with um, a relevant verification reports as well, if necessary, if any risk is identified. And uh, following Cambridge Water recommendation, and obviously uh, policies referring to sustainability in, in general, the proposals include uh, uh, water reuse and recycling methods, which uh, uh, with a 40% target water recovery, which equates to a BREEAM 3 water efficiency credit, uh, which is above policy requirements. In terms of transport, a transport assessment has been submitted in support of the application and has been reviewed by the County Council as Highways Authority, who have accepted that the transport assessment in terms of methodology and findings. The approach that was given was to consider the extent permission for the same application site uh, for circa 15,000 square meters of warehouses, which has not completed to date, but has allowed for a level of impact. And with this approach, the transport assessment concludes that there will be additional 14 cycle trips and that there will be um, uh, an impact um, in particular to the uh, A1301, uh, A505 junction with all parameters worsened on the northern arm of the roundabout in the PM peak. The Highways Authority, however, is satisfied uh, that um, this relative impact generated by the development can be mitigated with a package that includes a flare to the uh, roundabout um, the northern arm of the roundabout to be secured by section 106, as well as a, an east-west foot and cycle way also to be secured by section 106. It's um, outside the, the red boundary, the application site, and a travel plan to be uh, further detailed on um, and to be secured by condition. In terms of highway safety, uh, the highways authority has, has pointed out that part of the enhancements to the pedestrian and cyclist safety that was linked to the, the extent permission have not been um, implemented. Therefore, this is again uh, recommended to be reimposed as a condition to, uh, if permission is granted to the development, um, which will then be um, carried out uh, by a section to simulate agreement with directly, directly with the highways authority. This is just an image so showing um, the proposed. This is an indicative route to the east-west route, footpath and cycleway, 
which is to be secured by Section 106, uh, the developers will have to apply for that permission and service regarding um, ecological matters uh, as long as um, as, long, as well as other documents following the uh, local validation list for South Cambridgeshire will have to uh, be submitted to support this, this application. Um, the timing for the application to be uh, submitted uh, for this route and for the route's implementation is also going to be is expected to be included on the Section 106 agreement. I just would like to point out that the, the route links Whittlesford Road to the west to uh, um, the existing public footpath towards south and Whittlesford uh, Church Garden, which is also part of the uh, National Cycle Route number 11, and um, go across to, into Mill Lane and then Cambridge Road into Cambridge as part of the route. Um, a, an important uh, feature of the proposal is um, in relation to the existing Borough Hill Fort, the Schedule of Ancient Monument, and with Historic England concluding that the proposal would cause a less than substantial harm to the, the SAM, reason to why in discussion with the Historic England and the County Archaeologies uh, during the course of the application, um, applicants have prepared a draft archaeological conservation management plan and a community outreach plan to be secured also by section 106 six agreement. The management and the outreach plans recommend 12 policies for the conservation and increase in access to the design designated assets, including the finalization of the plans, such as this one I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, um, but also um, regular review every five years of the plans the removal of the agriculture, which is uh, shaded in green, um, which is a, a potential, uh, it's a risk, current risk to the SAM, and with a proposal of a 20 meter b meters buffer to uh, for any uh, physical impact to be um, to require written permission from Historic England. Some of the users, such, such as the agricultural user, for example, to not uh, have such requirement, um, but the proposal is that this is included in the one of as one of the twelve policies. This the the twenty meters buffer will be for information five meters away from the closest point of the development, which is uh, located in the basement. The draft plan has been welcomed by both Historic England and the County Council as um, and uh, the archaeologist um, officer who are satisfied that the draft plan represent potential to permanent improvements to the assets management and conservation with correspondent increase in knowledge about the asset by the public in general. The management plan and outreach plan are recommended to be secured by agreement as, as previously mentioned. My recommendations for approval of the planning application subject to conditions um, outlined in my report and completion of a section 106 agreement um, with additional condition. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I'd like to, if I may, um, request to add a condition for development to begin no later than three years from permission being granted. Thank you, Chairman. This, this okay, is thank you very much. Yes, OK. Members, any points of clarification, please? Yes, we have Councillor Milnes. Right. Councillor Milnes, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so um, in the material, key material considerations, we're asked to be um, looking at sustainable travel network. And I note that there is a condition uh, being applied for a three metre wide uh, cycle track into uh, across the um, um, plot, across the uh, curtilage of the, so that people can cycle in. But unfortunately, this doesn't really connect to much of a cycle network to either the east or the, the south, although there is a uh, cycleway and a relatively new cycleway that going into Whittlesford Village. But the um, cycleway from uh, 
uh, going to the east and, and then along Cambridge Road is two sides of a triangle. And one of the common features of the parish responses um, or the, the three local parishes, Sawston, Stapleford and Whittlesford, was to ask that a cycleway uh, went along uh, the A1301 bypass so that we got a, a more immediate route into the site. And if we could ask, if I could ask the officer to go back to her transport um, assessment and mitigation slide, we can see that there is a um, an existing um, formerly metal road on the eastern field. So, um, if you that, <laughs> if you could go back to that slide, and perhaps if you could um, go to the uh, entrance point. Yeah, and, and then go uh, roughly north, you'll see that there is a track marked. Now, on the, on the other side, on the on the field to the to the east. So a little bit further, yeah. So following, uh, note a little bit further to your right. You you can uh, thank you. That's it. So that that's a the former um, metal road that was the access to the site before the um, uh, bypass was built. And if you see, it goes up towards the uh, SSSI. The, the councillor, what, what yeah. are you actually asking for? So, <laughs> so what I'm asking is why, when uh, all three parishes have asked for cycle access along the 1301, was the transport assessment saying we don't need to do it when we are asking okay, for so, sustainable so travel let's, let's networks? You're asking for something which isn't actually in the application. Well, actually, it's referred to many times. Yeah, but it's not actually in the proposal, is it? What we have to do, as as you know perfectly well, is to actually make a judgment on what is before us. You know, it's that route uh, isn't actually a part of the proposal, is it? No, so my question is, why is it not? All right, let's have an answer to that then, please. Yes, Chair. So this this is the the cycle route that Councillor was referring to, that's secured by condition. Um, this internally to the development will will lead to this route, which is just uh, it's not a formal cycleway. Um, it's unpaved as well. And what with the proposal, what's being proposed is this east west footpath and cycle path. Uh, with the design to be um, um, proposed with a, an appropriate pool application uh, for that purpose and as I said which also has to be supported by several services and other documents um, following the local validation list. So this... I, I'm sorry, uh, I think the question is why haven't you used this existing arrangement? Is there some reason for that? Uh, yes, because we can only ask for mitigations which are relevant or proportionate to the development in front of us. And I followed the Highways Authority review of the transport assessment and they have concluded that these package, including this east west, um, the travel plan and the northern arm um, for the roundabout uh, uh, at the junction at A1301 and A505, would be sufficient to mitigate the impact from this development. OK, thank you. That's the answer so, to that. One. So Do you want to come back, Councillor? Yes, yes, please, because yeah. um, we've got 350 to 400 uh, staff expected to be uh, on staff uh, on site. Um, and so I just have a question about where they will live, because that reflects on the whole sustainability of the project. And, and what we're saying is that we want to encourage more use of sustainable um, transport methodologies and particularly by bike so where where will those 350 to 400 people live and how will they get into the site right thank you if i may clarify Do we have an analysis of that <laughs> yes so that is modeled that's what normally is modeled uh, by the transport assessment again that has been agreed and accepted by the highways authority um, and uh, it's my view that anything further would be 
disproportionate to the building than against um, 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 national uh, guide guidelines and uh, legislation for that uh, matter. Um, I okay. understand well, that this that's is... It. That's the answer then, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Chair, we have um, Councillor Roberts who's next. Um, yep. Chris Carter has asked to speak. That's it, okay. On this. Mr Carter, would you like to speak, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to try and help on, on this particular point, uh, members will have noticed from uh, the application material that uh, this is anticipated to be a first uh, phase, if you will, of redevelopment at this site within the employment area for the applicant. So there will be further opportunities to secure additional mitigation, potentially proportionate to those schemes that come forward in the future. Um, uh, in terms of that additional sort of cycling uh, infrastructure that Councillor Milnes is is describing. So um, the case officer Yerle is correct to uh, say that we have to consider the mitigation necessary for this particular proposal. Um, but I suppose what I'm advising the committee is that there are likely to be further opportunities um, as that master plan pl planned approach is developed. And that's certainly something that as officers we're looking to engage with the applicant on in those discussions. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Chair? Have, have, sorry? Chair, could I? I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I'm... Who is shouting out? Well, you didn't ask me if I wanted to come back. <laughs> you wish uh, to make another point. Could it be very brief, please? So uh, my, question, my question was about um, charging points for both cars, uh, e-bikes and potentially uh, e-scooters. If the officer could comment on that, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is provision for charging points, 15 charging points. This is going to be secured by condition as well as part of the low emission strategy for the development. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. And I think maybe my questions will be to Mr Carter in light of what he's actually just said, rather than the presenting officer. Um, uh, personally, I'm very concerned about the um, claim that Cambridge Water are, are OK with it, because that's not what they are saying. They are basically saying that for now, they think they've got the capacity, but it's uh, it's all dependable on other things happening up to 2025. Now, we're not very far in the future. And there is a lot of uh, in, interesting information in the report about the amount of water that is going to be abstracted here. So um, I'd like a little bit of a clarification on that. But my real clarification today is why is this coming forward today? Um, Mr. Carter has just talked about future applications. Um, in both um, the comments from past, present and future and the Cambridge Quality Panel uh, on page 1441 uh, and Linton's comments as well, they are really saying that we ought to have a master plan for that. I mean, I understand why this is being put forward today in the manner that it is, because it seems to me it's part before the horse. Any application like this, I understand they have 500 acres that they've bought or more. Now, you, Mr. Carter's just talked about their, their future plans, so they obviously have future plans. What other applicant lately has been allowed to come with us having that knowledge to bring an application forward without also of explaining to us what their master plan actually is all about? Now, I'm Sorry. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get an answer to that then. One last word. I do not like Trojan horses being wheeled through gates, whoever they are being wheeled through by. <coughs> I think that they should actually be deferred. We should have been having proper presentations. We should have had the applicant coming into us explaining where we could have... All right, OK, you, you can make that point shortly. We're only doing clarification at the moment. Mr Carter, could you uh, enlighten us, please? Yes, yeah. thank you, Chairman. Um, well, just on that last point, there, there was a presentation made to uh, the committee last year uh, on, on this particular application, 
uh, in advance of its um, submission. But with regard to the, the master planning approach, uh, that's a, a fair question to ask. But they actually all withdrew in their application. We're starting a fresh air. Why the heck? Uh, Councillor, just yes, be quiet, please, and let the officer answer. Uh, would you like me to address that point as well? or If you'd like to. So, yes, uh, Councillor Roberts is correct. There was a, an initial planning application that was made and later withdrawn. Following that, the applicant entered into a lengthy period of pre-application advice with the council, uh, and that included a presentation to, to members, which was held uh, whilst we were able to do so in person at South Cambridgeshire Hall. Uh, with regard to the, the master plan approach, um, that's a fair question to ask. Um, and we are encouraging the applicant to produce a master plan for further phases of development on this site. But uh, it's important that the committee bears in mind that this is an allocated employment site uh, and this is an application for an employment use. So it's perfectly appropriate that we should be asked to determine this application at this stage. Um, any further um, employment proposals on this site, we're encouraging the applicant to enter into a master plan or to develop a master plan for our consideration. Um, because uh, there is potentially more significant impact from that scale of development. But the proposal that's in front of us is, uh, in principle, an employment use on an allocated employment site. And, and there's no uh, issue with the Council considering that on, on its merits today, in my opinion. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a list of speakers, I think. We do, Councillor Bradnam. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Clarification only, please. Hmm. Oh, am I unmuted now? Yes, sir. Okay. Was being very reluctant. Um, I just wanted to, um, in, in fact, do you know what? I'm going to withdraw my comment and come back in the debate, if I may. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. And we have. We've got further speakers. Yep, Councillor Fain, Councillor Halings, and Councillor Richard Williams. Right, all right. Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my clarification relates to water resources, um, touched on briefly by Councillor Roberts just now. In particular, paragraph 41 on page 36. Um, this is a very sensitive issue, of course, because the river cam just to the north of here had dried up for a significant period of last year due to over abstraction largely. So the question relates to the comment by Cambridge Water. That therefore, on-site water reuse and recycling should be a major consideration for the proposal. To what extent are planning officers satisfied that that request from Cambridge Water is met by this application? Thank you for that. Uh, case officer, could you deal with that, please? Consider that they are going beyond um, policy requirements of achieving water credits. I am satisfied with their proposal, yes. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Halings, please. Thank you. And, and I think this is such a, a key issue, uh, which is about water scarcity and management. And I'd just like to come back um, to the case officer a bit more clarification on Councillor Fain's question, which is in the conditions. So if we pick up the, the paragraph that Councillor Fain has just mentioned, which is specifically, and it's mentioned both on page 36 and on 56, which is specifically around reuse and recycling. Now, I also recognise that they've gone beyond policy in terms of the 40% and the three credits for the Bream. But when we look at the condition um, in the bespoke sustainability assessment on page 82, I'd just like to ask, because as I understand in your slide, you said that it was um, that they had the BREAM, but they're not going to use BREAM. It's equivalent to BREAM because they're using their bespoke sustainability assessment. So it's not BREAM. So therefore, in, you know, in the comments, it was therefore make sure that in the condition, this is really nailed down because it's not BREAM. And it does say in the condition, the specification shall demonstrate the achievement 
of a minimum of three credits equivalent. I would like to see that we ex can, is it possible to explicitly mention the reuse and recycling? Because it mentions rainwater and reuse of pure water, but it doesn't mention the reuse and recycling as mentioned in the prior comments. Is that possible or is there a reason why that's not? Right, thank you. I don't see why it couldn't be inserted in here. Um, uh, I do believe my colleague Emma Davis is with us in the meeting. I'm not sure whether she would like to add anything to that point. Emma Davis, yeah, I'm here. if I may chair. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'm here. I think we could add some wording uh, with reference to water reuse and recovery into the condition wording um, and the specification that they will need to submit will set out the approach. It will basically be the same sort of information that would be um, submitted to the BRE for full certification. Um, but yeah, we can look at some wording uh, to add to that condition. OK, thank, thank you very much. One one more point just yep. on, on that same, just to that yeah, belt and braces, if we are going this, is that in the generic quantitative risk assessment, which is the second condition which is related to this, which is around the fact that, as Councillor Roberts mentioned, we won't get the Cambridge water reassessment until 2022 or 2025. So therefore we do this one in the comments um, from in the report. The recommendation is that's done and includes natural England because it's the cumulative effect of water abstraction and the impact on the ecological system. Can we include explicitly that natural England would be part of that because they're not? And that's on page um, page eight. No, no, that's on page 74. I'm looking at the wording of the condition councillor, if that helps. Uh, condition six. Yes, condition six. Could we could we include Natural England as part of that, as it, as is mentioned in the report? I don't see any problem with including. They will be consulted uh, whenever the documentation is submitted to the uh, to us as local planning authority. We will consult with Natural England, but I can ex explicitly um, say that on the wording. Okay. Um, and can you come back to us at the end then so that we can um, decide whether or not we want uh, you know, a beefed up condition because we will have to vote on it at some point. OK. OK. Yeah, uh, sure. More Richard. speakers. OK, yeah. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got I've got two points of clarification. Um, the first relates to the updated documents we were sent. So the update uh, to uh, the trigger agreed by Highways Authority, paragraph 195, this refers to the east-west um, cycle and book. Um, it, it, it seems this this has been, to my mind, weakened a little bit in, in that we've now got this two-stage trigger process instead of it being a condition this is implemented prior to occupation. The first condition talks about reasonable endeavours to secure consent within 12 months, but um, but of course that's not not guaranteed. So I was wondering if, if, if the officer can clarify why um, precisely that, that that's been changed and um, and then to my mind I'm weakened somewhat. Um, that's my first point of clarification. The second point of clarification um, is, is perhaps more straightforward and that refers to the um, uh, fuel storage tanks of page 142, uh, sorry paragraph 142, 143. Um, I know that there are conditions attached um, to that, but I was wondering if the officer could just clarify for me the information that had been received in a little bit more detail and um, would convince the officers that, that the concerns that were initially raised about the, the fuel tanks being below the water level um, could be satisfactorily addressed. So a, a bit more information on that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, um, we have initiated discussions about the implementation of east-west route um, with the highways authority. So along the process of the assessing the application, um, it um, it was clear then that further surveys would need to be carried out to specifically detail accurately detail the design um, and the tracing of that route, and therefore. Um, uh, um, an application isolatedly would need to be submitted to, to the council for, for approval. 
Um, uh, I'm sorry if I didn't record that um, um, properly, but this this has been agreed with the, the trans uh, sorry the highways authority and the uh, definitive map uh, team. Um, as they were requesting also that the maintaining um, uh, the number of issues that needs to be further discussed with the highways authority as well in terms of maintenance of, of that route, if it's to be publicly accessible. That's why the, you see the change uh, on the two phase trigger. Um, on the other point about the fuel storage tanks, this 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 is being also along the process uh, in assessing the application that's being further discussed with the environment agency. So they are the ones uh, carefully looking into any risk to potential, or the main ones, I should say, such a consultees looking into the risk to pollution uh, um, for controlled waters uh, that underlay in the site. Um, and a technical note has been provided by the applicants at a later stage, which then again has been reviewed uh, not only by environment agency, but also um, the local lead flood authority and the council's sustainable drainage engineer. Uh, but mostly the environment agency is satisfied that to this stage, uh, the information um, um, demonstrates that the risk, any potential risks could be controlled. Uh, however, they would like to see further detail as if permission is granted as the development progresses. OK, thank you. Uh, any more speakers? I do have public speakers, so we'd like to get on with that soon. Bradnam, I think, was wanted to come back. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, have you found a question? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, a number of my questions have been addressed by others, which is useful. Um, but I too was worried about that storage tank and I, which is for diesel fuel um, for uh, their backup generator. And I, and indeed spokespeople from villages asked the question, why, why does it have to be underground? Because I just wanted to ask, I know you've just said that it's been resolved to the satisfaction of the water authority, but did anybody ask whether it could be stored above ground? Because most places would have abundant storage to ensure that the, the any potential overflow didn't go into the ground and particularly as this is chalk catchment and um, a source of water for for um, drinking water. Um, yeah, all right. I think we've got the point. Uh, OK, so keep the other thing, sorry, the other thing I wanted to ask uh, Ms Medeiros was where does this site sit relative to the Nine Wells um, Springs? Because they are just over the railway to the north, aren't they? I'm so, apologies, uh, I'm not sure I can respond to that last question, but I can open a map if that's, that's useful um, following uh, the first bit then, please. further clarification. Yes, in terms of the fuel storage, um, I cannot um, summarize all the technical details, but uh, we we have arranged a meeting with uh, the engineers, both from the applicant side and also from the environment agency. There's a, spe a specific team uh, within the agency to look into that. Um, the technical note that has been provided by the, the applicant included, this is one of the requirements in the first consultation response from environment agency. Um, um, uh, sorry, reiterated by the second, including. Um, and uh, given that we've arranged uh, a final meeting um, to ensure that the Environment Agency was satisfied with all alternatives being uh, studied by the applicants. So indeed, they have studied all the alternatives to justify uh, uh, the, the choice for the, the underground uh, tanks, the location of the tanks underground. Um, uh, I, I, I trust the Environment Agency uh, view on that and I'm, I'm following their, um, uh, they removed their objection uh, based on that, a technical note and meeting for the meetings. Um, and I am satisfied that this has been addressed. Uh, uh, a note is also important that Anglin Water has also reviewed the development in terms of the risk to the uh, uh, 
to that source uh, for public consumption and has stated in their response that there is no risk from, from the proposals at this point. Mm. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, Okay, the other one can. I'm sorry, that. yeah. Do you want me to? No, I'll have to come, we'll come, come, come back to that later if you can find something. Councillor Daunton is the last one on the list. All right, there's an answer on the chat, um, oh. Councillor Bradnam. Um, thank you, um, Chairman. My question has been answered. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Then, I, in that case, I will move on to public speakers. Um, um, and I, is Mr. Koopmans with us, please? Is uh, representing the, the applicant. I am, thank you, Chairman. Would you like to put your... Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mrs. Koopmans. Um, Ex excellent, thank I'm you. I'm it's only a three minute. Uh, <laughs> I realise that, thank but, you. Uh, uh, over to you when you're ready then. I'll let you know when the three minutes are. Thank you. My name is uh, Hank Koopmans and I'm the CEO of Huawei Technologies Research and Development UK. I've lived and worked in this area for more than 30 years, so uh, these exciting plans are also relevant to me on a personal level as well as professionally. I'm delighted to be at this meeting this morning to represent Huawei and present in brief our application to, to bring to life the former Spicer site with a state-of-the-art research and development facility along with new office space. Huawei is a long-term major investor and partner for the UK. For more than 20 years, we have invested and operated in the UK, providing 3G, 4G, and now 5G products. And we plan on continuing to do so for many years to come. We currently employ 1,600 people in the UK across 20 UK offices. It's our intention to generate several hundred jobs through the creation of our proposed R&D centre in Sawston at the council designated employment site. This will be a mix of new jobs and colleagues relocating to the site, bringing with it a further boost to the local economy. We're delighted the application has been recommended for approval. We've taken a great deal of time to liaise with the community, including parish councils through face to face briefings a public exhibition and a dedicated website. And many of the proposed changes to the application originated from our public consultation. For example, the transport assessment details, the proposed east-west pedestrian cycle path has just discussed, and, uh, and the fact that this will be publicly accessible. Our application has been carefully considered uh, for transport, ecology, heritage, visual impact, noise and air quality issues as explained by the case officer and again uh, the council officers are content with the plans the planning officers have also noted as you heard earlier that it would qualify for and three brm water efficiency credits which is well above the policy requirements furthermore following discussions with officers over our earlier withdrawn application, we have addressed the comments received over the visual impact and biodiversity and ecology through an enhanced landscape and ecology management plan, which, as the report before you states, will add benefits to the offsite biodiversity gains with the cre creation of important habitats. In addition, we will continue to work with the community and the county historic environment team and also welcome their recommendations for section 106 to include a long-term management and conservation plan for the Iron Age Hill Fort on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, we will always listen to feedback and ideas for improvement and such as future cycle paths and our provision for future charging points. And, and we welcome the officer's report for recommendation and also the additional uh, conditions that was uh, just discussed, particularly on the water resources. I'd like to clarify that our proposal does include uh, does not include any uh, direct abstraction of water, just for clarification. But we are supportive of the beefed up condition as just discussed earlier on and described by the chair. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification, members? Yes, from Councillor Milnes, and just to clarify to Councillor Cuthcart, chair, that I, I don't think he'd be able to make a, a question. No, I think. He was just joining the meeting. OK, so Councillor Mills and then Councillor Roberts. 
Yes, so thank you uh, to the applicant for mentioning the uh, alternative uh, cycle routes as he picked up on that was a, an issue for the local parishes. But I didn't get a, an answer from the officer to a specific question, which was um, where the employees are likely to live, where where will they be coming from? Um, and this, this is back to my desire to ensure that we maximise sustainable modes of transport. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Koopmans. Ah, I, I thought Mr. Milne was addressing the, the councillor, the uh, officer. Uh, well, as, as I just said, um, we're, we're very happy to to engage uh, when we look at, at the future with with you and, and other parish councils. Uh, looking at future cycle paths and, and future improvements to the entire site. Um, it was indeed, as the case officer explained, not part of this application. Um, but uh, definitely, um, we definitely want to engage with the community for all future improvements and developments. So also, yes. we will, so, so, we will so talk about this. The question I was asking specifically was where are the employees likely to live? Uh, so we've got three or four hundred yep. uh, new employees coming to the site. Where will they be coming from? Yeah, uh, I can't guarantee that existing employees will all move to the site, but um, we think we, we, we're very happy with our current employees and they're happy to work with us. So we assume that um, of the uh, current um, employees, maybe uh, about several hundred jobs will, will be created. Um, in fact, I will jump to some information that I had here off my screen. Chair, I'm happy to take this information later on in the, in, in the meeting if that's going to help. Uh, yeah, I mean, where, where those new employees, of course, will live. Uh, yeah, that's, that's difficult for us to say. We want to create local jobs, of course. Jobs for local people. Chair, it's Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, he, sorry, just before Councillor Roberts speaks, it's Chris Carter. Sorry, have we still got Councillor Bachelor with us? Yeah, I'm just back again. All oh, right. <laughs> I did drop out there for a few minutes. Um, OK. okay. Councillor Roberts. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, to the uh, applicant's agent, um, you also, as did Mr Carter earlier, um, speak about your future plans and um, I've got your delightful propaganda um, and I would like to know where is your master plan? Um, you are talking about um, future support of this area, you've been in it for all these years, uh, highway, whatever you call them, so, um, are talking about you know, being here for the long time future, you have got 500 odd acres of land. Where is your master plan? OK, in short, first of all, on the 500 acres, uh, thank you for your question. Um, as you heard in the introduction, most of that is green belt. And uh, as the current uh, application also shows, we have no intention to to build on the, on the green belt. There is uh, pl plenty for us to build on the brown uh, field side. In terms of the future uh, development that we will do, of course, we will work closely together with all the stakeholders on what that ought to be. Uh, we don't want this just to be a, a bigger presence for Huawei. Um, innovation, if I just may speak from an R&D perspective, it is through collaboration and we want this to be a facility for Cambridge and for the UK. And in that respect, the local team, the UK team, of course, is in close discussion uh, with the company how we would like to see that to go that forward. And we will develop that into a master plan as soon as we can and as soon as required for the, for the next phase. Could you Pardon? answer the question? Where is Roma? I do not believe that uh, a multi 
um, international business like yours that has got Cow Council Roberts. Council where Roberts. it is. You where have that catch is. what's in front of you, not what may or may not come in the future. Where is it? So well, where is it? I mean, if you're dissatisfied, you know, you have a, a vote later. OK, thanks very much. Any other comments? Yes, Councillor Bradnam. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Uh, yeah, good. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr Kumpas. I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned in your explanation of uh, when you were answering Councillor Milnes's response about where staff were likely to come from. You mentioned staff coming from another site. Are you actually, as I recall, you have a site in Cambridge, do you not? Are you planning to, uh, sorry, can you explain, do you have a site already in Cambridge? And if so, how many people are currently employed there? And if so, what proportion of those people, you know, are you planning to move wholesale to this new site or will you leave your site in Cambridge? As part of this planning application, the specific uh, development that we're looking at here and the technology involved, it will be our team from Ipswich actually um, that um, will move across. Um, we hope that most of them will move across and that would mean that looking at the numbers in front of you, uh, we would create about 200 additional new jobs. Uh, we also have a site in Cambridge, that's correct, uh, that's on the Science Park. Yeah. but that's not part of this current application. OK, thank you for that explanation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Right, I think that's our speakers one, there. One so more come in, Chair, which is Councillor Heather Williams. Oh, a late entry again. Right. OK, Councillor Heather Williams. I thought I said entry, the please. Chairman. Um, sorry, it's, it's around these employment figures. I just want to make sure because there's been several questions on it. So so what we're saying, you're you're saying is that this is essentially a relocation from Ipswich, which will mean that there's about 200 people that are moving jobs from Ipswich, but you don't know what proportion of them will physically move. So there's potential commuting from from where they currently live. Um, I suppose so. The question is how many people within a 35 mile radius of of the site do you think will actually be living within within the 35 mile of the of the new site and how many jobs will there be additional for local people um if that makes yep, sense no, rather than relocated yep. jobs and I, I feel that may help all of us that are asking questions around employment yep. so yeah. how many people will be living within the work, go to work area the 35 miles how many relocating and how many extra jobs for local people currently here thank you yep sure so just on, on the number of uh, new jobs, so that's clear. Um, I mean, clearly I, I can't guarantee that every current member will come with us, but uh, we hope that will be uh, more or less everybody. And that means in the creation of an additional 200 new jobs. To operate the site will require 367 jobs. Um, in terms of where will they live with respect to your 35, we like we would very much like everybody to live locally. Um, we have already worked with officers and continue to work on how we can create a, a travel plan for uh, sustainable uh, travel and traffic. Um, and, and yes, uh, just like you, we, we, we've all been working from home and we try to see if part of that could be continued into the future and minimize as much as we can uh, any traffic. Um, Clearly, we can't force people to, to move within the 35k radius, but we will encourage people, of course, to, uh, to, to live close to work and to, to minimise long journeys. OK, thank you very much. All right, I think that's now. Uh, Chair, there is Councillor Bradham has asked for further clarification. We do yeah. need to get on, so please be quick. Uh, I will. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to ask Mr Koopmans, um, has the travel plan been drawn up on the basis of uh, uh, the information of plus 200 jobs or has it been drawn up on the basis of the 367 jobs which he said were required to operate the plant? Uh, I don't know all the details but the whole travel plan has taken into account all 
uh, all people on the side, that, they, that takes the entire operation on the side. Thank you, because I hadn't appreciated it was 367 to operate. I thought it was plus 200, but thank you. Right, thank you very much. All right, we're, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Koopmans. Thank uh, you, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, if we can move on to the Parish Council representatives then please. I have a representative from Stapleford Parish Council, Councillor Keetle. Are you with us please? Yes, it's Cattell. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good, thank you. Um, uh, right, in terms of what I've been hearing, um, I would first of all like to say that the, the local councils have had many presentations which have been very informative and the company have been very open in the discussions that they have had with the parish councils, which is a positive about them. The problem is that on every consultation there has been, they have ensured us that the majority of the people who are working there will live close enough to be able to cycle into the site and therefore if they are close enough to cycle into the site my question is why have they not included cycle paths that would enable that connectivity from the local environment the other thing is if they're all going to cycle into the site why do we need so many car park spaces and I'm, I'm really confused as to what is actually being presented here because it does not meet with the consultations that we have had in the local villages. Can I just clarify if we've still got our chairman? Sorry, he appears to have frozen and, and dropped off of, of my yeah. screen. Yep, yeah, let me try and uh, contact him to get him back. No. I'm sorry, Petal, what we'll, we'll, we'll do, Barbara, is, is make sure that you have your time. Thank you. I'm happy to second an adjournment if it's required. Uh, it's OK, I'll, I'm back again. <laughs> sorry. Well done, John. Lost contact there again. We need some new technology somewhere. I'm sorry, Mrs. Um, Councillor Kettle. Uh, are you with us now? I am. Do you want me to repeat what I said? Um, I, I think I'm probably barred from voting anyway, since this is the second time I've dropped out of it. No, we paused. So, so pr do press on. OK, um, well, I will begin again because uh, it was quite short and sweet. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank the, um, the company for the many presentations that they have given to us as the local villages and local communities, which have been very clear and have been very helpful. But in every consultation there has been, they have made the point that their employees that are coming will be local and will be cycling. Now, Ipswich is not cyclable from, nor the environments around Ipswich. There are two local stations, one of which is at Great Shelford, one of which is at Whittlesford. If people are coming across, they need to get across either by car or by train, and they need to link in with cycle paths, which we have been assured would be there. They promised there would be connectivity, to the local villages for the local people to be able to be employed. They instead are building several car park spaces. I didn't catch the number, but it seemed to be quite a lot of car park spaces. Um, and it doesn't seem that cycling is now what they are actually putting forward. I know you said it's not part of this, but it was part of all their consultations. And therefore, I'd like to know why it has dropped off the Richter scale. All right, thank you very much for that. Members, any points of clarification you'd like to raise? No, none, Chair. None. All right, Councillor Kettle, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, we have a, a statement from Little Shelford Parish Council, um, which Mr Carter is going to read to us. Mr Carter. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll, I'll read this verbatim. While supporting the principle of, of the redevelopment of the former Spices site, the Parish Council object to the current proposals on the following grounds. Firstly, insufficient protected species survey data provided. 
whilst acknowledging this work is in progress to accord with BS 42020, all survey information should be available prior to determination. The PEA was undertaken in February and ruled out broad nesting bird surveys and invertebrate surveys. Given the mosaic of semi-natural pioneering habitats present within the development footprint, this decision requires clarification as brownfield sites can include open mosaic habitats of importance to scarce invertebrates and extensive scrub areas are increasingly important for declining farmland and woodland birds, including nightingale, turtle dove, spotted flycatcher, all former breeders in the surrounding area. The second point, no biodiversity offsetting baseline provided or assessment as to how the proposal would deliver a minimum 10% mandatory net biodiversity gain. The proposed loss of habitats is significant on a local scale. The wider campus vision has potential to increase the value of existing habitats across the land holding. However, without an approved site-wide master plan, there is a danger that individual lot planning applications will come forward and not realise this potential. The ecological surveys, sorry, this is the third point. The ecological surveys have not included the river and therefore not assessed the impact of the proposed riverside walk on existing habitats and species. Similarly, there are loose suggestions of public access to the lake, but no detail as to how this might function and impact on the existing ecology. While supporting the proposed principle of pedestrian and cycle access from Wittlesford Road, Riverside Walk and, and Lake, these are effectively off-site of the proposed development and it's not clear uh, if their provision is binding or the level of proposed upgrading for instance will lighting be proposed in what is currently a dark river corridor next point lack of information on proposed woodland management of the retained tree belt relied upon for screening the arboriculture report states that the woodland is dominated by ash the majority of which may succumb to ash dieback and therefore requires additional planting to retain a visual screen to the river valley the tree line is relied upon for screening, but the proposed exhaust stacks appear to be significantly higher than this feature. Next point, proposed use of horse chestnut in the landscaping scheme. This species suffers from a host of pathogens and are unlikely to establish and mature into the desired specimen trees. A better alternative species should be chosen. And finally, concept of positioning sports pitches along the river valley. This is not consistent with a floodplain landscape and raises issue of associated infrastructure, including flood lighting. Thank you. Chair? Oh dear. Looks as though our chair has gone AWOL again. I think he's frozen, hasn't he? There's this picture Hi. has. I have a matter of clarification around some a procedural matter. If I can raise that with you, Pippa, as vice chair. I was going to just wait until we had these speakers and, and I was probably going to raise exactly the same one, Heather. Um, if, if, Councillor, if Councillor Cattell is still here, I'm not sure if we asked if she had the permission to speak on behalf of the Parish Council, but it could be, I might not heard it for technical reasons. Um, but given the importance of the site, I think we need to make sure that box is most thoroughly ticked. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, have we got? Yes, I'm still here. No, sorry. Sorry, Councillor. Just one moment. I'm just checking if the chair is still with us. Uh, he, he doesn't appear to be. Would you like to uh, take a break while I can attempt to reconnect the chair? Yes, I think that would be important. We could adjourn for lunch. Agreed. Agreed. Time. Let's just wait until he's back online. Do you wish me to clarify at this point? Yes, please. Yes, I am speaking for Stapleford Parish Council. And you have authority, you've give, you, they've given you the authority to speak for them. Yes, I am a councillor on Stapleford yes. Parish Council. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Aaron, how are we? Uh, hi, Councillor Hayland. So I'm just on the phone to him now. He's uh, attempting to reconnect as we speak.
Did you catch that? Yes, I did. Thank you. Oh, I was just <laughs> Yes, it is cancer. I was going to say that. Thank you. Um, we've just had a, a note. Stephen Reed, who is our legal support. Stephen, would you just like to mention your comment and, and address that to Councillor Kettle as well? Um, Councillor Kettle, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, just for the record, we need you to confirm that you have the authority from your parish council to speak on their behalf today. The fact that you are a member of the parish council of itself does does not give you that authority. I have the permission of the parish council to make the comment today. That's very agreed by the parish council. And, and in three copies. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, sorry, everybody, for raising that, but I, I think we all want to make sure that um, uh, we dot the i's and cross the t's. Absolutely, no problem. Back in. Are you you back in, Chair? Hang on. Yes. Yeah, I'm with, with you again. Although, I mean, obviously, m my connection's very unreliable, it would seem at the moment. So do stand by, Vice Chair, to, to take the reins. Um, where are we now then? Well, we're just, we've just had the um, confirmation from um, Councillor Kettle that she does have the authority um, from the Parish Council to speak on their behalf. Um, we've obviously just had the reading out from Parish Council of Little Shelford and the question is now whether um, we continue or there is a, a break for lunch or what you're planning around that. And um, perhaps we could also just confirm, Chair, if, if you don't um, drop off for any moment going forward, are you still able to vote or not at the moment? What's your? I, I think I'm not able to vote because I've actually missed some elements. So I won't vote on this, but I mean, I'll keep soldiering on as long yeah. as I've got a connection, if that's all right. Um, yeah. We haven't quite finished the public speaking because yeah. I just need to check with Councillor Milnes as the local member, whether he would like to speak now or is reserving his comments for the debate. Thank you, Chair. I'll uh, reserve my comments uh, for later in the debate. In fact, uh, I'll leave them to the end of the de debate. Okay. If you may. That's absolutely fine. Uh, all right, then. We, that means we can move on to the debate then. Um, and do we have any speakers, please? Um, so, no, Chess, are we just going to keep going? I think everyone wants to know in terms of timing. Okay, well, um, I, I anticipated stopping for lunch about 1.30, because okay. hopefully we, we are sure. at the end of this item. Sorry, Chairman. So, uh, yep. just in, but I would think that it's quarter to one now. We've finished off the representations. I would have thought, let's break now for three quarters of an hour at maximum, maybe only half an hour, have lunch and then come back. I think it's going All to right, be... So what do you want to do, members? Just nod if you, you want to take a break. I'm happy either way. OK, yeah. then. It hey. might, it, Chairman, it might give your um, internet connection time to recover a bit. Does it work like that? Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> it, might, it might just be less busy after lunch. Now, all right. Let, let's be clear. So we, we are taking a break now. Uh, 30 minutes, let's say. So we should be back. 20, uh, 20 past one. OK, is that all?
thank you, Joe. You're now live again. Thank you. Welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Uh, we've just had the public speakers uh, for the item six in Thorston. Um, we're now moving to the debate. So, uh, would somebody like to kick off, please? Um, yeah, Chairman, yes, please. Um, I'm advised that I, I should make it known that my husband, Martin Daunton, is a commissioner for Historic England. All right, OK, thank you very much. I'm sure Mr Senior has noted that. Good. Have we got any speakers? Yes, Chair, Councillor Bradman. All right, Councillor Bradman, please. Uh, just before you start that, given the um, the erratic nature of my internet. I'm going to turn my camera off for the time being to preserve some, some juice. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, picking up from the point that uh, Councillor Roberts made, and in fact, I was going to make earlier on, but deferred to the dis debate. I'm very concerned about the water uh, add the water supply. I appreciate um, that the applicant pointed out they, they are not abstracting on the site, they're simply taking water from the public network. But we have been advised in various locations that the <clears throat> use of water um, is likely to increase in future. Um, so referring first to page 35 paragraph 41 Cambridge water has no objection and as Councillor Roberts pointed out but notes that Cambridge water's current management plan indicates it would be able to accommodate the proposed demand now however maintaining this condition is dependent on Cambridge water supplies supply side options for 2025 that's only five years from now uh, being completed as planned and meeting Cambridge Waters management commitments and the final plan for that. So the determination of whether they have got adequacy of supply, we won't know until 2023 when they publish that plan. The second thing is that um, Cambridge past, present and future have raised at paragraph 62 on page 40 and 41 their concerns about the high volume of water required by the development and the lack of clarity about the available water supply to meet the development's requirements um, and the incongruence between the proposal for a, a water intensive factory and the location in the designated water stressed area and the concerns about that for the surrounding um, well both for the um, local wildlife sites in the general sense but also then the, the um, ambient water table um, and then further we go on to um, page 53 which is natural environments concern <coughs> natural environment um, sorry i think this is the officer's report but under the heading natural environment and it paragraph 122 on page 53 uh, the ecological impact assessment highlights the increases in abstraction rates generally and changes to the water table could cause a deterioration in the habitats for which the area is designated. Um, so even if the site itself doesn't abstract directly from the water table, um, the fact that they use this process uses a lot of water in the I think I'm not quite sure and I wanted to sort of ask what is the process that uses a lot of water, but I think it's the air conditioning process. Uh, and then finally, um, the the point that uh, Councillor Hayling's picked up in the generic quantitative risk assessment, there's obviously a recognition of the risk to control waters and obviously that is trying to make sure that any use of water on the site is being very closely monitored. But I am worried about this because, sorry, and the, the, the concern is that this 
catchment is quite fragile and Councillor Fain is right the, the the river here did dry up at one point because there was no there's no there was no water in the aquifer to support the stream flowing over the top um, and if people thought I was asking a strange question about nine wells people will be familiar with the nine wells springs that are to the north of the hill um, which faces the biomedical campus site but if you remember chalk in a in a in an anticline will also have a spring line on the other side and this is the other side that's what Durnford Fen is it's the other side of the um, clay cap which allows the water to come to the surface and I'm really concerned that we we are going to be damaging the uh, the water table in this area indirectly by the abstraction of a lot of water um, so I, I sort of maybe want some clarification from the officer about the quantities of water that are likely to be used and how soon we can expect Cambridge water to be clearer about whether they can supply it or not. Is that possible? Uh, we have uh, aired this quite a bit. Don't forget what we're doing is deciding the planning application before us. The uh, water authorities have accepted their responsibilities and they have a legal obligation to actually deliver what they say they're going to deliver. So I'm not sure that this, this actually goes anywhere. We will consult with um, uh, Mr Carter, if you like, and see what his view is. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, as members will be familiar with officers often saying, when we have responses from our statutory consultees which say that um, either mitigation can be uh, provided or that they are comfortable with the impacts that would result from a scheme, in planning terms, uh, as planning officers, that is sufficient for us to make the recommendation that you have in front of you. Um, I understand the, the broader concerns that Councillor Bradenham raises, of course, um, but those are broader issues than, than, than just this site. And so we have to rely on the advice that we're given by the specialists in those areas who have statutory duties of their own uh, to meet. Uh, and that if they're saying that this can be adequately dealt with, then we should rely on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that. I think that's quite clear. Uh, more speakers? Yes, we have Councillor Fain, then Robert. And All right. More after that. Okay, Councillor Thane, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, while I do share Councillor Bradnam's concerns about water abstraction, I uh, I am satisfied by uh, what was said earlier and the explanation that's just been given to us by Mr. Carter um, that we this is no doubt an issue that we will come back to in the future when reports are presented in 23 and decisions taken in 25, but that is not a matter we can look at further today. The turning to the issues specifically identified, there has been concerns about the appearance in the landscape, particularly from CPPF in their written submission. I am satisfied that due to the design, the officers are right to say that the landscape impact will actually be less than the current buildings. Um, and specifically the assurances in relation to paragraph seven and 107 about the views from Magog Down, which is, of course, the highest point locally. Um, the question of cycleways, again, I share Councillor Milne's concerns on that, as raised by Stapleford Parish Council, but that is clearly something that there will be scope to come back to in the future. Um, what we have before us in this application does set out some east-west cycleways, some significant improvements to what is there at the moment. Similarly, the biodiversity concerns, which were set out by Little Shelford in their written submission, I think that we have to be satisfied by the, uh, the response of the statutory consultees. The fact that the 10% is more than met, well exceeded, and again, consider that as a broader issue for the land holding as a whole rather than for this site. This particular site is not in the green belt. It is in the existing employment area, the EEB, as set out in paragraph 70. And I think that at any time, 
this number of jobs on a site that has been sadly neglected for some years is a crucial consideration. At the current moment, as we seem to be entering, this may not be technically a planning consideration, but uh, as we seem to be entering possibly the deepest recession for many years, the, uh, the question of nearly 400 jobs uh, has to be taken very seriously. And ultimately, I think that the innovative design of this building, and I can't judge the technical requirements, uh, that is a matter for others, but the innovative design does respect the location as set out by officers at paragraph 78. So my inclination will be to approve this application. All right, thank you very much. And the next speaker is... Councillor Roberts. No, is it William? Oh, Councillor Roberts, yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chairman. My view remains the same, that this is premature and it shouldn't have been brought forward um, to us today. Um, I think there are far too many unanswered questions. Um, anybody who knows this area at all, this side of Cambridge uh, and our aquifer, knows what is happening at the moment. In the last something like 10 weeks, we've had one day of rain. The streams are dry. There is a stream at the bottom of the field and my house here. It is completely dry. It is completely dry. That is common to around here. And it's quite clear in this report that this is going to take abstract, huge amounts of water. Now, at South Cams, not that I'm always 100% on board with it, but we make a lot about the um, climate change, etc. And, and I think that this is, is one of the effects that we can see is happening. And we are now talking about this application um, taking huge amounts of water out of what we are already struggling with. And I think, I do not think that Cambridge Water is saying that everything is fine. They are certainly putting warning signs in there um, and indicating to us that it's not guaranteed that there is going to be a supply. Um, it's going to be um, upon lots of different um, in, in inputs here. Um, also, again, I go back to the uh, page 41 where the uh, Cambridge Quality Panel make quite clear that they are of the opinion it should have a master plan. It should have a master plan. There is an awful lot more land uh, around here. That, uh, we've been told that there are future plans here. What about the impact on um, travel? What about the impact on housing? Um, the, this area is being, like everywhere around South Camps, pushed and pushed and pushed. We have, have no real plans to accommodate this sort of growth um, that this um, business is likely to be bringing. They're not going to go to North Stow to live. They're going to be pressing and pressing around here for the beautiful valleys that we've got, the Hayden Valley, um, where there are ambitions to put 8,000 houses. That is going to be pressed and pressed and pressed. There are too many things here that are not being considered and we're not actually looking at the bigger picture. Um, and, and in my opinion, it's, it's foolish to go along in this way. The underwater diesel containment in this area with the type of aquifer that we have, I think it's the recipe for the disaster. And now again, why is this being pressed so fast with us? And I'll take on what Councillor Fain has just said about employment. We all know that this country, like the rest of the European Union, is going to be in dire situations because of the pandemic that we're just going through. Um, so, you know, it's that's going to be worldwide. It's not just going to be in this country. We're going to have to grasp the metal and do something. But I don't honestly believe that this particular application is going to make really that much difference to it because it's going to be over years to come. And by then, we may have this country and the government might have got its act into get into gear and actually be making sure that we are producing again. But I'm really unhappy about this. I, I would move a deferment because I think it's, it's premature. I don't see what the great hurry is here. Uh, and I think the hurry is because it's then we don't get all the information. It's a Trojan horse. And Trojan horses are highly dangerous beasts. And well, I don't think we can well, with it. Before we get too poetic, uh, can, are you no. actually pr proposing a deferral? I am, yes. Do you have a second of that? Would anybody uh, second the proposal for? I, I will second a deferral, Chairman. Councillor Williams, okay. Do you want to speak to that? 
I will. Um, my my reason for deferral is that I think we do have a lot of unanswered questions. That's been clear today so far. Um, my particular concern is around the cycleways issue. And we've heard the discrepancies that the parish council have had with um, with what they have had it put in front of them. We've ha heard not from the local member in the debate yet, but from the line of questioning about the issues around the cycleways. So for my and I'm, I'm looking on page 25 at the key material considerations and one of those is um, sustainable design and construction, you know, about being sustainable employment, improvements to sustainable travel network. And I think that there has been enough concerns raised around that and some of the uh, water issues, although I'm not going to pretend to be a water expert, so I'm coming at this more from the, the cycle net and sustainable travel network perspective. Um, that I, th I think it does need to be taken seriously because this is potentially a lot of jobs in this area, but we need to get it right. And therefore, I think a deferral, which would perhaps enable more of this work to be done and, and the answer of the committee given particularly around cycling um, would give that a chance and a fair chance. So I think a deferral is, is sensible so we can have the most information when determining what is a controversial application. There's, there's no getting away from that and what potentially could have a positive um, outcome if we get it right but we, or if we rush in today, we, we could get it wrong. Um, and I feel that there's too many unanswered questions and also around, you know, the master plan. I mean, that would be nice to see, but we'll see. Okay. So they're okay. my reasons, Chairman. Brian, yes. okay. Mr Carter would like to speak. OK, this is Carter, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just with regard to the proposal for a deferment, um, we'd need to be clear what it is that the committee would like officers to do during that deferment. Uh, we have an application in front of us which is supported by statutory consultees and we're talking about this application. We're not talking about things that may or may not come in the future, although we're aware obviously that the applicant is looking to produce a master plan for further phases of development on this site. So we need to be clear what it is about this application in front of us that we would like further work to be done on. Um, in terms of the cycleways and the sustainable transport network, um, I would just comment that the requirements for this application need to be proportionate to this application. As I mentioned when I spoke earlier, as and when master plan proposals come forward, there is further opportunity for us to secure additional mitigation at that point. Members will be aware of the Greater Cambridge Partnerships Greenways project, which includes cycle connectivity in this area. Uh, and there is potential uh, if further applications come forward on this site for contributions to be linked to those projects. Just on the water issues again, um, we have uh, no objection from the relevant statutory consultees in this area. So if we're deferring for more information on water issues related to this specific application, we would be going back to them asking for further comment. We need to be clear about what it is that we're not happy with in their existing commentary that they've provided. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much. Chairman, if I may, you want to provide that? Uh, what I would hope is. Yeah, Councillor. Um, what I would say is what I would hope what would happen between now and the deferred is actually like on other applications, we would have a, a briefing for the for the things that you've just mentioned in relation to the GCP and everything else. I have never that will happens to have making this decision. Chair, sure. so we've got Councillor Mills wants to speak to the deferment option motion. OK, Councillor Mills, please. Just very briefly, Chair, thank you. Um, I, I don't support this deferment. Um, I'll speak later about the issues that I raised in terms of the sustainable uh, um, traffic network, transport network. Um, but I don't believe that there's anything that we've heard so far today uh, that justifies deferment with the possibility of that we uh, get an appeal on uh, non-determination. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So, so Councillor Richard Williams to the deferment chair. 
I don't want to drag this out too long because I think we, we can deal with this very swiftly with a vote. But Councillor Richard Williams, you want to make a comment? I, I, I'll, be, I'll be very brief, um, but just to say on the transport sustainability point, which I think is an important point, I, I think the question of proportionality is relevant to this application. Um, I, I don't think it necessarily has to be the committee commenting on some future application. If we don't think this, the transport plans are sustainable in the context of this application, then, then, then I would see that as a perfectly valid ground to, um, to request further discussion. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Now I'm going to go to a vote then. I will have a roll call. <coughs> right, so the proposal is to defer uh, for the arguments that Councillor Williams and uh, Councillor Roberts have made and uh, Councillor Richard Williams as well. So if you're in favour of deferral, you vote for. If you're against, you're against. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. So can I have Councillor Bradnam, please? On, on the grounds that um, the presenting officer explained that what had been offered was proportionate and anything else was disproportionate, I will vote against deferment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dalton, please. Yes, I'll be voting against deferment. Against. Uh, Councillor Fain. Against deferment. Thank you. Councillor Halings. Against deferment. Uh, Councillor Milnes. Against. Thank you. Councillor Ripith. Against. Councillor Roberts. For. For. Councillor Heather Williams. For. For. Uh, Councillor Wright. Against. Against. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. For. For. And my vote is against. So the outcome of the deferral vote is three, four, and eight against. The deferral falls. Uh, we proceed now on to continue the uh, debate. Um, okay. Can I have a speaker, please? Yes, I have both Councillor Heather Williams and Councillor Richard Williams had requested, so I just want to clarify, do they want to, on their original points and not on the deferral? So who's next, he Heather? Ca Councillor Heather Williams, if she wants to. Uh, yeah. Do you want to, uh, you have further comments, Councillor Williams? Um, I, I think that it's a shame about about the way the deferral went. Um, my, my comments were that I was going to for the rest of the debate, particularly what the local member had to say around the uh, sustainable travel network, because that is something that is concerning me at this time. Balance, I'm still on the though. I, I, this time, I'm not sure how I will vote. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams. Richard Williams, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I just really wanted to make a few comments to um, support what I think Councillor Milne said um, previously in terms of, of, of the sustainable transport um, issue. Um, obviously, it, it's important that, that we bring employment to the air. I know that's a direct concern here, but, but I don't think anyone underestimates um, that. Um, but I think there is a lot of employment planned on this site in this phase, and there is no improvement to sustainable transport corridors that actually link to um, settlements where workers may live, or indeed um, particularly enhances um, links to travel hubs like, like Whittlesford um, Station where, where people um, may may live. So um, connectivity to Cambridge, um, I, I think again is a, is a, is a, is, is an important issue which isn't addressed here and would be um, uh, with with that cycle path up the um, the A1301. I know the Greenway is in, in, in the background to all of this, but I, I would have liked to have seen um, more specific proposals on that basis, given that um, substantial employment is planned and, and people are going to have to get there and it would be better if we had sustainable transport options in place from the start rather than at some other stage um, in the future and I would just as my final point just, just note again that this has been a concern of the local parish councils um, and I think they're quite right um, to raise that concern. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have Councillor Ripper. 
Councillor Ripeth, please. Um, just really to say, I'm finding the balance of this, you know, quite tricky at the minute, and I realise quite importantly there's. Um, roughly 400 jobs here. However, 200 of those are relocation, as has been described from Ipswich. And I know the applicant said he was hoping that the majority of those people would relocate into the um, area. Um, but we do have to bear in mind how feasible that is. And there might be quite a few car trips coming in to um, into the site because of housing costs being here are far higher and okay there's an extra 167 jobs um, available but I don't feel that the question's really been answered on how those people get to work and where they live um, but on the other hand these are key jobs and plenty of people um, going forward who might well apply for them. I'm finding it extremely difficult to balance out those two things. We have well, thank Councillor you. Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Wright, please. Thank you, Chairman. Having, having read the report uh, and listened to what's been said, it is a job to find a material planning reason for refusal on this application. Very, very hard and, you know, there's been concerns about the transport, which aren't backed up by the Highways Authority. Um, the applicant has said that it can be dealt with and the council officers said it can be dealt with in the future and, and should be. Um, and that's subject to future negotiations. So, you know, I, I feel without a material planning reason for refusal, we should move forward to a vote on this and soon, please. Thank you. Doing my best, Council. Councillor Fain. Councillor Fain, did you want to get on to water again? No, I wanted to keep up it. Good. <laughs> You're muted. I've lost you. I was correctly quoted as saying that the river cam had dried up. That was, in of course, wrong of me. It had stopped flowing at the critical point. But as of three days ago, despite the dry period, it is flowing again at the weir at Stapleford Bridge. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Milnes would want to speak at the end. Uh, I'll let you have the last word, Councillor Milnes, so I'll just make a comment before we proceed to that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this looks like an excellent use of a brownfield site. It's fully in compliance with our local plan. Um, uh, there's clear and significant benefits for the local area and wider, particularly in terms of improvements to infrastructure, uh, creation of jobs and the protection of landscape. I will certainly be voting in favour of this. So yeah, Councillor Milnes, please. Yeah, sorry, there was also Councillor Daunton and myself before you came in. Was there? Yeah, sorry. Oh, right, they've only just appeared. <laughs> okay. All right, Councillor uh, Haylings, then, please. Yes, and, and I'd just like to echo what Councillor Wright has said as well and, and I've been listening very very carefully to the you know some of the concerns that have been raised. I raised the water issue early on to look at how we could really nail down within the conditions that are there and I want to make sure that we do nail down two amendments to the conditions to bring it on and what that will ensure is that all evidence about availability of water has to come up within those two reports especially the um, generic quantitative risk assessment and knowing that as South CAMS we are already doing for the new local plan a water assessment I think those should be actually bringing that new evidence base to bear as well when that happens we should have those two bodies of information there and that's a condition in terms of planning I'd also like to note that on the travel plan on page 81 in the conditions there is a condition about the travel plan which means that that has to be read and I would like to urge the applicant working together again with the um, the planning officers 
and the local councils that that travel plan does get to the um, quality that's needed um, in terms of proportionate support in terms of sustainable transport. But I'd like to say this is established employment area. This has been waiting a long time. This is nothing being rushed through. This has been waiting for many years for this to be brought forward. It's been delayed because actually there were enough comments around this that they withdrew the application, went to pre-application, went to consultation, we had briefings and then it's come forward. There is nothing rushed about the nature of this application. And in terms of the biodiversity, this is a brownfield site and I take on board the comments by Cambridge past, present and future. Um, however, Natural England have looked at this very carefully. This is the one example where a developer has used, together with the officers, the biodiversity calculator and has been transparent about what impact the development has had and has gone to 20% biodiversity net gain off site. And we've also seen that they've done things on site too. Um, and the sustainability in terms of having a ground, the water, ground source heat pump, so that all of heating and the energy for heating will be supplied by that. Um, and going beyond the 5%, the ridiculous, pathetic 5% that's obliged and required in our plan for renewable, they're going to 20%. So these are things that I say not only is it good for the employment at the high skill end of research and development that we have said we need in this area, providing those local jobs, but it's also dealing with the sustainability aspect. Therefore, I will be um, supporting this application. Right, thank you very much. And one from last speaker then, Councillor Daunton. Thank you, Chairman. I'm sorry, yes, my keyboard was sticking and I couldn't actually type the word speak, please. Um, and in fact, actually, um, Councillor Halings has said much of what I wanted to say. I really wanted to concentrate on the travel plan. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with what um, Councillor Wright has said. I can't see any uh, material considerations upon which we can refuse this. And um, my concern over the travel, I think, is taken care of um, in the travel plan, as pointed out um, by Councillor Halings. All right, thank you very much. We have Mr Carter, Chair. Uh, he wants to speak before we vote. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Is that OK, Chair? Sorry, do you, well, well, I've got Councillor Milnes to speak. Perhaps my apologies, best. my yeah. apologies. OK, Councillor Milnes, please. Yes, I didn't know whether uh, we wanted to take um, um, Chris Carter's comments first or no? I sure. suspect that's about uh, oh. talking about the condition. All right. So um, uh, with regard to the reservations I've expressed, everybody's, uh, I think, sharing uh, to some degree or other our, our concerns over uh, the sustainable travel network. Um, we've had the comments and it's no, uh, so we've had the comments from the uh, parishes, of which I'm, I'm a member of uh, the Salston Parish Council. And we're quite, quite clear that we want alternative modes to, to be actually <laughs> disproportionately considered. That's the, 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 the mode of the day. The government is trying to encourage us to put new cycleways in. And actually, I've got a suggestion for Huawei if they want to take it away from today because they can on their own land within the curtilage of the site build a cycleway that would meet up with the existing 1301 cycleway at Durnford Farm. So um, they could do it of, of an involuntary way and provide us what we were looking for. And actually that's um, more or less where it brings me to the summary of this, which I think uh, the applicant has been particularly accommodating to our request. The original plan that came before us or, or was presented to the council was for a very mundane anodyne uh, piece of uh, building. Um, and despite the fact that the existing buildings are of a similar style to that, in fact, probably even worse, the applicant went away and came back with, as uh, Councillor Fain called it, an innovative design, which will far lessen the um, uh, impact on the landscape. Um, it's in fact really very attractive, I would suggest, for an industrial building. 
And we've got this application before us in a brownfield site, not impacting the green belt. And there is a master plan, albeit a putative one, uh, in the application documents that shows where their other buildings uh, would be built. So they've, they've done that work. And this resent, represents a really substantial inward investment for both our village, for the district, for the region, and is nationally significant. The semiconductor fabrication plant would put the uh, Brownfield site back into production. Uh, Spices was a benefactor of the village when it operated from that site. Huawei could be of a similar nature and they've certainly given indication that they want to consult and work with the local residents, with the local communities um, to, to bring them on board and that also reflects um, Councillor Cattell's um, representation to us today. So there's a huge um, improvement in architectural merit. You know, the, the gardens and landscaping with decorative trees is going to really make a substantial difference to that site. And all in all, I believe that despite reservations, um, that we should back this application. And that's how I'll vote today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much indeed. So just before we do that, we need to sort out the conditioning. Um, and Mr Carter wants to speak to us. Thank you, Chair. It was just to seek clarity on the proposed amendments to, I think it was condition six and 25 that Councillor Halings had put forward earlier. Yep. Um, just so that we're clear precisely what it is that you're looking for then, then maybe I can comment on that further if needed. Yes, I, I, I thought the um, case officer was doing some work on that. So uh, if I can help there, Mr Carter. So on condition 25, all what we're looking to do is to include Natural England explicitly that, um, you know, that, that they are working together and it's approved by that bespoke sustainability assessment methodology as per the report. OK, and if I may, just on that point, um, by all means, we can include specific reference to Natural England. We just need to be clear that ultimately uh, the local planning authority will make the decision. It won't be a decision for Natural England. Yeah. So we will, of course, take account of their comments and we can we can add some wording to that effect, uh, perhaps to be finally agreed by the chair and vice chair if, if the committee is happy with that. But it will ultimately be a decision for the council. Thank you. And then the other one, which is around the um, bespoke sustainability assessment, which was for the controlled waters. So that's where are we? Don't you mean the generic ge generic quantitative risk assessment sorry. at number sorry. six? So sorry. So number six is to include Natural England. Yeah. Number six is to include Natural England and number 25 is to have explicit mention of reuse and recycling of the water. As per the report. Yes, through you, Chair, that, that's fine. And yep. if the committee is happy, can we agree the precise wording following the meeting? Yeah, OK, well, I'll put that to the committee now. Um, uh, are you all in favour of these small changes to the conditioning? Anyone against? Uh, anyone want to abstain? Can't see anyone. Yeah, is, this vote, is, it, is this an actual vote for the scheme or not yet? No, this is a conditioning. Are you OK with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm yeah. going to vote against it. No, fine. All right. So uh, that's by affirmation then that uh, as outlined by Councillor Halings, those two conditions will be adjusted. Uh, we now come to the substantive vote. Um, I'll be just before that, I need to check my position. Um, Mr Reid, the legal officer, uh, could I just check with you um, whether I can vote or not, given that uh, I dropped out at least three times from the... Um, uh, Chair, I think I'm afraid you've already advised everyone that you would not be voting having regard to having dropped out so I'm afraid um, I think you've already made your decision and I think you need to stick to it. Right well, thank you very much for that then so I'm not voting but uh, you are so um, 
uh, can we do this by affirmation or does anybody wish to no. vote against? Councillor yeah. Roberts said she wanted to vote against, so you need to do the roll call. Thank you. OK, roll call then. So the, the proposal is or the recommendation before you is approve the full application subject to the completion of the S106 agreement and the revision to the two conditions that we've just um, dealt with. Right, so if I can go through the voting list then. So can I have your vote please, Councillor Bradnam? Four. Four. Councillor Daunton? Four. Thank you. Councillor Fain? Four. Councillor Halings. Four. Here, Councillor Milnes. Four. Uh, Councillor Ripith. Four. Here, uh, Councillor Roberts. Again, Chairman, I want my vote recorded, and I consider all, still that this is pushed through. All votes are recorded. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Four. Four. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams. With the slight reservation with the transport, four. Four. And Councillor Wright. Four. Thank you. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's nine, one in favour. It's approved. Thank you very much. Chairman, can I propose that we continue the meeting as we've gone over four hours now? Right. Uh, do you want to take a short break or ready to carry on? I, I'm, I wasn't that. It's just I know we need once we get to four hours, we have to vote to carry on. I'm happy well, apparently, to carry well, we're not four hours yet because they, you take out the rest periods. I'm oh, aware I'm, of you know, 15 minutes left then. No, it's 2.30 in fact. Then we're uh, up to that. OK, we're moving on. And the next Chair, I'd like to take a break, for, if I may. Ten minutes. Who was that, sorry? Mr. Reed. Reed. All right. So you want to take a break. Ten minutes then, back at 2.12.
OK, thank you, Chair. You're now live again. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Um, we are now on item seven, page 91 of the agenda, and we are at Linton. Uh, the application is S4418, 19 reserved matters, and the proposal is for the approval of matters reserved for access, appearance, landscaping layout and scale following outline planning permission S2553-16 OL for the erection of 42 dwellings, including the provision of 0.45 hectares for allotments. The site address is that of Wheatsheet Barn. Uh, there's a good deal of background noise at the moment. Could you turn your microphones off when you're not speaking, please? So it's land south of Wheatsheaf Barn Horseheath Road. Chair. Yeah. So. Excuse me, Vice Chair. Yes. Councillor Fain um, has sent a message. He doesn't seem to be connected yet. All right. OK. Another technical issue. So we're. Uh, uh, is Aaron dealing with that matter? Excuse me. Uh, hi, Chair. Yes, I'm just uh, con contacting Councillor Fane right now. All right. OK, we we'll suspend matters for a minute or two. As you see, I have put my camera on again at risk, but <laughs> we'll see how we get on. Uh, Councillor Fain states his laptop is coming back as we speak and he should be with us uh, any second. Good. Mm, not with us yet. Meet on a beach somewhere, Chairman. Sadly, not. Councillor Fane, are you with us yet? We're all welcome to have to go around my swimming pool if you want. Shush. <laughs> Councillor Fane, please. I think we need to press on. Okay, we're at Linton. Um, we're now the applicant is Crowd Ace House. Uh, the recommendation is delegated approval. The case officer will take us through the material considerations. Um, we haven't had a recent site visit. This is a departure. Um, okay. The office. The office. Sorry. I, I'm back on. I can hear. You're back on. Good. You haven't missed anything. I'm only doing an introduction. Uh, so the office recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of Linton Parish Council is the reason it's come to the committee and the presenting officer is Michael Sexton, principal planner. Uh, if you'd like to do your presentation. Thank Mr. you, Chair. Sexton. Uh, if you could confirm you're now seeing a presentation, please. Not yet. Yes, got yep. it. Lovely. Um, yeah, so this is a reserved uh, matters application for the approval of access, appearance, landscaping, appearance layout and scale following outline planning permission um, at land south uh, of Wheatsheaf Barn. So for context, this is the site location plan outlined in red um, and up here is just a little map showing the whole of, of Linton Village so you can see we're on the eastern edge. Um, of the village. No, Chairman, there's nothing on. There's no plans. Well, I'm seeing plans. Are there, is everybody no, else seeing yeah. plans? Yeah, I'm seeing plans. Thank you. Yeah. We're afraid it's just you, uh, Councillor Roberts. Are you seeing anything in now, Councillor Roberts? It's just come up, Chairman. Okay, fine. Chairman, it's just come up. Thank you. Okay, good. 
Do you want me to jump back to slide yeah. for Councillor Roberts' benefit, Chair? Uh, carry on. Yes, all right. Okay. Um, so for context, um, outline planning application with all matters reserved for up to 50 dwellings and allotments of not less than 0.45 hectares was allowed at appeal on the 14th of March 2018. Uh, within that outline consent, there are three conditions which are pertinent to the reserve matters application. Uh, condition five of the appeal decision stated that the development hereby permitted shall comprise no more than 42 dwellings. Condition six stated that the total area of allotments to be provided shall be not less than 0.45 hectares. And condition seven of the outline consent required a design code to be submitted with the reserve matters application, setting out the overall guiding principles for the development um, and its relationship with the countryside. Uh, just for a little bit further context, the outline consent also included a number of pre-commencement conditions. Um, just to skim through those, that includes details of allotments, a construction method statement, uh, a scheme for archaeology, surface water scheme, including the arrangements for future management, foul water drainage scheme, and again, including future arrangements for management, um, contamination of the site, a survey of all existing trees and those to be retained, restriction on when hedgerows could be removed due to breeding birds, um, further ecological surveys in the form of a badger and common reptile survey and a scheme for ecological enhancement. Um, to provide a bit of context from the area, I'm sure members would have visited the site at outline stage, but the, the site is outlined in red um, and to highlight the residential areas near to the development. Um, the areas highlighted in green um, indicate areas of two storey residential development and the areas in orange indicate areas of single storey residential development. So there's a large single storey element to the rear, uh, south of the site, uh, two storey to the west uh, and a mixture to the north. To help put that in context again, um, just a few uh, Google Street View images. This top image is taken from the A1307 looking across towards Linton. These properties that you can just about make out here are the, the roof line for Lonsdale and you have the single storey properties um, on this side here. This image just shows the development opposite the site. So you've got the two storey and single storey buildings at the Wheatsheaf Group um, and then the two storey properties on Hollybush Way. Um, these are both north of the site. To the west of the site, the top image just shows a street scene view down Lonsdale. So you can see that these are all two storey properties with single storey garages. And the image to the south um, is on Harefield Rise, um, which is to the south of the site. So we're looking up towards the site here. These are all single storey properties. So the reserve matters application that's been made is for the erection of 42 dwellings and the provision of 0.45 hectares of allotment space as required by the outline consent. The application is supported by a design code, again required by a condition on the outline consent, um, and it picks through, these are the chapters from that code that set out the design rationale and architectural language for the site and how that relates with Linton. The first main matter of the application is access. This is the plan submitted for the access, which is taken to the north of the site onto Horseheath Road. Um, the area of access is in the 60 mile an hour zone. Uh, the 30 mile an hour speed limit comes in about here, but this plan demonstrates the satisfaction of officers and to the local highways authority that the site can provide the suitable visibility displays for that stretch of road being 2.4 by 90 metres. Uh, moving on to the layout of the site, um, it's very much a few key themes um, that, that take where the layouts come from. There's a, a large central area of green space here with the leap and a lot of the development is focused around that provision of the area, uh, open space area. And then these two routes within the site, you have a, a primary route shown in purple, which is the sort of more traditional road with footpaths either side, uh, leading, leading down south into the site. This more informal secondary route, um, which has got a sort of a more rural context to it, as we'll come on to later on. And um, this is a, a image from the design code that's been submitted. Um, in terms of layout and just touching on the distribution of affordable housing, um, there are four groups of affordable houses provided within the site. You have a, a terrace of three properties here fronting onto the green space, um, two terraces um, of making up six properties in this area here, again looking across the road onto the, the area of open space. A second, a third group um, here of four properties and a a fourth group here again of four properties. So in terms of distribution around the site, we're happy as officers and as are the affordable housing teams that they're well distributed and well integrated within the site. 
Uh, looking at scale, there's a mixture of properties within the sites. Um, the light blue properties are your two storey properties, which is the prevailing um, character within the scale within the site. Uh, the, sort of excuse me, the darker blue areas are the one and a half storey elements, which is, is mainly these two um, sort of one and a half storey projections and a one and a half storey property on the southern portion of the site. Um, the grey properties are single storey properties. Um, they're very much in response to the contours of the site and the fact that you have single storey development to the south of the site. And this area here is a slightly raised element of the site, so it's to protect views out towards the countryside and into development, as we'll see on a section plan um, later on. So the layout and appearance of the site, the design code details that there's three key character areas within the site. Um, character area one, which forms the main spine road into the scheme, has been informed by the styles and features found in the centre of Linton, particularly the high streets. The central node, which is the yellow properties here, is designed to create a transition into character area two, um, which is made up of the red and the green. So two slightly different areas within character two, um, and that becomes a more intimate rural area over a bit more sort of uh, rural architectural language. Um, I'll take you through these areas fairly quickly, but the design code details how each of these areas has got its own sort of scale and, and legibility, um, how the use of materials varies through these character areas. Um, same with the architectural features. So in, in area one, you're looking at uh, sash windows, uh, brick walls, uh, render colouring and in area two, which is the sort of transition area, the key three key Vista buildings um, starts to bring in details of Flint um, into the development, which you can see in these images here, which are taken from the village of Linton, quite a common material. Chairman, can I, sorry, Michael, can I just yeah. put Chairman? Oh, uh, you you so, me. Yes. What's the matter? Um, <laughs> well, the matter is Chairman. I'm not seeing anything that's been described. All I've got in front of me is the original maps, which says context of the area. So that's my problem, Chairman. I can't see what the hell we're blowing. All right. OK. I have the same problem. This is Enid. <clears throat> yeah, okay. OK, fine. But it only really is an issue if the members of the committee ah. are there, if we don't mind. Um, Aaron, can you see if you can help Councillor Roberts, please? Of course, Chair. Chairman, uh, uh, we have five minutes whilst we try and do that. No, Chairman, the, the photographs have now turned up. Oh, right. Because I've given you a bit of a kick. <laughs> Good. Excellent. I mean, what I would say, Chair, is is uh, due to the extremely hot weather today, obviously a lot of people's internet connections are struggling. Uh, it, we could either take maybe slightly more time to go through these, but I appreciate the committee's already been running for a while. Uh, there is also an option to turn off people's incoming videos. It means you won't see the other members of the committee, but you may have an easier time uh, with your internet connection. Uh, it's, uh, and if it's all around then, Chairman. Uh, well, if you would like to turn off the incoming video, if you click the three dots on your central bar where you control your mic and video, there will be a button that says turn off incoming video. Uh, if you are struggling with your internet, uh, it, it should Sorry, help. but forgive me, Chairman, if we turn off incoming video, we won't be able to see the presentation. You'll be able to see the presentation. Uh, it's just uh, other people's videos as far as I, uh, as as far as. Yeah, because I've got it off on, on mine, you see, and I can still see the presentation. OK, all right, we've got that. We're all coming around to yours, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Chair, do we need to have me continue with the presentation, please? Chair, would you like me to continue from where I am? Or would you like me to, to yeah, bounce no, back we'll, a few slides? No, no, it's fine where you are, I think. And Chair, sorry to interject. Yes. Do we need to vote to extend the meeting? There's four minutes to go, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. I'm trying to actually get the thing moving along. Then. OK, I will aim to complete this in the next four minutes for you, Chair. OK, if you remind me, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, so Case yes. officer, press on, please. Thank you. I will move on to the next next slide. Um, again, just detailing character area three, which is the, the properties captured within this central area and the ones just, just here is indicated in red. Again, this is where the, the single story and one and a half story dwellings start to come in. Um, you've got a more informal road, so more of a rural character, drawing on some, some red brick elements, uh, cottage style windows, again, taken from the context of the village. 
and then finally the uh, second element of the third character area is this, this row on the south of the site where you have the single story prep, uh, properties predominantly going to be red brick uh, with natural slates and again cottage style style windows. Some example uh, plans um, from some of the, the properties within the site. So this is plot two, which hopefully you can see in this red circle at the top is towards the front of the site. So you have the, the main face elevation fronting the road and then this um, sort of active uh, uh, side elevation fronting the, the street scene uh, with a mixture of materials. This is an example of the affordable housing terrace that's just to the north of the open space, um, which uh, the design um, it's sort of reflected again in the design code showing how that palette of materials and uh, detailing, including these sort of little brick features that are built into a number of properties, really reflect the architectural language of, of Minton Village. Um, plot 20, which is one of the uh, sort of Vista buildings um, transitioning into the next area, is where you can see there's again two active elevations to address the street scene um, and the use of flint detailing here just to enhance the appearance of that, that particular property. Um, and then the properties on the southern portion of the site, the single storey cottages, uh, not cottages, sorry, single storey bungalows. Um, and again, brick detailing, um, drawing on the vernacular of the village. Can't see any of them. The apologies, Councillor Roberts, but Chair, do you wish me to continue? Um, Chairman, I, th uh, I think hey, it's... I can uh, just leave it with me, please, Councillor. Um, Mr. Reed, could you give us some advice? Um, the fact of not being able to see these slides, is this crucial to being able to take part? Mr. Reed, please. Yes, sorry, Chair. Um, I'm afraid my view is that um, you would risk a challenge if somebody who can't see the slides were to vote. I mean, we have had most of this in the, the documents sent to us. Um, yeah, but this is the presentation, Chairman. Um, this is what we're actually looking at, deciding. Upon today. I mean, suddenly it's come up. I've now suddenly got a street scene plan number one. But, you know, I'm not keeping up with this because Mr. Sexton quite rightly is making his presentation. Okay. And have you turned have you turned off the other bits? Oh, I'm not going to turn off anything for God's sake. I'll never get it back again. No, what the three dots business. No, no. So, so for goodness sake, be cooperative at least. Turn the thing off and it should encourage the machine to work better. Listen, you might be Mr. Technology. I am not. All you got to do is press the three dots, and up comes the, the bottom line. Turn off incoming videos. Just press no, it. No, be quiet, Chairman. Please, just leave me alone. I want to know. You know, we're Look, not seeing it. We're not seeing it. I don't think other people probably are as well. All right, then you have to withdraw on this one. Let's press on because no. we can't actually take all. That, of is that. that is absolutely appalling. You can't turn the member off and say she can't make because your technology isn't bloody well working. It's not my fault. Um, can I suggest All right, thank you very much. If the slides are circulated, then Mr. Sexton can re refer to the slides and we can independently look at them, perhaps. Uh, Mr. Carter, you've got any views on this that you can help us with? Chair, I suppose a solution could be to circulate the slides. We've been potentially new to that for all the other presentations that are still to come as well. Uh, but I can Indeed. seek to make arrangements for that to be done if you wish. Um, alternatively, I would have to defer to the advice of uh, Stephen Reid. Uh, although I do have some experience of members rejoining on telephone only. Um, so I don't know if Mr Reid would comment on that. That's no good either, is it? Chairman, may I make a suggestion or an observation? Well, if it's helpful. I'm trying to be helpful. It sounds to me as if Councillor Roberts's connection is slow and that's sensibly why you're suggesting that Councillor Roberts turns off the uh, incoming video. Yeah. I think, Deborah, it might be helpful if you did that um, because it would be a shame if you couldn't vote. So can we just, you know, the grey bar in the yeah. middle of the screen? Yep. In the middle of that, there's three dots that says yep. more actions. OK, yep. so if you click on that, 
yeah. the very last text on that bottom of that box is turn off incoming video. Okay. okay. If you, if you, so Anna, I'm going to turn off these three things and then will I still be able to hear you? you yes, yeah. you will. It's in right. that if you Isn't click that? on if you click on the three dots, yeah. last line of offerings of things to do is a little camera and it says turn off incoming video. And if you just click on that, it should improve your connection to this meeting. OK, then what, and after that, do I need to press it again to come back or something or we'll, not? We'll, we'll, we'll bring you back it. later on. OK, okay. so that well, should help. I'll do that as long as the chairman will stop being a bully. And ordering me about and telling me he's no, not. I'm trying to be helpful. You're the one that gets out of hand, for goodness sake. Now, please do what you're asked. Um, thank you. Thank you indeed. Right, so, and turn so, your microphone so, off, please. So, Deb, can I just confirm that you can now see the the the, dis, the presentation? Yeah. Good. Excellent. Plonkers. If you carry on like this, is Roberts, you will not be allowed on the committee. So please remember you're in public and the world is watching you and hearing you. Yeah, Thank the world you. Is Case you. officer, turn your microphone off now, please. And case officer, would you continue your presentation? Thank you, Chair. There's just three final slides before you essentially vote on continuing the committee. Um, these are the, the street scene plans. This, this top plan is just to show looking into the site with the main entrance here. So we're looking south into the site. Street scene B is taken along the main spine road so you can see how the site does slope down to the south. Um, and then street scene C is just looking from the public open space and attenuation pond area on the west of the site um, over to the east. And you can see the, the use of different materials here um, and architectural detailing. Um, street scene two, the, the top one is um, street scene D, which is taken along this uh, top of the, the secondary route. And you can see how with the site rising up, the developer has responded to that um, by placing those uh, four single story properties here so they're not overly unduly prominent within the uh, sort of wider setting. Um, similarly, uh, street scene E, which is the, the bottom of the site, we're looking at the single story properties here. Again, in somewhat in response to the contours of the site and streets in F you've seen is the affordable units um, before. The final sort of main reserve matter is, is the landscaping. Um, this obviously is an edge of village site um, on the northern boundary of the site on the entrance. Um, properties are set back and there's some additional planting going in to have this green frontage to the site on the main public highway. You then have a what is effectively a six metre buffer um, of 90% of this area is a six metre buffer with quite a lot of tree planting to really screen the site and integrate it with its surroundings. Um, that planting is more intense where the residential development is um, slightly more informal where you have the open space and obviously you have the allotments forming the other part of the eastern boundary of the site onto the open countryside. There's then areas of planting within the site, uh, the western boundary, there's an area of public open space, some additional planting and a, and a suds feature. Um, and sort of green corridors stemming down the primary route into the site all the way down to the south. And again, the design code sets out some key objectives for landscaping, which are just there on the right hand side. So the key material considerations um, is compliance with the outline planning permission, housing provision, including affordable housing, open space provision, uh, the reserve matters of access, layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, biodiversity, flood risk and drainage, Highway safety, management of roads and parking, residential immunity and heritage assets. That is the end of the presentation, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, just before we go to points of clarification, um, our four hours are now up. Um, so can I take it that uh, members are happy that we continue this meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Anyone against? Agreed. Right, no one against. Good, that's done by affirmation then. So we're open to points of clarification. Um, if I could start with one, um, Michael, uh, the strip, the landscape strip three metres on the southern part, mm. um, I just, I couldn't see where the, there's any conditioning about uh, maintaining the, that strip and maintaining the public areas. Um, does that actually 
uh, where, could you point me in the, in the direction of the conditioning for that, please? Um, I, and Stephen Reid, I'm sure, will step in. I think that that particular detail will be secured within the Section 106 agreement of the outline um, for future maintenance of, of areas of open space rather than by planning condition. Right, I couldn't see it in the outline. But it's not in the outline because it'll be in, within the outline Section 106 agreement. Right, OK. Um, and we're happy that we're sure that it is actually there then. I believe so, yes, Chair. Okay. It's sort of a fairly standard part of, of an outline consent. Um, OK, uh, points of clarification then, please. Councillor Milnes and Councillor Bradnam. Right, Councillor um, um, Thank you. Yes, am I um, on the right one where there was some boundary uh, and land ownership issue? And, and if I'm on the right application, I'm not on the right. I am on the right application, aren't I? Yes. Um, you um, are, yes, Councillor. Yes. Sorry, Michael, would, would you just point out on the, on the slide which boundary that refers to, please? Uh, so it's the western boundary. There's, there should be an appendix two with the committee report, which actually has that. Um, oh, okay, but it's the, western, it's the whole of the western boundary? Yes, the, the okay, parts, thank you. Um, That's fine. Lonsdale. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clarification from the officer. Um, following the concerns raised by residents about the proximity of the um, foul sewage pump and the suds infiltration pond, could the officer explain where that infiltration pump is likely to be moved to? Sorry, the, not the infiltration pump, the foul sewage pump. Where is that likely to be moved to? So certainly, Councillor. Um, I think it's always likely to remain in that southwestern corner. This is a point that was raised by our sustainable drainage engineers quite late in the day. Um, so it is a condition on the reserve matters consent, um, condition D, uh, requiring details of the foul pump, including its location and design and means of enclosure um, to obviously protect residents from, from noise. Because there are details reserved by condition at the outline consent, relating to foul water and surface water drainage. The full extent of the suds feature is not known. It may be smaller than is shown on the plan, depending on what is required. That would in some way influence where the foul pump is positioned finally, but it will be in that southwestern corner. The details are conditioned um, to make sure there is sufficient protection for residents against noise. And obviously we'll look at the design in terms of its visual impact, but it will be in that southwestern corner, yes. but perhaps not Sorry. the exact location that's shown. But the point I wanted to make was given the uncertainty that you've pointed out and was in the report about it's not known what the eventual size of the um, suds would need to be. It's possible, is it not, that the suds might need to be considerably larger than they are at the moment. And therefore, I'm just wondering, is there a risk that there wouldn't be enough room for the foul pump, given that it has to be 15 metres from any infiltration pond? I don't believe so, Council. Although reserved by condition, there was a drainage strategy that was submitted with the application that does very much inform a lot of the surface water drainage details. So I think the the way the suds feature has been illustrated is is fairly accurate because it is backed up by that document. Um, however, that those details are reserved by condition and they haven't been signed off yet. So I anticipate if there is any variation to that suds feature, it will be very relatively minor. Um, so locating the foul pump in that area within the set distance required from residential properties um, and drainage features uh, is highly likely to be acceptable. OK, right. thank you very much. I don't think we've got any more items of clarification. So we can go on to public speakers then, please. Uh, is Councillor Bald with us, please? Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 Yeah, I can hear you. Good stuff. I have got permission from the parish council to speak. All right. Put your camera on so we can see you. It's on. We can see you. It's on. Ian, we can we can yeah. see you. <laughs> Thank you. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. When you're ready, three minutes. Do I need to press another three buttons? Just wait a bit, Debs, and she'll probably come up. I couldn't make a comment there. <laughs> Deb, <laughs> you've turned off incoming videos, so all incoming videos you won't be able to see unless you turn it back on. I, I told you it wouldn't be. Oh, me. Yeah. What do I do so, now? 
so Deborah, all you need to do, if forgive me, Chairman, through you, is go back to those three dots. Yeah. You can just listen to it. It doesn't matter necessarily. Just and listen. then turn yeah. on incoming video. Sorry, press the three buttons. Yeah. And then turn on incoming video. Thank you very much, Anna. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you. Can we get on then, please? All right, should I start? Yes, please. Right, we really appreciate that this developer has engaged with us and the residents and that plans have been amended to address some concerns, including the designs. The effect on the landscape is significant, requiring protective screening planting and to set the houses into the rural village edge. The retention of these hedges, trees and planting and the planting of sufficient and suitable screening is vital, especially along the roadside where we do not want it to degenerate into an urban style. This should be secured by conditioning and the importance of maintaining the hedges and trees in gardens must be made clear to occupants and be part of their deeds. The surface water drainage scheme is inadequate as we've explained in our comments and it's too important to be left to conditioning. The contours outside the site send water into the site and the scheme does not deal with the water flooding onto the site. The Suds Pond is already in a damp area and overflow will flood down Martins Lane through to Bartlow Road. This is not a water course but is a proposed connectivity path. The sewage pump is too close to the housing and it brings a lot of noise, but the major concern is the possible pollution of the aquifer, which is just below. In fact, this pump might be within the aquifer. These issues have been raised by the sustainable drainage engineer and that they do not support the scheme. This is a known archaeologically important site and the development should have reflected its historic landscape. We expect findings to be remembered and significant structures to be retained. There is still no archaeological report nor any heritage report. The sustainability of the site has not been considered with too few school places and insufficient services. This was not given sufficient weighted outline nor in the Section 106 agreement. We agree with the conditioning and require proper consultation prior to discharge of these. We have also raised errors in the officer report, particularly regarding ownership. Linton Parish Council drew attention to the ownership issue, but we do know that that is a civil matter. What the Parish Council disputes is whether it was lawful for South Cams to make a planning decision on land which they themselves partly owned and which they knew about when Certificate B was signed in November 2017, but which was not made clear to us until September last year. Um, we would ask for further conditionings, such as the path should not develop behind Harefield Rise, and that cars, cycles and bins should be kept within properties, and the trees and hedges to be retained after occupation. Particularly, we require that connection should not be made to send more sewage or flood water into the pipeline on Bartlow Road. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification there, please? No, we're all happy. So, Councillor Ball, thank you very much. Chairman, I have tried. Sorry, I can't type. The chair, yes. I can't type either. Chair, hang on, can we just... Um, can Is I that just because the, the things turned off for the three chair? dots? No, 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 Chair. Can I just try if people, if members, do, does the hand, raising the hand work on the on the, the bar in the middle? It does. Shall we use that as a way instead of putting speak in the chat? It right. means that I won't be able to get the order necessarily right, but at least catch everyone because it seems that maybe with the hot weather that the chat is sticking i think it's caught up a bit pippa sorry I chair can i just yeah. make a comment as well um to aaron who's speaking the, 
the hands up will actually order for you. So if you go into the participant list, it does actually order in terms of who put their hand up first. So the, those who did it earliest will be at the top. Uh, although I do understand that you'll see yourself top if you do put your hand up, uh, Vice Chair. That's how I like to see things anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, but please do remember members to put your hands back down after after you finish speaking. Thank you. All right, we all got that. So, yeah. so I've got. Yes, so um, Councillor Heather Williams isn't at the top, but I'll put her at the top. Was was that for clarification? Councillor Williams. Yes, Chairman, and I think I've put my hand down right. Um, I would just like to take um, some, gather some clarification around because there was a series of conditions that were sort of being requested uh, by the Parish Council. So I just want to make sure I hadn't missed anything um, in what was said. So the conditioning read the trees to the entrance, the path and the bins, cars and bicycles to be kept within. So that I take it you mean sort of sufficient parking and no sewage into is it Bartlow Road. If I, if I missed any conditions and. Yeah, that's my clarification. Are you still with us, Councillor Board? Yes, I'm here. Can I speak? Yeah, please do. Um, the conditions were um, really the hedges and trees all along Bart, um, Horse Heath Road, because this currently has a big mature hedge, which effectively screens a lot of development and also Lonsdale. And we would like to retain the natural hedging. We don't want it, the hedge to be chopped down and turned into Berberus and that sort of thing, an urban hedge. We'd like it to be retained as a rural hedge and we'd like sufficient screening around the whole site. Um, right. right, I think that's enough on, on the okay. screen. We would like um, it to remain nice and thick, please. Okay, Councillor Williams, are you happy here? Uh, yeah, it was the part, there was something mentioned about a path. Sorry, because it because it was a bit intermittent for me. I got certain, <laughs> not all of them, my apologies. Right, um, where the suds is at the southwest corner, if that is going to overflow, it would overflow down um, the little lane which leads towards Bartlow Road. Um, this is not a water course, it is actually an area which has been proposed as a connectivity route. So our problem is over potential overflow of the suds system. Okay. Which would, yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. Is there Council any other further points? Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes. Hello, Enid. I, I yeah. just wanted to ask. Um, that was really, I wanted to clarify that point that if the Suds Pond was put where as proposed, um, I we know from long uh, many looking at looking at the previous application that this is the location of um, flooding from surface water, which has previously come over the field that this is <laughs> proposed for, and my understanding is that water from that not only floods down into the pathway that you described between Martins Lane and the next road to the west, um, but also into the houses at the bottom of Lonsdale. Is that correct? That is correct. It also would flow into a house which is actually on Martins Lane. Yes, Beggar's Roost. Beggar's Roost and, and there is a couple down there. And to under and uh, f for other members who may not have visited the site, I'm aware that that is literally a sheer drop from the bottom of the field, about um, a couple of a meter and a half or two meters down into their garden, and the house is very close to that that sheer drop. Yes, indeed, um, and the drop <clears throat> onto Harefield Rise. <coughs> There seems to have been nothing done to take account of water which floods onto the site from the higher ground over Horse Heath Road and yes. down through the contours to that corner. Yes. OK. Chair, Thank, you. Um, Thank you very much. Is there uh, anyone else? Mr Sexton, <coughs> can you show a map um, to clarify the, the, the issue around the path? Yeah. Mr Sexton, please. Thank you, Chair. 
um, if it helps members, um, if you could confirm that you can see a plan on your screen. No. Agreed. I can. So I believe the reference to the footpath, um, Martin's Lane is just off this plan to the south. Um, obviously, policy HG1 of the local plan talks about achieving <coughs> permeability through a site. Um, at this stage, there is no formal provision for a link through to Martin's Lane um, because it crosses third party land. Um, but the developer has put a footpath in here which winds around the sud feature that has the potential to link through if that was desirable in the future. And that's, that, that's just in line with the policy of seeking permeability through the site. But there is no connection at this stage because it's not within the ownership of the full extent of the ownership of the developer to do that. So no footpath is proposed. There is just the potential should that desire come forward in the future. Right, thank you very much. And um, could you comment on the landscape issue as well on the hedge on on Hawkeath Road? Yes, so elements of the hedge uh, or a lot of the hedge is removed to achieve the visibility splays. Um, that was fairly well established when the outline consent was granted because the access was always going to have to be taken onto um, Horseheath Road. So to achieve the visibility space, um, most of the hedgerow is to be removed. As you can see from this plan, they are the developer has been keen to keep um, a soft green frontage to the site. There are elements of a, a small hedgerow to the front, um, some good tree planting to the front of the site, properties set back with these green open spaces. So while I appreciate um, some of the existing hedgerow is being removed. There's quite a lot of planting going back in to make sure that there is still a soft entrance to the site rather than a harsh boundary from Horseheath Road. And this plan is listed as an approved plan, as are other landscape plans. So the approved conditions um, would secure a lot of the landscaping details. OK, thank you very much for that. Could I comment upon that at all? Uh, no, you have to be asked a question. Uh, all right. yeah, so, so any uh, other points of clarification we got? Um, Chair, can I ask Councillor Bradnam to lower her hand? Yeah, lower your hand please, Councillor Brad. Councillor Milnes would like to ask a question. Right, Councillor Milnes please. Yes, thank you. It's just about this this issue and just to clarify that the uh, request from the uh, Parish Council is to not um, replace the hedge, but um, the question I guess is if it needs to be um, uh, removed um, for visibility display. Uh, is it possible to actually move it rather than remove it? I don't know. So it's, there's a, a question for the officer, perhaps. Yes. Can you comment on that then, uh, Mr. Sexton? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I believe that unfortunately the majority of the hedge does need to come out for to achieve displays, even if you were to remove the the access point slightly a few meters one way or the other to achieve the required visibility space given I'm, that the I'm talking about moving the hedge, the hedge. It. Uh, well there are within that plan that I had up a moment ago there are elements of a hedge um put back in um, which is a native hedge I don't believe it's the existing one being retained I think it does need to to come out so um it's not clear how to provide too much more clarification on that Right. OK. Uh, do we have any more? No, Chair. Well, I think I see a hand for Councillor oh, Williams. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Williams. Heather Williams. Yeah, you mute some. It's working now. Yay. Yeah, go on. Um, so so given the importance of, of the hedge of how things are, um, can I ask a, a clarification of the parish uh, councillor, um, Councillor Bald, as to what it was she wanted to say when the display was shown? Thank you. <laughs> OK, Councillor Bald. Hello. Yes, a very large rural hedge is being replaced by a very urban, small, puny hedge with lollipop trees which doesn't strike me as being a fair replacement. I would also, regarding that map, um, the Parish Council did send in a map giving a showing how water comes onto the site and flows down. I wonder, did you receive that? 
Yes, it's, it's in the agenda papers today. Right, thank you. It was just to be clear about the extent of wetness. And Stephen Reid, the legal support. OK. Mr Stephen Reid, please. Uh, Chair, it's the question whether you want me to address at this stage uh, matters raised by the Parish Council as to ownership. Um, if everyone's finished with their questions, which I think they probably have. Sorry, yes, Chair, just before please. Stephen Reid addresses that issue, um, Councillor Rippeth uh, wasn't able to see the plans that Michael Sexton popped up on the screen just recently. Can Stephen Reid advise as to whether or not she can vote on this item or if she needs to withdraw? Are you happy or advice, please? Um, I, I think it's open for Michael to um, produce that slide again so that the member can see it and in those circumstances I think yeah. I wouldn't be opposed to um, uh, her voting pro um, provided she satisfies she's got the relevant information on which to do so. All right let's try and do that then shall, can we? Just a second. Yeah, yeah happy to, to share the landscape plan again. So if you could confirm, I suppose Councillor Ripper, that you could confirm that you're able to see this landscape plan now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you see it? Uh, no, I can't, I can't see anything. I've been, I can hear, I have been able to hear what's been said, but any message I send um, hasn't gone through and I still can't see it. Right. So shall I withdraw for the item? Oh, no, it's here. It's suddenly arrived. OK. I'm happy just to recap on the points yeah, we covered on that plan, would. if that, that's helpful. Sorry. So in respect yeah, just really okay. quickly. Thank so you. In, res in respect of the footpath link that was mentioned onto Martin's, Martin's Lane or Martin's Close, um, that's in the southwest corner of the site. The developer is not proposing a formal link through to that area because it would cross third party land. Um, there is simply this footpath here, which is in to go around the South feature and has the potential to link through should that be required at a later date or desired locally. Um, again, that's all about permeability of the site in line with local policy. And then I will move up. Can you now see the top half of the plan? Yeah. Um, so the hedgerow that we were talking about, there is an existing hedgerow along the front of the site, which does need to come out to achieve the visibility space. There is a, a small native hedgerow going in along the front of the site on both sides um, and some uh, well established tree planting to maintain a soft green frontage to the site rather than a harsh boundary and with you know with the residential property set back. I'm just Thank in a planning committee at the moment. Can you call me back? Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Could you put your microphone off wherever that was? Okay, uh Councillor Ripeth, you've seen all that? Yes, thank Good. you. All right, so I think you're all right on that one. Uh, okay. Stephen Reid, do you want to address us on the question of ownerships? Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, so um, an application for reserved matters is not an application for planning permission to which Article 7 of the 1995 order relates. Um, the importance of that point is that it is not necessary for an ownership certificate to accompany an application for reserved matters. Uh, I raise this because there's um, uh, no requirement, therefore, on the applicant in this case to have given an ownership in relation to uh, what's before you. And the time has long passed in relation to issuing any judicial review proceedings as to whether a wrong certificate was given on the outline application. And therefore, there is not, in my view, a legal ownership issue as to legal ownership in the context of determination of this reserve matters application. Uh, the ultimate decision whether to grant outline planning permission was taken on appeal and had Linton Parish Council wished, they could have sought to challenge the appeal decision on the basis of what they alleged was an incorrect certificate given on the outline application, but they did not do so. There, 
there are numerous examples of where the district council makes a planning decision as to land which they themselves own in full or in part and provided that the correct certificate was given it's not the case that it's not lawful for the district council to make a decision where that is the case so members you'll see many applications come before committee where uh, members are advised that the district council own all or part of the land which is the subject of the application and uh, you have made a decision notwithstanding that that is the case you are not precluded from making a decision simply because the district council is not only the local planning authority but is also the owner in whole or part of the site i'm happy to invite questions Okay, thanks very much for that. I hope we don't need any too many questions because that seemed perfectly straightforward. Am I allowed to ask a question? I'm afraid not. No. <laughs> so, Stephen, uh, can you put your hand down and turn your mic off as well? All right. There's no no further uh, clarifications. Yes, there is. Uh, who is it? That's Councillor Bradnam. You didn't put your hand up then. No, I put speak in chat. I thought that's what we were still using. No, we're now doing the hands up, Anna. All right. I did try to do it. The All right, but you have had a couple of goes at this. I mean, is this essential? Yes. Um, um, I just wanted to point out that, as I understood it, the uh, applicant has agreed not to include that, let's call it, ransom strip on the west side of the site within the curtilage of the properties that are part of the development that, that is true yeah so so i just wanted to clarify with mr reed that in view of that is that considered to be too informal or is that something that we can as it were hold them to given that it's written in the report uh, mr reed do you have a view on that um So you're saying that the developer has said that they won't include the ransom strip within any part of the plot of individual plots. And Mr. Sexton yes. can show their plan. Correct. They yeah. in the report. That's what they've said, that they won't include that strip in an, in the curtilage of any of the properties they're developing. Thank you. Answer. I will just bring up an, uh, a boundary treatment or enclosures plan. Um, I will. Give it a moment to make sure everyone can see it. Anyone not see it? Shout of you. OK, so the, the strip in question as shown on Appendix 2 is down the, the western portion of the site, a very narrow strip. When the application was originally submitted, um, these fence lines were on the left hand side of the hedge and did enclose that. But um, appreciating what Mr. Reeves obviously said in terms of legalities, we did speak with our surveying officers um, to confirm their their view on this development moving forwards and the developer has relocated the fences to the eastern side of that hedge so the development which will become residential curtilages is does not include any of the land that is within the ownership of the council and that has been done to the satisfaction of our surveying officer who raises no objection to it so this this plan is listed as an approved document and that will secure these treatments on the eastern side of the, okay. the hedgerow good Right, Mr. thank you very much. Thank there. you very much. OK, if we can move on then to uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Board, Councillor Board. <laughs> I would love to say some things. No, now. Okay. <laughs> yes. I can't uh, allow you, I'm afraid. Yeah. We have to move on. Is uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor with us? Councillor Batchelor, are you with us? I had it down to speak as a local member. Um, Can I have Stephen uh, Reid to mute and show his hand? Uh, Chair, uh, Councillor Batchelor did uh, send over his statement to me earlier on in case he couldn't connect, so I can read that out for the committee. Uh, if is yep, please, helpful. if you would, that'd be great. Of course. Um, so it states, uh, while the approved outline application was vociferously opposed by many, including myself, there is now an acceptance that there will be houses built in this site. 
The developer, Crudis Homes, has bucked the trend and has been extremely forthcoming and willing to engage locally. And yes. not only that, but credits needs to be given to them here. Uh, large credit should be given to Linton Parish Council, who have successfully negotiated with Crudis Homes. And the scheme coming before you today does look very different from the initial proposal, which was tabled last year. This is down to the Parish Council very ably working with the developer to come up with an acceptable scheme for all. I do have concern about uh, drainage and would ask that if it isn't already a condition of building B, that a suitable drainage scheme is drawn up and agreed before construction can commence. However, I don't see this as a strong enough reason to refuse the application, so I believe that the officer recommendation should be followed and approval granted. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm the other local member for Linton, but I reserve my comments until the debate. Right, I think we can now actually move on to that then. Um, so who would like to speak to this item? You're going to put a hand up? Yep. Councillor Heather Williams. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to possibly take some officers advice up following the representations that have been made to us around these conditions that were were being asked about, um, particularly with the hedge, because I think there, while we can condition, if I recall from other applications, that only what is necessary for the visibility displays is removed. Anything that's not a requirement for the visibility display could be maintained. Um, and whether that's something that is possible to condition as being requested, as I am minded, as, as the local member has, has said, that you know the the issues that have been raised aren't don't quite warrant a, a refusal. But I think that would be. Um, uh, they're not asking for a lot by wanting to have that as much that maintained as possible. So whether that is possible, um, I think on the other other requests, the officers will have noted down if there's anything we can do. But um, I'm assuming that there's adequate bin storage and, and things like that within the site. But if they could have clarification, that would help me in my determining the application. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I've got a note of that. We'll come back to that then. Uh, Councillor Thane. Councillor Thane, please. Chair, yes, the uh, principle of development on this site is not, of course, in question. Uh, we have here a developer who, as uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor said, have engaged with the Parish Council and indeed Councillor Bold said that as well. Um, in passing, I think those of us who've come across this developer would, would expect nothing less. Um, this proposal does respect the local vernacular. We've heard of the efforts on window design, on flint, the variation of heights of the building. Um, there was a small question raised in relation to emerging within a 60 MPH zone. Uh, I think that one could be easily resolved at a later stage um, with County Council agreement. Uh, when we look at the concerns about flooding and the suds, uh, none of the statutory consultees have raised an objection to that. And there are various conditions set out, which it seems to me would deal with those issues. Um, as to the question of design, our urban design officers have said this is a high quality scheme, which would actually make a positive contribution to the context. When we have an application like this, where a developer has taken great trouble, as all parties have agreed to engage with the local community to make amendments where necessary. It is very important that we respect that, uh, not least, although that's not a matter of this application, because developers will not otherwise seek to engage in the way that uh, Crowdace have done in this case. And I think the time has come to take the recommendation of our officers and approve. Right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Roberts. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chairman. I'll try and keep it quick. Um, I agree with the two previous speakers. I think that um, an awful lot of effort on all sides of 
has come into play here and it's to be well commended. Um, I'm always impressed by Linton Parish Council how much effort they make and the detail they give us. Um, however, I, I go along with uh, Councillor Williams, Heather, um, that I think that we do need to improve on what is being put forward for the frontage, for the uh, hedge. If it's a, a very substantial hedge now, it's obviously an important character. And I think to just um, destroy it all and put something very small and intellectual there would be wrong. So um, I'm going to have to go along with it, but I want that um, fleshed out and strengthened. I think that that hedge should be kept uh, and um, only taken down where it's for the visibility displays. But I don't, I'm not happy with a very tinky tiny thing. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask everyone to put their hands down? Um, and I've, that's everybody on my list. Councillor Bradham did have her hand up, but I think she's put it down again. Right, OK. And that's me then. So um, I'll just say a few words. Uh, it's essentially the same as uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor. I mean, we've been extremely impressed with um, the way that the Parish Council has successfully worked with um, the, this developer. Uh, and really, we're we're down to the matters of, of detail. My own concern is still about the southern boundary. Um, those of us who visited the site will remember that um, the existing houses are at a much lower level than the field. It's, one, it's between one and two metres actually lower. Um, so I'm a bit of a concern. They've done what they can by putting in a three metre uh, landscape strip um, to give us some protection to, to that. But uh, equally, there, there's a fence that uh, will be the, at the end of the gardens um, that would be uh, two and a half metres high with a trellis. So um, that might well be, still be overpowering. Um, I'm confident that uh, I don't think we need to actually, it's already conditioned in, in the landscaping, so I, um, I'm hopeful that uh, the, as with the hedge, I think the developer will have heard these things and uh, is likely actually to be cooperative. So I think we, we just need to be keep on talking. Um, yeah, this is a five year land supply site. None of us wanted it in the first place uh, and we did our best not to get it, but it's here uh, and it's much better now than it was initially. So um, I don't feel I've got any option but to support it. Thank you. Right, so is that everybody spoken then? Uh, uh, is Mr Reed to asking to speak again? Yeah, and Deb, Councillor Roberts, can you Lower your hand if you can. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Reid, did you want to speak? No? Um, Chair, yeah. thank you, if I may. Um, can we ask Michael Sexton to put up the the last slide he showed, but showing the extent of the plots on the southern boundary? Uh, um, Sorry, Stephen, did you want a slide or that I can have a plan up that I can zoom it's, in? It's, it's the same plan you showed showing the western boundary and pulling the curtilage okay. in for yes. the plots, but I want to see it in the context of the southern boundary. I've looked at the 106 agreement on the outline uh, whilst we've been on this item, and in order for the southern boundary to be governed by the um, section 106 agreement, the plots must stop short of that three metre buffer. So can you confirm that's the case? Uh, yes, so hopefully everyone can see the enclosures plan again. Um, this purple line denotes the, the boundary for the curtilage and there is a three metre strip. The red line boundary for the site follows this black line here, uh, there is a three metre width retained there and that is in response to the fact that these properties are set back, uh, set uh, at lower ground level, so that has been fully considered um, as part of the application. There is a, yeah, there is a three metre landscape strip. 
uh, uh, and chair so i can confirm that that three meter strip is the subject of the 106 agreement in relation to the maintenance of landscaping within that area okay thank you very much that's uh, good okay thank you for thank that you. i think I we've think we've completed the debate was somebody trying to speak or move the recommendation chairman okay I did say that he could help on the condition if, if there's any clarification around the conditions there. Because potentially we could condition that was the point. So, yeah, I'm happy to speak to the points um, and please add if I didn't jot them all down, Councillor Williams. Uh, you talked about the retention of the hedgerow um, on the northern boundary. Uh, condition 14 of the outline consent does restrict um, any clearance works until the survey has been undertaken of all existing trees and hedges within the site. Um, and I, that needs to identify any trees and hedges that are to be retained. So I expect that that outline condition could capture that element on the hedgerow on the front of the site. Um, so that's already in place. Um, in terms of cycles, stores, bin stores and car parking, there, there's ample provision um, within the curtilages of each property. Um, you may have noted on the, uh, the plan showing the roads, there's no designated off-road parking spaces. Everything will be confined within private driveways or garages. Um, I think they were your two key points. Um, please let me know if I've missed anything. Right, that thank was you. it, thank you Chair. I just wanted reassurance that we could, we have some lever to um, retain as much hedgerow as possible as the parish yeah. wished. Yep, um, well. Chair, we have Councillor Bradenham, I think on the conditions. Right, thank you Councillor Bradenham. Thank you. Um, my understanding was that uh, the the front hedgerow, lovely and luxurious and ancient as it is, unfortunately was obstructing the visibility splay. And I, I understood that was why it had to be removed. Yes, yes indeed, that's what we've been told. And uh, so, so, so we've also so just will, been... So will oh. the wording capture, uh, as has been said, to retain as much of it as possible, but maintaining the visibility splay? The officer has just told us that they will do that just that. Yes. I think perhaps, Jeff, yeah. maybe helping Chris, please um, step in if I'm incorrect. We could perhaps add an informative um, to that effect to draw it to the attention of the developer, because obviously it is a condition that details the whole site. If it's a particular point of concern for members, I don't think we can do it as a condition because of the visibility space issue, but I see no reason why we couldn't just add a, a one line informative, uh, agree the wording with chair and vice chair about. Um, looking at retaining as, as much of that front hedge as is possible, okay. if it is practical. practical I'm happy to, to propose that, Chairman. OK, that's fine. Are we all in favour? Yes. 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 Well, okay. I'll no second that against. if necessary. Right, fine. OK, mm -hmm. so that informative then, please, Mr Sexton, should be added. So can we go to a vote now then? Um, so the proposed the recommendation is delegated approval. Um, can I take this by affirmation? Are we all in yeah. favour? Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. No one's no one against. No. No abstentions. No. All right. Thank you very much. That's uh, approved them. Thank you very much. Uh, do you need a short break? Five minutes to grab a drink, please, Chairman. All right, let's. Uh, we can have ten minutes. It's three twenty now. We're back at three thirty. Um, Anna, can you lower your hand? Thanks. Okay. And Aaron, can you? Thank you. Let us know when we're off.
Uh, you're now live again, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. Uh, we are now on agenda item eight on your agendas. That's page 165 and we're at Duxford. So this is application S28961910 FL. The proposal is for construction of a 168 bedroom hotel with ancillary facilities, associated access, gates, car parking, including reconfigured conference center car parking, cycle parking and landscaping. So the site is at the Imperial War Museum, Royston Road, Duxford. The applicant is Propertia Hotels, Duxford Limited. The officer recommendation is delegated approval subject to a section 106 agreement. Uh, the uh, presenting officer will outline the key material considerations. Uh, this is a departure application and the application is coming to us as it has been referred to committee on the basis of the officer's current assessment of the sensitivity and significance of the proposal and it is of local interest and a departure. The presenting officer is Karen Pell Coggins, Senior Planning Officer. Uh, Karen, if you'd like to do your presentation, please. Thank you. OK, thank you, Chair. First, before the presentation, I have a small update to paragraph 80 of the report in relation to heritage assets. The decision needs to be made in relation to the following legislation. Section 72 of the Town and Country Planning, Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 states that special attention shall be paid to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the special character and appearance of the conservation area. Furthermore, Section 66 of the Town and Country Planning Act, uh, list, sorry, Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 states that special regard shall be had to the desirability of preserving listed buildings, all their settings or any features of special architectural or historic interest. Officers consider that the development would preserve the character and appearance of the conservation area and the setting of listed buildings on the site. Thank you. I'll just get my presentation on the screen now. Can you see a slide? Not yet. Nothing in sight. No, OK, bear with me. Oh. Ah. Can you see a slide now? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Let me Thank just check that every, everybody can. Has everybody got this on the screen? So no one's saying no. Good. OK, off you go then. OK, thank you. Thus, the Imperial War Museum is a major tourist and visitor attraction, an educational and commercial facility based on the Duxford Airfield. It's considered the finest and best preserved preserved example of a fighter base of the period up to 1945 in Britain. It's located adjacent to junction 10 of the M11. I will point to the various areas on the map. So the M11 runs along the eastern boundary of the site and to the north and south of the A505. So the A505 runs in between two parts of the site to the north and south. <coughs> It's located outside of any development framework and within the countryside. It is a special policy area. <coughs> Excuse me. The site is in the conservation area and within the setting of three grade two star listed World War One hangars. So I'm just pointing to those on the screen. And a grade Sorry, two. Sorry, Chair, can I just interrupt? My apologies. Tower. Sure. Uh, Councillor Rippeth is having uh, some issues viewing the slides again. Uh, <laughs> how do you wish to deal with this? Uh, well, is it correcting itself? Or is it just slow? Uh, it doesn't ap appear to have corrected itself yet. No. Um, 
While we're waiting, could we ask, I think it might be... No, no, hang on, please. Let, let's deal with one thing at a time, please, Councillor. Let's... Uh... So, so okay. well, Councillor Ripper, you still got sound. Have you still got sound, Councillor Ripper? No. No. Um, I, no, so I again, you can't hear me. Everything, which is fine. I just. Sorry, yeah. Um, okay, so the, there is an ability to hear, but obviously just not an ability to see. So it's essentially like being dialed into the meeting for Councillor Ripith right now. Um, right. We have had copies of the, the certainly the site map. I, uh, Karen, are you likely to be using things that we haven't seen previously? Hello. Um, there is some visuals that we haven't seen previously that weren't in the plans part, but they are from the landscape and visual impact assessment, which is a public document, which is online. Right. All right. Um, Chairman. Councillor Ripith. No. Is the Bradman, yeah. It's Councillor Bradman. I just wanted to mm. ask the presenting officer if she would, um, okay. Thank you. or if whoever is bc would lower the the box that's giving a timing on it. it there's a on our screen we can see a planning committee so that's on karen's screen just because yeah, she's presenting can right karen now Karen just lower that that's it right, thank that's you it's just it was yeah. obscuring part of the screen thank you no, okay all right uh councillor ripith what have you got have you got sound so yeah yeah she's got sound i can confirm that she can hear everything that everybody's saying um and all right but we, we need to get on i i think if you have oh gosh it's, it's just appeared okay uh, we Go can with hear it. You Carry on. yeah it just appeared okay okay good uh councillor bradman will you put your hand down please no problem thank you right uh karen press on please Karen's muted. Karen. Sorry. The Go site comprises you. three grade two star listed hangars from World War One, which is as shown on my screen now. I'll make it larger. Oh. Um, there's a grade two star, grade two, sorry, listed control tower to the south. This is the airspace building, which is the large hangar, which you see from the roundabout on the M11. There are some pa partners hangars in this area to the south of the site, um, including a new building, which has replaced this smaller hangar, which is an aircraft restoration hangar. Um, the airfield runs to the south of the site. So, the key constraints are as follows. Special policy area, which is policy E7 of the local plan. Countryside, listed buildings, conservation area and the site is in flood zone one. Um, here is an aerial photograph of the site, which gives you an idea. So the historic core of the site is to, well, it's centrally. So you have modern buildings to the east where the airspace building and hangars are, and to the west where there's the American Air Museum, and we have recently granted permission for a large object store um, along that side of the site. Just show an aerial view, image view of the site, which gives you an idea, and the hotel will be going approximately where the arrow is pointing in the top corner with the M11 that runs behind the site. So the proposal is for a 168 bedroom hotel on the eastern part of the site. 
to the south of the A505 and to the west of the M11. It will be sited between the existing airspace building and the aircraft restoration buildings and partners hangars. It will be six storeys in height, but slightly lower than the airspace building, which is 22 metres in height. The accommodation would provide, a, in addition to the bedrooms, a gym on the ground floor and the top floor will have a reception area, restaurant, lounge and external viewing terrace. 96 parking spaces would be provided with the hotel, along with an overflow car park of approximately 30 spaces. It also includes 20 cycle parking spaces on site. Hotel has been designed to reflect its location on the site of an airfield. So, sorry, just going back to the presentation, that gives you an idea of the site at the moment. It's basically just a piece of um, lawn grassland with a couple of small trees. This building here you can see is an energy centre and the hotel will be, be behind that building. This is the green building in the background, is the aircraft restoration hangar, the new building, and this large building is the airspace building. <clears throat> so the layout of the hotel, it will have an L shape with the entrance coming from the main A505 from the existing access point to the car park for the Imperial War Museum. Um, there will be a gate in that section for occupiers of the hotel who will be able to um, log in when they arrive as such. It will be open at normal times of the day, but during the evening overnight you will have to uh, type in a number to be able to gain access to the site, given obviously for security purposes. Um, so the airspace building is here to the west so slightly. Um, the overflow car park is down the bottom here. This is the conference centre parking area, sorry, to the west existing. These are proposed new parking spaces to the front of the hotel. The entrance to the hotel is on the northern side, just here. Um, obviously, people come travel around the back of the airspace building and then enter the car park up here. This is just a plan showing the access to the site. So when you come from the, this is the A505, you'll come through the main entrance and then you will go down this lane here around the back of the building. So there is a landscape strategy for the site. Given the position of the development on an airfield, it will and the existing character of the landscape on the airfield, um, landscaping will be limited, but there will be some additional landscaping in terms of creating an enhancement to biodiversity on the site. The details will be subject to a condition of any consent. So it's just an example of the floor plans. So as you come in, the entrance is here. You'll go directly to the left to go up to the top floor, um, unless where there's a reception area. And this is the top floor. So you have the reception area and welcome zone in this section here, um, restaurant and lounge area, and then you have an external terrace on this end. So just looking at the proposed elevations of the building, it's an example of the elevations, but I will go through them in turn. The, so in terms of the south elevation, which is the view from the airfield itself, you have, sorry, the north elevation, not south elevation. So it's the view from the entrance and the M11 slip road. So you see this is airspace building in the corner here, the existing large hangar, and this does rise in height slightly. Um, you get this 3D image at the bottom, which shows the building within the context of airspace. So these are the side elevations. So this will be the views from the um, airspace, well, the conference centre car park airspace building side and the partner hangars. 
and then further on there's details sorry these are the views from the airfield so it shows you so this is the external terrace area up on the top floor um, with bedrooms and this is an energy building down here and the overflow car park will be down here so the materials for the building, it will be pale grey and white cladding for the main building. It will have a light grey standing seam roof um, with windows with dark grey aluminium surrounding the glazing. And on the southern um, on the elevation facing the airfield, there will be some breeze soleil panels which will be blue in colour for the corporate branding of the hotel. So just to give you some views of the site, so this is looking views across the airfield. So the top photograph is the view as existing and the bottom photograph is the view with the proposed development. So you can just see a small red outline there which gives you an idea where the proposed hotel will be located. So this is a closer view from the airfield, so just outside airspace. So this again, this is the aircraft restoration centre hangar in the background with the big airspace building. And at the bottom you see the proposed hotel. So these are views from outside the site. So this is on the roundabout to the M11. Um, this is looking on the footpath to the north of the A505. This is looking back towards the site. Um, so you will see views of the hotel in that position. When you're actually traveling around the roundabout, um, you will get glimpses of the hotel. Um, you will see it, but, but for, for a very short period of time because you will be traveling around the roundabout in the opposite direction. So this is a view from the roundabout, which leads to Duxford on the A505. Again, you can see the airspace building here with existing landscaping, and this is the proposed outline of the hotel. So this is the view from the proposed view from the M11 slip road. So this is probably the most prominent view that there will be of the site. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So you can see the existing airspace building and then the hotel will be set obviously in front of that building. Um, so you will see that, but you would need to sort of turn to see it and it would be a fleeting view. So again, a view from the, this is from the bridge over Grange Road in Duxford. So the bridge over the M11, um, sorry, but the details are, you can't really see very well. The hotel is actually where my arrow is pointing, but the colors kind of blend in with the airspace building. So this is from Hunts Road, which is the road that leads to Duxford from the A505. So there will be obviously views of the building. Again, this is quite a prominent view. There will be views of the building from Hunts Road. So the key considerations in relation to the development are the principle of development and the special policy area in the countryside, the character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, trees, landscaping and biodiversity, transport impact and highway safety, flood risk, neighbour immunity, and safety. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. I think we've got a few uh, looking for clarifications. Who's first, please? Yeah, we have Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question to Karen is um, I looked on the um, consultees and I can't see Triplo Parish Council, Karen. Um, and Tripo Heathfield is actually the nearer to them than Duxford um, Village uh, or Whittlesford. So have they been missed out on the consultation? I believe they have been consulted, but they haven't commented. Thank you. Right. And the next one. Councillor Heather Williams and then Councillor Milnes. Lovely, thank you. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you. Um, 
I just want to to discuss something that's on page 117, 171, um, because it seems that the historic buildings officer uh, is is really I've read it quite un unhappy about it and says that we should be giving great weight to to this um, and actually says I consider that further negotiation would be beneficial with input of the conservation team so that would lead me to believe that they believe there can be a compromise it's just that this isn't it and, and raises some quite serious issues in relation to the historic buildings so I was just wondering if if we could have some clarification as to why if that's the advice we've got a different route is being um, given if, if it's a case of time for non-determination or or some reason why why we're we not taking advice of the historic buildings officer and, and having these conversations um, right. and recommending approval really just seems a discrepancy thank you chairman thank you Carol. thank you thank you um, the consular, the historic buildings officer has raised concerns in relation to the proposal. Some of the concerns raised, um, actually, well, all of the concerns raised should be addressed in the report. Um, the, with regards to the initial concern raised about the location of the site of the building, um, I mean, I've been working with Duxford for a long time in terms of we have regular meetings and so on. We they have a master plan for the site and they have considered the whole of the site for the location of the proposed hotel. Um, in our view, some of the concerns raised by the conservation officer have to be weighed against the public benefits of the scheme in terms of the need for the hotel to secure the viability of the Imperial War Museum and so on. So they've concluded that it would result in less than substantial public, car um, sorry, less than sub substantial harm to heritage assets. Um, and they say there's a degree of public benefit, but our view is that there is significant public benefits that outweigh that harm to the ha assets. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Milnes, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, no. So I've, yeah. now, I've now got three um, questions because um, in terms of consideration of the placement, um, you mentioned that um, the officers mess was once considered but would have uh, required a lot of redevelopment. But there is quite a substantial space to the north of the northern part of the site. Was that a, a location that was considered for this? Now, councillor, we, we have that a number of times now. Oh. We have to deal with what is in front of us, not actually okay. look for other sites. Well, can you go on to your next question, please? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, are there any solar panels? Right, good question. Any solar panels? I don't believe there are at the moment. The proposed um, renewable energy source will be combined heat and power plants, but we can ask for those if necessary. I would wait to, uh, any, any renewable energy source uh, would be compliant with our uh, policies on that. And then the final question I've got, and I, I'm, I'm afraid, um, you know, I'm, I'm asking the officer responsible rather than the people who determined the traffic assessment. But I'm looking at pages 184 and then 190 with assessment. And I don't know if you've got the slide, Karen, that you showed um, of the view from the Duxford 505, um, which shows a queue of traffic. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there we are. Um, that's a typical scene of, of, of morning and evening traffic. Yep. Um, the one observation that they made on a Wednesday, the 15th of January 2020, might not have given them a, a true representation. And um, I, I'm just concerned that we are adding to an already congested road. 
Uh, I know the um, 168 rooms, I mean, they're talking about 180 uh, car movements a day, I think, or, or morning and evening, 180 cars. Um, but I mean, I've seen queues going back up the M11, going a mile waiting to get off onto the 505. And this is inevitably going to make that situation worse. And it seems to be totally underplayed in the um, in the assessment, in the traffic assessment. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any comments um, on that? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Karen? Yeah, thank you. Um, the, obviously, the existing baseline survey of the 200, 2019 figures um, have been taken on surveys at the time. Um, the proposed figures for the 2020 um, and the 2025 with and without the development would result in um, there is a slight increase in the westbound arm of the A505 junction, whereas the other junctions are all under capacity. Um, there is mitigation proposed as a result of that slight increase in the amount of traffic. Um, but again, and so also... This expression, sorry to interrupt, Karen, but this expression that you just used of under capacity, how does that tally with the, the constant queuing at the various roundabouts, particularly the M11 roundabout and the 505-1301. And do, do the um, estimates take into account now that we've got both the genome campus approval and um, we've got the okay. other references, the South okay. uh, Pampersford, um, the new development there. And today we've just approved Huawei, which will add to all of that. So yes, they do take into account. Um, obviously, there's an existing situation. You know, we're not disputing that. But the minor is such a limited increase in traffic as a result of the development. And it is considered to be certain arms of the uh, are currently under capacity. So it's we have to obviously justify there needs to be a significant justification for us to ask for for example works to upgrade the a505 and that's obviously not considered required in this case okay thank you very much yeah thank you thank you uh yeah who's next councillor bradnam chair right. bradnam thornton williams and spain thank you chairman right. thank you councillor bradnam um so a couple of things um i noticed in the report that questions were asked about had any other buildings on the site being considered and i saw that they had looked at other buildings and didn't feel that they were suitable to be refurbished um but i did want to ask if if the officer could um advise us certainly the um the i can't remember if it was the heritage asset officer who who said it seemed a very tortuous entrance to the hotel. It wasn't legible from the from the A505 entrance. And I just wondered whether. Oh, sorry, I'm hearing myself twice. Don't know if I'm right. um, I just wondered if um, the applicant had had any discussion with the case officer about the, the, the appropriateness of the site of the hotel within the greater site in that regard in, in the sense that it was a very legible from the front from the A505 entrance so it was just that and secondly um, given that the building looks very dominant on the uh, to from viewing from the M11 off slip northbound I wondered whether we could um, enhance the condition for landscaping to plant a hedge along that boundary so that it wasn't quite so dominant over the road at that point. Right, thank you. Karen. Thank you. Um, in terms of the position of the building, uh, the legibility from the main entrance to the site, um, it has been requested that there was some public art at that entrance to the site to aid legibility to the hotel. 
Um, unfortunately, this is also the main entrance to the Imperial War Museum. So the thought was that it wouldn't be appropriate to add public art in relation to the hotel as it may conflict. There's an existing um, aeroplane at the entrance and we wouldn't want it to detract from that because that's the main entrance to the uh, museum. So but however there will be a sign in relation to the hotel which will direct visitors along the slip road specifically to the entrance of the hotel. The second point in relation to the landscaping along the M11 um, slip road boundary, I can't see a reason why we couldn't request that as part of any condition. Um, for my own, for my own um, um, point of view, any suggestion of public art is not, is not going to solve the problem and I, I didn't think that was going to help anyway, but I, I was just concerned that people trying to get to the hotel would find it quite confusing unless there was really clear signage as to how to get there. But also, I'm assuming the hotel wants to face the motorway in order to publicise itself, basically, which is what most hotels do. Is that your understanding of why they wanted to put it there? In my view, the site is quite difficult to locate the hotel in a different position. There is obviously a commercial aspect to it as well, but it is the modern commercial area of the site and the conference centre is actually in the airspace building directly adjacent to the hotel. Mm. OK, okay. thank you. Uh, Councillor Daunton, please. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. You're good. OK, I've been having difficulty with the um, with the mute button. I want to take us back to page 171 um, and the the heritage issue um, it, at the top of page 171. Um, I just uh, read the sentence. This impact is further exacerbated by the use of brilliant white and in inverted commas cladding, which would be out of keeping with the muted and characteristic colour scheme elsewhere on the site. Um, has any account been taken of that and also of the other remarks on that page? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the planning assessment does consider all the points raised by the historic buildings officer in terms specifically of the materials. If there is concern about the use of the bright white cladding, then potentially this could be um, addressed by a condition of any consent. And um, um, will it be uh, addressed by a condition? You say could be addressed by a condition. If Chair, sorry, Karen, Chair. If, sorry. If, if sorry. Chris, Chris Carter here, sorry. Yeah, Mr Carter, come and help Just us. Provide some assistance here. The, the scheme as proposed has the, the <laughs> colour scheme that, that's proposed. With regard to the heritage uh, points that have been made, it's it's the job of the planning officer and, and now the planning committee to weigh those points in the planning balance. Um, heritage aspects are important. The MPPF uh, sets a fairly clear process for determining those issues. The level of harm identified here is less than substantial and in those circumstances it's appropriate for us to weigh any other benefits against that less than substantial harm. So that's really the the, the process that we need to go through. The, uh, Karen has, uh, has addressed the issues raised by the uh, Historic Buildings Officer in her report and it's it's now for the committee to ter determine the weight that they afford to those views in the context of the other benefits that this scheme may bring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's clear. So, uh, Councillor Thane, please. Oh, William. Uh, two questions, the first of which I hope can be easily satisfied by an assurance. Referring to um, paragraph 41 on page 193, and this to some extent follows on from Councillor Daunton's question. It refers to the materials of construction, uh, including dark grey aluminium panels and glazing for the walls. Now there is of course new regulations coming in on the cladding of buildings, which makes the planning stage one of the three gateways. It relates to buildings, I believe, officers can put me right, six stories and more, over 18 metres in height, and it's not quite clear from the consultation of last June whether it applies to hotels as well. That was still to be determined. Um, can we assume 
that either those regulations do not apply to this building or that they will be met. Um, the second thing is in relation to page 173, paragraph 13. I was just a little um, uncertain at the wording of the conclusion there, which is whilst the concept of a hotel on the site is apparently established, I had expected perhaps rather firmer guidance on that point. All right, thank you. Aaron. Chair, if, if I yeah. can deal with the point about the materials and the building height, that's a matter that would be dealt with under the building regulations should this building come to be uh, constructed, uh, I believe. Uh, I don't believe that's material to the planning consideration right. uh, at this present stage. OK, thank you. Right, do we have any others? Question. Sorry, yes. Chair, 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 I'm on the list. I've got, I spoke earlier on. I haven't got my hand up or anything. So hang, hang on a minute, please. Uh, I'm not sure Councillor Thane's quite finished yet. Sorry, there was a, a second question there, which was the wording of the conclusion. Yeah. And I was wondering whether it might be possible to be a bit more definitive on the question of whether a concept of a hotel on the site is established or not established. The word apparently is inserted there. OK, can you comment on that, please, Karen? Sure. So a, the principle of a hotel has previously been established on the site. So where permission was granted for conversion of the officers mess building, which is this building down here, um, that consent has now expired so there is no extant consent for a hotel on site right thank you very much um who else do we have uh, no no one else chair uh, sorry i have put my hand up yeah uh, councillor roberts is on the list and got a hand up yeah thank councillor you. roberts go on. Daunton. Councillor Daunton first. All right. Uh, I think we've had Councillor Daunton. Yes, you have. Yeah, and Councillor Thane. Uh, now Councillor uh, Roberts, I believe. Thank you, Chairman. A, a secondary one about consultation. I, yeah. I'm a little. I am a little concerned that um, that I haven't had it proven really to me that uh, first of all, Triplo Parish Council have been consulted. I found it very hard to believe that they would not have made comment. Also, I know that there is no comments from neighbours at Heathfield um, and the previous area that was previously the officer's accommodation. Um, and there is going to be serious light pollution from this. Um, a little while ago, I sat on a licensing committee for uh, the garage across the road and the neighbours were extremely concerned about traffic movement, light uh, pollution extract for just a, a small cafe there. Now, are we absolutely sure? Because I tell you something, we do not want the few consortium coming down our necks if we have not consulted people. Have we actually got proven evidence that neighbours have been consulted? Because those people in the previous officers' mess accommodation are going to be the people greatly affected by this. All right, thank you. Uh, can we go that, please? I believe neighbours in Heathfield have been consulted. The site edged red is in this location here and comes along here. Triplo Parish starts over here. So we wouldn't necessarily consult Triplo Parish Council, although I believe we have anyway. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, sorry, Chair, I have, to, I have to come in here. I think that the officer is, I'm, is not taking my point. Those people in the previous officers' accommodation, if they have not been leafleted, if they have not received, we could be in serious trouble. I doubt that they have actually been carded by the authority. All right, can we just be clear? What we, are we talking about the officers' mess, which is offices now? Yeah. Yeah, OK. I'm talking, I'm talking about the off previous on the that block here on the right hand side uh, next to the old there's the office all, all the old officers mess area 
yeah. but that area to the right of it, the square, that's it, Chairman. That is uh, accommodation that was officers' accommodation, which is now all privately owned. See right. how close to the road they are. I don't think they've been carded. And if they haven't, we're going to have a few carding down on us. Right. The officers have just told you that they have been. We can confirm that again, if you like. Karen, can you just confirm that, please, since that borders that area? Thank you, Chair. I believe the neighbours have been carded. Um, also, a site notice has been displayed at the site, which would cover that matter if the neighbours have not been carded. OK, thank you very much for that. I think that's uh, the <laughs> clarification. Now we need to move on. I've got um, a couple of speakers. Okay, get, get a legal challenge, you know. Do we really want any more legal challenges? What Karen is saying. No, she we don't, but I mean, you, what more can be said other than what the officer has told you? Because there's there's somewhere, to be said there. somewhere, somewhere on, file, there must be, on file, there must be a list of properties that have been carded. That I'm must sure, be. I'm sure there, there are, and uh, but we're not actually in the office at the moment are we so we need to move on i'm sure everyone's noted your comments then all right public speaking uh is sophie payne with us please sophie payne for the agents hello sir. it's uh, andrew benedict speaking in in sophie's um, step Sorry, I think we lost you. Hello, Chair. Andrew Benedict speaking on behalf of Sophie. All oh, right. OK, so you're subbing. Yeah. Could we ask Mr Benedict to speak up a little bit, please? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me OK now? Can you? Yeah, if you could share this, we'd yeah, <laughs> be appreciated. Yeah, is that OK? Yeah. No, that's... are you rather a long way from your computer? No, oh, inch, inches away, inches away. Oh. All right, I think that's the best we can probably do. So, you know, the form, uh, sorry to keep you for so long. Uh, and you've got your three minutes now. So when you're ready, please. OK, thank you, Chair and members of the planning committee. Appreciate it's been a long and hot day, so we really appreciate your patience and working with us uh, at this time. So my name is Andrew Benelik from GGR Architects. I'm here on behalf of the applicant as well as the Imperial War Museum Duxford in my capacity as their uh, architect. Uh, the hotel project is seen as a key for the IWM in further developing the commercial offer at Duxford, an offer which is specifically there to support the operation of the museum and preserve this nationally important heritage site. Every aspect of the hotel, from its location to the likely users, has been considered in a series of studies and plans over the last few years. Now that's included uh, public exhibitions, and I can confirm also that we've locally met many of the neighbours at public events and personally delivered invitations of those to them. In 2017, the IWN commissioned a feasibility study for the hotel at Duxford. Uh, the study concluded that there was a strong case for a hotel at the site with a focus on the commercial market to support the existing conferencing and events business. At present, Duxford struggles to attract multi-day conferences or residentials due to the lack of accommodation in the immediate local area. Uh, clients generally have to travel to Stansted for larger conferences, and this removes Duxford from a key developmental market. In 2018, the conference centre at Duxford saw 27,000 delegates, and that rose to 33,000 in 2019. So to continue that level of growth, Duxford will need an on-site hotel. A positive impact is also forecast on the museum visitors with the IWM being able to attract people from further afield than the usual two hour drive time and encourage more international visitors to the museum, uh, which will also bring additional spend to Duxford and the local area. An economic report commissioned in 2019 uh, by the IWM found that it contributes around 43 million of gross added value and over 1000 full time equivalent jobs to the east of England, along with the hotel, that should add more money and also 40 more direct jobs to the economy. The hotel will there be key to supporting their role of protecting and conserving the important historic in a sustainable manner. Uh, while the feasibility study demonstrated the need and opportunity for a hotel, recent events around the COVID-19 have further given Duxford an opportunity to develop 
as more companies look for out of town event spaces and with Duxford's open air location, excellent accessibility, as they have an opportunity to have a strong offer in the new world. Uh, following the tender exercise in 2017, IWM partnered with Propertier to design and deliver the proposal you see today. Uh, the proposed location for the hotel was identified as part of the 2016 master plan for Duxford, which was commissioned to address the long term development of the museum, and this was supported and endorsed by Historic England. The idea is the hotel location is in a modern area and will be far away from the historic centre and the design will be sympathetic uh, to the area for both the modern area of the hotel and also the surrounding modern buildings. So all the points of the hotel uh, stakeholders have been included, consulted to ensure the project supports all of the INW's key aims. And we've ensured that the development will bring benefits to both the flying community, museum visitors, and ensure sec site security is maintained. Thank you for your time. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification members? Councillor Bradnam. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Benelik. Um, I just wanted to check with you, given that the um, new hotel would be quite dominant as a structure over the road, would you be prepared to uh, agree to um, improving the boundary and putting in the boundary treatment of planting a hedge along the A10 northbound off slip road? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, certainly, we're happy to look at that. We are already proposing um, some limited tree planting through there and some low level features. Um, but again, we are happy to enhance that um, if, if, if it's viewed as helpful. Thank you, right. Thank you very much. Do we have further speakers? No, Chair, we just have Stephen Reid, who I think had a, a point about an, an earlier point raised on the legality of that. Right. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reid, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, th I think that Councillor Robert's concern is that with the number of planning challenges that we've seen uh, recently, it would be open to committee to give officers delegated authority to approve this permission, subject to officers being satisfied that the neighbours in the area identified by Councillor Roberts have been consulted. Provided that consultation has taken place, then members, then officers would proceed with the issue of the permission subject to completion of the agreement. I think what Councillor Roberts is looking for is that if it turned out that those neighbours hadn't been consulted, then having regard to the belief of the officer. I think she, uh, Councillor Roberts is saying the matter ought to come back to committee so that you are advised that actually the officer's belief wasn't borne out by the planning file. Chairman, so I think, I, I think you. Chair, you, you were looking really to That's say right. we, we can't address Councillor Roberts' concerns, but yeah. I, I think we can without upsetting the timetable. Yeah. We've got a 106 to complete in any event, yeah. and I think we could use the same period to ensure that a check is made of the planning file as to exactly yeah. who was consulted. Right. OK, that's fine. We'll come back to that in the recommendation at, at the end. Are you happy with that, Councillor Roberts? I think that's ideal, Chairman. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think Councillor Fain wants to, uh, to speak. Chair, sorry. Uh, Councillor Daunton has lost connection this time. Uh, I believe that she was subbing in. Um, so do you want me to see if I can quickly get her back on so that we don't, she doesn't miss anything? Right. She only just died then. Yes, yes. Right. right. Uh, let's. Uh, I agree. Uh, can we pause yeah. while, while we get connection with her? Yeah, a couple of minutes.
Just some clarification, please. Thank you, Chair. It was, in fact, Councillor Daunton who uh, raised the concern mentioned by the historic buildings officer about the uh, brilliant white cladding. Mm -hmm. um, that's at paragraph, uh, it's on page 173, paragraph 13, I think. There's also the mention on page 193 that I referred to uh, about the grey metal cladding, white metal cladding, and dark grey aluminium panels. And I wondered perhaps whether Mr. Bernalek would like to comment on the appropriateness of that in the light of the Historic Buildings Officer's comments. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, are you with us, Mr. Bernalek? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Happy to do that. If you wouldn't mind, so yeah, we want that, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, we've tried to pick a palette of materials uh, that would blend with some of the surrounding uh, buildings, the airspace building, and also the uh, adjacent uh, other uh, hangars uh, to make the building appropriate. So that's why we've used a, a palette of metals of greys and dark greys uh, to in order to achieve that. Uh, we have also proposed using a white cladding that was to give the building some definition and also an identity of its own as a hotel because that is a distinct use uh, from what is in the surrounding area um, but at the same time we're also happy uh, to work with the planners as conditions uh, to perhaps tone down that palette of materials to make it more suitable um, taking on board those latest comments right thank you very much for that um, although it's worth noting that the urban design officer wasn't uh, um, against the current uh, proposal. Uh, I think that's all our questioners there. No, I wanted to oh. speak. Did you? All right, Councillor Bradnam. Bradnam. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's a long day. Thank yeah, it's a I long just, day. You, you know just, who you are. Thank you. I just wanted to. Um, observe that uh, uh, that whilst the I was worried about the white cladding too um, but I note that it's actually facing the motorway rather than into the historic site and it wouldn't be seen from the historic site nevertheless I I would like to take up that offer that the officers work with um, uh, the applicant to see if if uh, an appropriate colour can be used. My my concern was, I think, also picking up on what Councillor Fain was saying. I am just quite concerned about the use of cladding and that it should meet all fire resistance requirements uh, in view of the fact that we've just passed the anniversary of the Grenfell Tower disaster. Um, I know this isn't quite so tall as that, but could we just make sure that any cladding used meets all of the fire requirements. Right. Yes, we get, we get confirmation on that. Uh, could you confirm that cladding meets all the current requirements, please? Mr. Benelik. Speaking, I hope you can hear me. Um, yep. Yes, I can confirm that the cladding will meet those fire requirements. It's a standard condition of the hotel operator and brand and also in consideration of where we are we're surrounded on an airfield um, which has live airplanes and fuel um, so uh, the details will have to be very much uh, concentrated on being a very safe cladding system right there and as you already said you're happy to <coughs> speak with officers uh, on on the matter of the colors and so on that's fine thank you yeah okay good right thank you very much can we please move on then um, I think we've got a statement from a local member. That's uh, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, is somebody going to read that out, please? Hello, has somebody got uh, Councillor MacDonald? I believe, um, I believe Aaron has that. Does it? Aaron, have you got the statement from the councillor, please? I'm sorry, Chair. Can you hear me now? Uh, my no, we can my hear laptop you. was having a hard time. <laughs> Is, aren't we all? <laughs> but press on, so, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, so the uh, statement from Councillor McDonald uh, highlights some of the issues raised by Councillor Daunton and Councillor Williams earlier on. 
and uh, focuses on the sympathetic nature of the hotel. Uh, it's essentially a new building suited to a town or city location, not next to a heritage centre. There are two, uh, there are, sorry, there are grade two listed buildings on the site and it seems the heritage officer's comments have been overruled. I'm worried that this would set precedents for future developments of the airfield. Um, and uh, he quotes the heritage officer, which I know was mentioned earlier, but I will uh, read out what is written. And uh, whilst there is undoubtedly a potential public benefit to providing guest accommodation on the site, in order to increase uh, income to the Imperial War Museum and amongst other things, uh, facilitate works to the historic structures on the site, it has not been evidenced that the current proposal is sufficiently sympathetic to achieve this without causing harm to the setting and significance of the heritage assets. Furthermore, it, would, it has not been demonstrated that the required facilities could not be achieved with a more sympathetic and appropriate manner which would better respond to and preserve the special historic interest of this nationally important site. As was uh, clarified earlier, the NPPF is clear that great weight should be afforded to the assets conservation and that clear and convincing justification is required for harm, particularly to grade two listed buildings. As such, I consider that further negotiation would be beneficial and with the input of the conservation team to arrive at a successful scheme which could overcome the concerns raised. Uh, Council Madonna would therefore like to ask that some, some condition on the sympathetic nature of the exterior fascia be applied. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we don't have any other speakers, both Duxford Parish Council and Whittlesford Parish Council, you would have noted are in support of the application and didn't feel uh, the necessary, necessary to come to the meeting. So we move on to the discussion. Uh, who would like to open? Yeah, I've got, yes, I've got Councillor Heather Williams, Councillor okay. Bradnam and Councillor Rob. I can only take in two at a time. That's, uh, okay, uh, Councillor Heather Williams yeah, and Councillor yeah. Bradnam. Right, Heather Williams, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairman. And just for clarification, my hand is now not working. That's why I've had to use the chat. Um, so I think the the principle of a hotel on that site, I think, has been been well, well argued. Um, and I, I don't have any issues with the principle. I, I do with the design is what, and what has been put in front of us. Um, I know the determination date and therefore a deferral isn't isn't an option because I think if further work was done, this this could be a really beneficial um, opportunity for for the surrounding area and and for Duxford Imperial War Museum. And I appreciate what's been said about further work's being done after we've given permission, but we have to judge it as it is right in front of us today. And, and it is subjective, but I, I have to say that when when on balance looking at this, I'm I'm minded to agree with the historic buildings officer. Um, this isn't in its, its. I appreciate others may may disagree with that, but I don't think it is in the right state for this to go forward. And I think you know, it's there's a lot of comments, and it, there is a reason why we give great weight to these um, these sites and these buildings. Because once they're, you know, they're there, we can't change it. Anything that happens, you can't change the impact that it has. And I think actually the representation from our historic buildings office has been very strong. It's been very clear. And um, there, there is an option there. There can be a successful development there. But I'm afraid this is not it and I won't be supporting it. Thank but you. I do welcome and hope that a better proposal comes forward in the future. I think the principle is a good idea. Thank you. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, I draw our attention to paragraph one of the report, um, which says that the site is situated within the conservation area and comprises a number of listed buildings. It is considered the finest and best preserved example of a fighter base representative of the period up to the 1945 in Britain. And um, I am mindful that many of the things, the points that the historic buildings officer has made um, reflect his 
apparent view that this doesn't respect that finest and best. And I must say, I was a bit disappointed with the design of the building. Um, and I, I couldn't see why horizontal fenestration reflected um, any kind of reference to the RAF or military. Um, so I'm, I'm somewhat uh, concerned about this still. Um, and as has been said, we have to decide on what's in front of us, which is always very difficult because I'm the first one who has to vote. So I'm still undecided on this. I'll listen to the, de the debate. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Councillor Roberts, please. Milnes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and if Anna wants me to go first, I'd be quite happy to. <laughs> um, uh, Chairman, I, I'm not happy with it as it is at present. Um, it's a very sensitive site, and I'm a little concerned that this is trying to put a, a quart into a pint pot or whichever way around it is, but, but I think it's, it's not right. I think that the building is um, going to stand out and be over dominant of the um, rest of the conservation area. I think the materials, uh, as has been pointed out by Councillor MacDonald, um, also give me cause for concern. I think the very mass of it really pushed into that area is going to uh, not be good. It, it is going to be very detrimental to the conservation area. I've also got concerns about uh, the fact that it's going to be all night, that there is going to be a lot of lighting there. And I'm very appreciative of what Mr. Reed has suggested about going back to neighbours to make sure. But, you know, it's going to be very different from what it is now. Um, and I think it's going to be too different. I think it still needs working on quite a lot. I think in principle, um, something in that area, um, though of course the, the previous ones, which I remember well, were at the other side of the road. Um, and there's also, I'm also a little concerned because it's only a few months ago that the big hangar to which it would be next to nearly lost all its roof. It was actually coming away. And that's the second time recently that that has happened. And the thought of that happening um, and that being throwing around shrapnel everywhere um, and so near to a hotel with people staying and sleeping in it, etc., um, is it gives me a lot of concern. And so I think that this is a, it should be a refusal today, but with the emphasis that something something would be very um, good there. Um, we do need some more telecommodation around this area but not at the moment with this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, before oh. Councillor Milnes, Mr Carter would like to speak. Sorry, who would? Mr Carter, yes. Mr Carter. Yeah, Mr Thank, Carter, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to comment on the advice received from Historic England um, in relation to the application, which you'll see starting at paragraph 28 on page 191. Uh, and at the top of the following page, uh, where Historic England advised that in recent years, the site's operators, the IWM, have engaged Historic England in their evolving master plan. And we've been a partner in this vision document for the future management and development of the airfield. The current proposals for a hotel adjacent to the modern perimeter of the site is in line with the master plan. We were consulted earlier in the year regarding the evolving hotel design and raised no concerns. I, I raise that as obviously we've considered quite in some detail the the uh, strong views of the council's historic buildings officer as we should um, but i just felt it was important to raise that advice from historic england who obviously are a national advisor on heritage matters particularly on grade two star and grade one uh, listed buildings uh, and i just thought it was important that the committee were mindful of that as well in their considerations thank you chair all right thank you very much for that was that councillor milnes we had next oh, i think it is yes. yep good Councillor Milnes, then, please. So I think uh, there's a couple of things that I, I, I would uh, bring our attention to. Um, one, one of which is the underlying viability of the Imperial War Museum. So I know from personal experience that they've struggled financially. Um, we know that um, uh, hotel rooms availability is very limited. The um, Holiday Express that was built um, next to the railway station, Whittlesford, uh, has been um, able to maintain premium prices because of their uh, high load. Their, uh, their booking rates are very good because there's a very limited number of hotel rooms in the area. And as we've been told, 
the uh, commercial viability of multi-day conferences is limited by that lack of accommodation. But the chairman uh, slapped me down for asking whether alternative uh, locations on the site uh, uh, had been considered, but I'm going to re-raise that because on the northern site um, there is space aplenty within the curtilage of the IWM to build a different hotel type. Well, uh, Councillor Wright is uh, shaking his head, but I, I asked the question because I wanted to know whether that had been considered. Frequently we are asked whether alternate sites for um, projects have been considered. So um, having said that, I understand that the proximity to the airspace where the conferences are, are held would <coughs> make that location next to it a, an ideal location. So I think we've, we've got lots of uh, things that are, are being toyed with here, including the um, uh, mention, uh, frequent mention of the uh, listed buildings. But I believe in 1968, one of those buildings was demolished for the purposes of the film Battle of Britain. So I'm not quite sure how precious all those uh, buildings are. So I, I, I don't like um, the, it's, it's a bland building with a curly bit of roof. And if we do go ahead with it, I'll just ask that we condition solar renewables. Um, I think it's there because of its prominence next to the road. Uh, and, and that prominence, I think, is upsetting uh, the, the current view. So I'm, I'm very dubious about whether we should uh, approve this uh, application today. Thank you very much. Uh, who's next? Councillor Wright. Councillor Wright and Councillor Fain. Right, Councillor Wright, please. Just at the right moment, I think, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I have visited this site many times and it is in a modern part of the site. It is a good situation. It's right adjacent to the conference centre and that's why it makes so much sense to put it here. Uh, the northern site is uh, on the other side of the A505 to the conference centre and it is, you know, that is close to all the really important listed buildings. So, you know, let's look at what's in front of us rather than making suggestions on putting it elsewhere. It makes sense here. Historic England don't object to this. Our urban design officers don't object to this. The planning officer has supported it. Um, our, our historic building officer has concerns about it, but she has not used the word object. Um, so there's concerns about it, but we have to look at the bigger picture, the whole thing. And there's no doubt that South Cams has been crying out for a major conference centre supported by a hotel for a long time. And when I was planning portfolio holder, this was uh, you know, considered a vital thing. And even then we were trying to persuade the Imperial War Museum to do it. Um, so this to me makes absolute sense. It has, you know, the historic building officers' concerns have been outweighed by the economic development advantages to this, particularly to the Imperial War Museum. And Councillor Mills is right in saying that we should have concerns about that because it is a tourist attraction and it needs our support, particularly at this moment. Um, you know, and to hear the local member, who remember is our economic development champion attacking this, surprises me even more when his parish council support it. So to me, I'm very minded to support this members and uh, I'll leave what I've, you know, that leave that with you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's on to... Councillor Fain, please. Sorry, Chairman, but somebody needs to say, I think it's wrong to uh, attack the local member because she, he wasn't, um, he wasn't being trashing it. He was just saying that at present he can't be very happy with it. I think it's very uh, wrong. Thank, thank you, Councillor. We can all draw our own conclusions from that, I'm sure. Uh, Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've heard that the approval, the principle of the hotel is established on this site. 
I entirely agree with what Councillor Wright said about the location. I recall some of the comments originally made about the airspace. Uh, they weren't all entirely positive. I hear very few negative comments about it now. And this building would lie between that building and the motorway. Um, it is not in any sense a threat to the listed buildings or the conservation area itself. Um, as to the risks of shrapnel from the airspace building, I think probably on an air airfield there may be greater risks of shrapnel from elsewhere. Um, I think the design of this building is suitable to an airfield, particularly when beside a motorway. Uh, the cladding is still to be addressed. I agree with what Councillor Milne said about uh, it would be good to see more solar renewables. That should not be impossible, but that's not for us to decide at this stage. I come back to what Councillor Wright concluded on about the viability of IWM. And again, Councillor Milne supported that. And it is quite clear that particularly under the revised NPPF, and this is referred to at paragraph 12 on page 167, um, there is significant weight to be given to the need to support economic growth and productivity. And that is all the more so when, as I may have mentioned earlier in the day, we face possibly the deepest recession for many, many years. And I believe this could be a significant contribution to the viability of IWM, which is a very important facility for our area, and that we should therefore support and approve this application. OK, thank you very much. And who's next, please? <laughs> Councillor Halings, do we have any more speakers? Councillor Halings. I don't think Councillor Halings can hear you. Um, I, I, Chairman, I, I think sorry, I... Sorry. Uh, she's back with us. Thank you. It's Claire Donaldson. Sorry. Yes, it's Claire Donaldson next. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you, Pippa. Um, yeah, so I, I really just want to make a brief comment. I, I hear all the arguments about the economic viability and I, I go along with those. Um, this hotel is in a prominent position on a site of national importance. Um, I will be supporting it, but I'm, I'm uh, disappointed that we haven't got a better quality of building in that site, but I do hear the economic arguments. I hope that there might be some work to be done on the cladding um, and, and also some attempt to make the building fit more, uh, to fit better into the site. It's a, it's a prominent position. Right, thank you. And could I ask everyone to put their hands down, please? Has everyone spoken? I, I had put my, I think a lot of people have put their hands up because they wanted to speak. Well, you've already spoken, haven't you? Yes. Not in the debate. Right, OK. I've got clarification. Yeah, so we've got Bradnam, Councillor Bradnam, Councillor Heather Williams, right. Councillor Griffiths. That's enough to go along Bradnam. with. Councillor Bradnam, please. OK, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to clarify, you know, I'm, I'm interested to hear the views uh, of my colleagues uh, and I would just simply like to ask if we are minded to approve this can we add to either condition D boundary treatments or condition E soft landscaping that we require a hedge be planted along uh, the east well the eastern boundary of the site west of the A M11 slip road please I think we should be wary about uh, making changes on the hoof. But, uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the boundary treatment and there is already a partial hedge there. It would just be simply filling in the gaps. OK, all right, when we come to... And, and also the applicant said he would be happy with that. Um, all right, I've got a note of that. We'll come back to that then, thank you. Chair, uh, we've got... Um, Stephen Reid, I don't know if, it was, if it's now, but he wants to talk about the S106. Uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, Reed, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I think if I could just invite uh, the planning case officer to address the um, 106 matter so that members are aware of what's proposed. 
the 106 meta being the uh, the boundary treatment, is it? No. What? Uh, Shuttle bus. No. Um, let's hear from um, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Karen, you. You've got something um, to tell us. Sure. There is a section 106 requested on the application in relation to the provision of a maintenance contribution for some keep clear yellow lines on the roundabout with the A505 and M11. So at the top of the slip road, obviously if the A505 is busy and it backs up, we've asked for, so Highways England have asked for the provision of keep clear signs so the roundabout can keep flowing and the cars don't back up onto the slip road onto the M11. And then County Transport have asked for a contribution for maintenance of those lines for 20 years. And that will be within the 106 with four payments over each five years, basically. OK, thank you very much for that. Sorry, Chair. Um, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Councillor Judith Ripis has just said that uh, she's going to have to drop out of the meeting uh, due to her connection issues and she's got another meeting to, to attend. So she sends her apologies for that to you all, but uh, she's had to drop out of the meeting. OK, thank you very much. Vice Chair, do we have any further speakers? We do. We have Councillor Heather Williams and Councillor Roberts. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams has already spoken. Is this something new? This is clarification. Yes. <laughs> well, the thing is, Chairman, if there's something that you want to clarify that's been brought up in the debate, it's difficult to make a decision if you've not had that clarification. I thought you'd already made a decision, but tell us anyway. Come on. No, well, my I would like clarification because many people have spoken about the viability of of the um, applicant. And I just want to because, you know, when I spoke and I said opposed it, I didn't oppose the, the placement or the principle of it, and I understood the reasons why they're bringing it forward. However, a lot of emphasis by some members has been put on the viability of um, the applicant, but we have no viability assessment here. We have no viability reports. We have no financial information about Duxford. So therefore, for the purpose of the record keeping and for clarity and determined application, can officers advise whether it is appropriate for us to be taking into consideration the financial stability of the applicant? Because we are often told that we cannot. And I thought it was important that we clarify that for public record. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure. Well, can Mr Carter help us with that one, please? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Heather Williams is absolutely right. There is no viability assessment uh, as far as I understand, submitted to justify this scheme. Uh, therefore, that's not um, that's not in the in the balance weighing in the balance um, of the decision making here. Um, so that is correct, unless unless the case officer wishes to tell us otherwise. Right. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I just case officer, out? what wish to do so? Chair, I'm, so I'm asking the question to the case officer at the moment, please. I'm sorry. Carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you agree with Mr. Carter? Uh, there is no, there's not a viability report submitted with the application. Okay, fine. Thank you. Right, and Chair. The the applicant is Proprietor Hotels rather than IWM. Exactly. Right, indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is Mr. Reed trying to? That's speak? kind of the point when people are referencing the the uh, viability of IWM. That's I think we've point. got, we've got the point, Councillor, thank you. It's Councillor Roberts, Chair. Oh, it, Sorry, uh, Chair. Yeah, but just no, no, what no. you do, Councillor Roberts. Are you, I'll be with you in a second, but uh, I've got a hand up from, from Mr Reid. I just want to know if he actually wants to speak again. No? <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Roberts, it's, it's you. Yeah. Chairman, Chairman, I don't need um, Heather Williams. Councillor Williams has brought up exactly the same as I was wanting to make clear. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Vice Chair, do we have any further speakers? I don't say if I do, but no, we don't. No. All right. So clearly there's a division of uh, 
thought here. So we need to be clear for those who want to vote for a refusal on what Chairman. grounds. Sorry, so uh, what I've heard so far is that you're supportive of the historic buildings uh, officers view that this is dominant, uh, damaging to the conservation area and uh, issues over design. Is that? And material, Chairman. Yeah, but that would come into the design issue. I'll just check with Mr Carter if uh, that's he's heard the same. He's, Sorry, Chair. Uh, to be clear, uh, is someone moving a recommendation for refusal? Because I hadn't heard that. Yeah, we are. They don't need to because they confusing. should be voted against the proposal. Right. OK, uh, then I would I would like to have more specificity in the reasons for refusal. Should it go that way, please? So what were you looking for? So, I mean, unacceptable in the conservation area, dominant position. <laughs> It's dominant and detrimental, Chairman, to the conservation area the by the materials used also and the, um, the colours used um, are, are all um, quite inappropriate. Right. Do better. Is that we, are, we are giving weight to those who are objecting are giving weight to the historic our historic buildings officer in those in those areas. I know with the exception it, number one. We need, we need chapter and verse with the policies that re they refer to. So so the design think, elements would be against HQ1. Um, where would the conservation go? Can I have some assistance the, the, there? What, what, which the, policy? Uh, we could have the MPPF about great weight afforded to the assets in the conservation area, that element, um, and the policies as referenced by the historic and the conclusions that they made. Um, I think they said MPPF 2019 specifically paragraph 194 and 196 and NH 14 is what's referenced by the officer. Mm -hmm. If we have the historic officer, then that might be helpful. OK, Ch Chair, if I may. Yeah, please. Uh, so with regard to the heritage that's in the National Science Policy Framework, uh, paragraph 196 of the MPPF states that where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm, which is how it's been described by our own historic buildings officer as well, to the significance of designated heritage, heritage assets, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate, securing its optimum viable use. So um, it would be good to know if the committee was of the opinion that uh, the less than substantial harm identified is or is not outweighed by the public benefits. Uh, because that, in my opinion, would be an important part of any reason for refusal, should that be where we end up. Um, with regard to the other comments that have been made, I'm hearing that members are concerned about the dominant impact uh, on the character and appearance of the conservation area by virtue of the size and appearance of the building, uh, including the materials, and that that would be contrary to policies HQ1 and NH14. Yep. So just on the point about the MPPF, is the committee suggesting that uh, the less than substantial harm that's been identified is not outweighed by the public benefits? Because that's just an important point to, to note. Okay. Chairman, I think, I suggest, Chairman, can we suggest that, thank you, Chairman, that we, that we use the uh, text of page 170, which the historic buildings officer, it absolutely um, makes absolutely abundantly clear the things that we are concerned about. She right. has put them all down there very concisely, and we ought to be using that. Um, all right, let's let's get on with a the vote. Um, I think we've got the, so what we've got at the moment. Then, so the proposal before us is for delegated approval, subject to section one hundred and six agreement. Um, Chair, and also we had some... to the notification. Pardon? Well, who is it? I mean, can you put a hand up or something? Because shouting now. I doesn't... I can't. I don't have the ability to raise a hand or chat function. On, I'm afraid. I'm lucky right. if I get video. Okay. So I, I I um we did say that it was going to be as previous applications have been. 
where that we make a decision subject to checks being done as to the consultation that was done oh, yeah, that's right. my yeah. ward. that I, wasn't what you read out it was just subject to 106 yeah 106 and uh, subject to the consultation and uh, if there's any I'd, issue I'd, about the consultation it comes back to this committee right that's what that's what we're but chairman uh, also what? with the additional condition of the hedge planted along the boundary uh, I believe the advice we had that that is actually already in the 106 agreement. I, d Chair. Oh, I didn't hear that. No, it's no. not. Uh, no, I just no, asked. Wait, 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 Mr. Carter's going to tell us. If I may, um, I yeah, believe that can, that can be incorporated into condition E on page yeah. 206. Yeah. Uh, and we can add some specific wording uh, requiring that hedge by agreement with the chair and vice chair if, if Councillor Bradnam is happy with that. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Thank you. So we add that to the recommendation, then that's uh, condition E, which will be toughened up uh, as per that would be decided by, by the chair and vice chair. So that's what you voted for. If you are in favour, if you are against, we've been through the issues that the um, historic buildings uh, officer has raised and been defined by Mr Carter and that would be the basis for your refusals. So we're going to go to a vote now. Um, and we start with uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Four. Four. Councillor, oh, I've got the wrong one now. So, Councillor Bradman is for Councillor uh, Dalton. Yes, it's Councillor Daunton. Daunton, <laughs> yes. sorry. <laughs> and I am for it. For Councillor Fain. For. For Councillor Halings. For. For Councillor Milnes. With reservations, for. For Councillor Roberts. Against. Against, thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Reservations means against for me. Against, thank you. Councillor Wright. For. For, thank you. And Councillor Bachelor, myself, I am for. So two, four, six, seven, that's seven, seven, two. We do have some missing. Uh, Councillor Ripith is no longer with us and Richard Williams was also absent. So that is passed 7-2 with the provisos that we've uh, written into that. Right, thank you very much. We move on again to number nine. We've just passed seven hours and still going. Let's find the next. Oh. Right, so the next item is item nine, a gambling gay. We're on page 215. 215, okay, gambling gay, the application S0185 stroke 20 FL. We're at gambling gay, the proposal is the change of use from public amenities based to parking, including resurfacing. It's in Grays Road, Gambling Gay. The applicant is South Cambridge's District Council. The recommendations approval, uh, key material considerations, principle of development, impact on character and appearance, highway safety and parking, neighbour amenity. Uh, the it's coming to us because this is a South Cam's district application and there's a third party objection. Uh, the presenting officer is Luke Simpson. So Luke, could you give us your presentation, please? Yeah, could I just um, recognise that, acknowledge that Councillor Richard Williams has joined? All right, good. OK, you're back with us, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I missed some of the other one, which is why I didn't vote. OK, all right, thank you. OK, presenting officer, if you're ready. Good afternoon, all. Just loading up the PowerPoint. 
Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, yep. good evening, nearly. And can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we can. Okay. Yep. Right. Um, so hopefully a lot more straightforward than the previous applications. <laughs> um, the site is located at Grace Road, Gammon Gay. Um, the proposed development is for a change of use from public amenity space to parking, including resurfacing. Um, the application's before the committee today because it's submitted by South Cambridgeshire District Council. This is the site location plan. As you can see, uh, there are two parts of the site. Um, the site's located on Grace Road um, and we're, we're not seeing that. Are you not? Uh, we're seeing the and, first slide. And also, Luke, we're seeing your window rather than your screen. Oh. There we me. Or oh, the other way around. Which we do have the slides in our packs, though, don't we? Hang on. Let me try and sort this out. Sorry. Right. Oh, we should see it now. You've just switched over. That's better. You can see the notes as well, can you? See the next five, Luke. Right. Is that OK? Is that OK like that? Yeah, that's fine. OK, fine. Um, sorry, I should also point out there's an error in the report to start with. Um, paragraph 1.1. 1 .1. um, I refer to the, the land being in the ownership of the County Council. Um, that's not correct. The land is owned by the District Council. OK. If I move on. Yeah. Uh, as I said, sites on Grace Road comprises two areas of grass verge, um, which both form part of the adopted highway. Um, here's an aerial image of the site. Um, the site is adjacent to a public right of way. Um, it's not, it's within the development framework of Gambling Gay. Um, there aren't any other significant constraints. Uh, this plan shows the proposed development. So what's proposed is the, a change of use of these two areas um, from public amenity lands, so they're currently grass verges, um, to parking spaces. So five parking spaces are proposed in these two areas here. Um, the plan also shows the removal of a tree here, but that tree actually has already been removed, so that doesn't form part of this application. Um, so it's not planning officers consider that that is not really a consideration as part of this application because that tree didn't require any consent to remove in the first place. Um, so just to let you know, it's not there. Chair, through you, could I ask uh, the officer if if he um, put it in presentation view? So yeah, we can see, I, see, I, see the detail. I did have it in presentation view, but for some reason it's not um, it's not sharing it properly. Yeah. All right, we can see it. OK, let's press on. Ah, no, there you is go. coming. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's so yeah. I, I think it was just a problem with the, the IT or the connection uh, okay. previously. OK, so this is a site photo. As you can see, the two orange arrows indicate the two areas of land in question either side of the existing parking spaces. Uh, there are nine parking spaces currently. Um, so these, this application will effectively extend the parking uh, either side for residents uh, parking. Um, again, another couple of photos um, showing each of the areas in question. Um, pretty clear. So in terms of the principle of development, uh, the development complies with uh, local plan policy S7. The site is wholly located within the settlement framework of Gambling Gay. Um, planning officers consider that the development would be in keeping with the character of the surrounding area. And we're only talking about two small areas of 
grass verge, which will be removed. And as I've just shown you, there's an existing strip of parking directly adjacent. So we're obviously effectively extending that parking provision. Uh, highways have no objection to the application. Um, the work would be, would all be carried out as it's adopted highway land. Um, the work would all be carried out in accordance with uh, their requirements in terms of the specification of materials used. Uh, all of the parking spaces meet the minimum dimension requirements. Um, there wouldn't be an adverse impact on neighbouring amenity and actually planning officers consider that there will be a benefit to local residents because the additional um, off-road parking would, you know, um, enable them to park free of the highway. Uh, right, so the, the tree officer objects to the application because of the removal of the amenity land. Um, but planning officers, officers have taken a view on that and we consider that actually there are only two small areas of, of grass verge amenity land and actually large areas of um, amenity land will be retained to either sides. So we're only talking about a very small proportion of, of the amenity land. Um, as I mentioned previously, the tree is no longer there um, and therefore we don't consider it necessary to require that the tree is replanted, given that it doesn't really form part of this application. And as I said, there wasn't any consent required to remove that tree in the first place. So um, on that basis, uh, planning officers are recommending that planning permission is granted subject to conditions. All right, thank you very much for that. Right, members, bearing in mind that uh, the only reason this is here is because it's a South Cam's District Council application and that all the statutory consultees are in favour. I'd like to move this on as swiftly as possible. I believe there's a couple of you who would like to speak. Uh, is it Councillor Williams, I believe, Heather Williams, you want to speak? Thank you, Chairman. I just want to clarify one thing and then happy to go to a vote. You'll be pleased to hear. Is yeah. page 216, number uh, consultations nine, environmental health officer. It says no response received and then it's out of time. Does that mean that we received something late and therefore hasn't been included or have we just not received something? Um, because I see that's on the next application as well. But just what does that mean? Either we've not received it or we received it late. Is there anything? And if there's not anything of substance, then, you know, people need parking around there. It's inevitable with the development. So right, for right. it. But yeah, let's get an answer to that. Yeah, no problem. So there's obviously a, uh, a time period within which we expect to receive consultations and that those brackets are out of time. That just means we haven't received a response within that time frame. And I can confirm we still haven't received a response uh, from environmental health. All right, thank you. Is it Councillor Milnes next? Yeah, very, very quick one. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered whether porous pavers had been uh, considered, which would allow you to keep the uh, appearance of grass, but give the ability to park over the top of it. So therefore, not just tarmacking, and therefore retaining some uh, elements of greenery about this. Yeah, um, as, as the land is uh, adopted highway, uh, the parking spaces have to be constructed to a specification um, which, you know, specified by the uh, local highway authority, Cambridgeshire County Council, and that's why we can't sort of deviate from, from that specification. But the porous pavers are um, accredited uh, devices for parking areas. Councils all over the place are using them for that very purpose. Uh, OK, I appreciate that. Um, but whether or not those areas of parking are part of the adopted highway is another question. All right, thank you. That's that's fine. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Bradnam. Uh, I'd like to propose uh, approval or moving to the vote. Right, uh, I'm not sure if anybody else is wanting to speak. No, are we happy to go to the vote then? Councillor Daunton, Chair. 
Oh, okay, Councillor Donaldson, yes, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to check, but I can't actually access my papers online at the moment because the connection is so slow. Um, uh, th this parking is related to South Cam's owned housing, isn't it? Right. Yes. Uh, Can you confirm the, that, please? Yeah, the district council own oh, most of the surrounding yep. area, including the the land in question, the, oh. the application site. Thank you. And and also a further check: um, I, is any of this housing sheltered housing? I I don't know the answer to that question, and I I don't know if it's relevant to. Um, the provision of the additional parking spaces. Okay. That's fine. I, I, I am in favour of this, but I just wanted to check okay. that. Very Lovely. much in favour of it. Thank you very much. We're moving to the vote then. The recommendation is approval. Uh, can we do that by affirmation, please? Is Agreed. anyone against? Agreed. Agreed. No Agreed. Against? Uh, just, just for the record, um, Councillor Roberts left the meeting at the start of this item. And that's it. So anyway, so that's approved by affirmation. Thank you very much. So let's speed on. Right, we're now going to Teversham, agenda item 10. This is page 223. Uh, application 20 stroke 010044. Habersham, additional padding allows to 14 flats and two bungalows. Site address is 1 to 4 and 17 to 28 Ferndale, Habersham. They're owned by South Cam's District Council. Um, the recommendation is for approval. Principle of development, visual immediacy and climate change mitigation are the key material um, visits, considerations. It's coming to us because it is a South Cam's District Council application. The presenting officer is Luke Simpson, consulting planning officer. And uh, just in passing, I remind members that we have already passed almost identical uh, applications for this sort of cladding at um, Balsham and one other place, I believe. So uh, over to you, Luke. Thank you, Councillor. OK, so the application site is located at. Oh, can I just confirm that you can see the slides this time? Yeah, fine. brilliant, brilliant. Uh, so the site's located at 1 to 4 and 17 to 28 Ferndale um, and comprises 14 flats and two bungalows. Um, the proposed developments for additional cladding layer to, to these units. And this is an aerial image of the site. Um, the units are all council owned. Um, the site is located south of Teversham. Um, it's actually outside of the settlement framework and within the green belt. Um, there are no other significant constraints um, relevant to the proposed development. Uh, this is the site location plan and, and illustrates the um, units subject to this planning application. These are a couple of uh, photographs. Of, of the existing units and their um, pebble dash render. Um, that render would be replaced with this render, which um, planning officers consider would be a significant improvement aesthetically, and it would also assist in uh, carbon reduction through increasing the insulation of the properties um, this slide shows an example of what um, the cladding would look like. So the key considerations are the principle of development. Um, whilst the site's outside of the development framework, it's necessarily, um, well, the development takes place in the countryside location, and that's necessary given that the units are in the countryside. Um, so we don't think there's a conf conflict with policy S7 and there's no conflict with the purposes of that policy either. Um, the development wouldn't result in any encroachment um, because there's no extension to the to the units. Uh, in terms of character and appearance, planning officers consider that the units would be in keeping with the surrounding area, which is quite mixed. Um, so there's not much uniform character in terms of the appearance of uh, the, the dwelling surrounding. 
Um, and actually, as I said, there'll be a significant improvement to the appearance of the units. Um, the proposals would accord with the local plan policy CC1 on climate change, and therefore officers recommend approval of this application uh, subject to conditions. Right, thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification? Hopefully not. We've had a, 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 a comment from Councillor Daunton, who is the local member. Uh, Councillor Daunton, do you want to speak now? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, thinking that I wouldn't be present at the committee, I wrote a note. So really, I'm just repeating what I said in the note. Um, this imp the, the improvement to the appearance and energy efficiency of these apartments and bungalows is long overdue. Um, and I recommend it to the committee um, and, and recommend the work of housing officers. I, um, it has been held up uh, by having to come to planning committee. Indeed. All right, that's fine. I, I would like to move immediately to a vote on this. I don't think this is in any way contentious. But I see, I'm not sure if it's old hands or new hands. Is Councillor Milne wanting to oh, speak? It's an old hand. I'm old sorry. Hand. So I have, uh, is I, there an old hand there for Councillor Fain? It is good. All right, I'm going to go straight to a vote on this then. So the recommendation is for approval. Uh, Agreed. Is there anybody who doesn't? Agreed. 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 All agree? Agreed. 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 Yep. OK, that's approved. Well done, Luke. I think I you're going to get up. <laughs> I told you it'd be Luke's straightforward. Luke's going for a hat trick, I think. He's going for a hat trick. Full hat. That's right. the first one. Two wins. No, keep control. Very short order. Agenda 11, item 11. Uh, we're now at Fen Ditton. This is application 20-01-005-4. stroke It's the uh, same principles we just looked at at Teversham. Uh, it's recladding in, in insulation and right, rendered top coats. So the address is 1 to 3 and 2 to 28 Musgrove Way, Fen Ditton. Uh, it's uh, the applicant is South Camp City Council, recommend approval. Key material considerations, visual amenity, climate change mitigation. Um, it's here because it's South Camp District Council's application. Presenting officer is Richard Fitzjohn, senior planning officer. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to take, do your presentation. Nice and short, I hope. Thank you, Chair. Um, just try to share. All of them are equally important to us. Absolutely. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen, yeah, Chair? Got it. Yeah. OK, this is application, um, for, an application for recladding and insulation from a pebble dash finish to a light rendered top coat. Um, it applies to numbers one to three and numbers two to 28, Mus Musgrave Way, Fen Ditton. Again, it's um, come to committee because it's submitted on behalf of uh, the applicant is uh, South Cambridge District Council. Um, and it relates to 14 flats and two bungalows. As you can see, the application sites are outlined in red on the plan. There's some aerial photography showing um, a rough um, outline of the, the two application sites. This is 2 to 28 Musgrave Way, photos as existing. And this is numbers 1 to 3 Musgrave Way as existing and uh, this is the detail of the pr proposed insulation and render and an example of the the render finish which it will look like uh, when complete thank you all right thank you very much um local member councillor Daunton, I yes, think um, take it you've got the same comments. <laughs> I've got the same comments and actually the photographs of Musgrave Way make it look more attractive now than it actually is. It's in sore need of this work to be done and I, I'm sure Councillor Bradnam as the county councillor for that area would agree with me. So wholeheartedly support uh, this application and getting it done. Lovely, thank you. 
I see Councillor Bredman's got her hand up. You want to endorse that? Thank you, Chairman. I just thought it might be interesting to note, members, that the designs and layout of these two developments, Ferndale and Musgrave Way, are almost identical, and they're identically in uh, off-road, out in the countryside locations. Um, and absolutely, I would endorse what uh, Councillor Daunton says. These flats when you get inside them are very dank and cold and so this improvement in insulation would be most welcome and I absolutely endorse it in fact I'll if anybody unless anybody else wants to I'll propose we agree all right well, well I'm intended to go straight to the vote anyway thank you very much for that so the recommendation is approval uh, can we do that by acclamation please agreed, agreed. agreed. no one against agreed no, OK, that's great. So that's approved. That's our last one. And it's seven hours and 23 minutes so far. And can I just so say thank well you done very much. to Richard Fitzjohn for being there the whole time until the very end? Yes, well done to all the officers in this heat has been immense. Yeah, well done, absolutely. chair, men and ladies, you deserve a medal. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank let's you. Go. Let's get home. We've got a brief thing in half an hour. Bye. Bye. <laughs>